You are now tuned into Then Radio. If you enjoy our videos, we ask that you consider joining our Patreon to support our channel. Don't forget to like and subscribe so that you never miss a new video. We hope you enjoyed today's episode, and as always, thank you for watching. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight, The Reluctant Heroes by Frank M. Robinson. Only Chapman was awake. The others sprawled on bunks 20 inches wide with clearance of 24 inches between layers. They breathed heavily, taking in air that had been breathed for 18 months, subject to certain modifications to remove carbon dioxide and replenish oxygen by the catalytic action of the Harcourt King unit on silicon dioxide. Outside the single quartzite port, the lunar dawn was breaking. The dead black shadows moved across the crater as the green haze of earthlight gave way to the blinding white of the sun. The telegraph key, which linked the research bunker to the space station in orbit around Earth, chattered as Chapman copied the message into the log pad. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. In a pig's eye. Miserable, no good... What do they want? They want me to stay until the next relief ship lands. Go back to sleep. Uh, it's my turn for breakfast. Are you going to stay? Sure. Three years on the moon, they figure I'll be glad to stay for more. Just raise my salary or give me a bonus. Every man has his price. Mm-hmm. They probably figure I like it here. Well, Chapman, you found a home here on the moon. Sure. Canned coffee, canned beans, canned pills, and canned air till your insides feel like they're plated with tin. The little scientific home of tomorrow. Ten steps in any direction. A charming place where you can't take a shower, you can't brush your teeth, and your insides don't even work right. Why did you tell him? No. (laughs) You kept it short. Check the oxy cycle before you turn on the stove. What's the matter? You sore or something, Chapman? Why shouldn't I be? All I'm trying to do is get a good man to stay on a job a while longer. Well, they got a fat chance. They figure you found a home here, right, Doe? Uh, Why don't you guys shut up till morning? Some of us have to stay here, you know. Some of us aren't going back today. All right, all right. You might as well get up and get a day's work today before the relief rockets do. I got the coffee ready. Coffee? (laughs) Been in a can so long I can taste the glue on the label. Send up an oil can. These elbow joints make me feel like the Tin Woodman and the Wizard of Oz. You can't lubricate vacuum seal joinings. Let it squeak. At least it doesn't leak air. Get that back. That thug for me, will you, Donnelly? Lean over, you fat slob. 
You put on three more pounds, you won't get off the moon. You won't get through the airlock. Yeah, yeah. Hey, chap. Hmm? Do you think we ought to radio the space station and see if they've left there yet? I talked to him on the last call. The relief ship left 12 hours ago. They should get here in about six and a half hours. Chap, you know what I'm thinking? You've been here twice as long as the rest of us. What's the first thing you're going to do once you get back? I don't know. I guess I was trying not to think about that. I haven't been here three years like you have, but I've got plans. What are you going to do? Well, I'm going to rent a room in a Hotel Astor over Times Square and just sit at the window and watch the people on the street. And I think I'll see somebody. What somebody? Oh, just somebody. What are you going to do, Donnelly? Well, I'm going to do something practical. First of all, I'm going to turn over my geological samples to the government. Then I'm going to sell my life story to the movies. <laughs> then I think I'll get drunk. How about you, Julius? Well, first, I'll get rid of my allocations to the expedition. Then I think I'll go home and see my wife. Then I'll take off my spacesuit. I thought all members of the groups were supposed to be single. They are, and I can see the reasons for it. But who could pass up the money the commission was paying? If I had to do it all over again, me. Me and me a fishbowl. You know, chap, it won't seem like the same old moon without you on it. Like they say in the Army, you never had it so good. You found a home here. All right, button up. And remember to check your suits for leaks and check the valves of your oxygen tanks. I've gone out at least 500 times. You've checked me every time. And I check you 500 more. It only takes one mistake. And watch out for blisters under the pumice crust. You go through one of those and that's it, brother. Okay, okay, I'm set. Klein, I never knew you were married. There wasn't much sense in talking about it. You just get to thinking, and there's nothing you can do about it. If you talk about it, it just makes it worse. She let you go without any fuss, hmm? No, she didn't make any fuss. I don't think she'd like to see me go either. At least I hope she didn't. You got a girl back home? Yes. Now, you never mentioned that either. For the same reason you didn't mention your wife. You get to thinking about it. You got to get married when you get back? Yeah. Hurry up, will you, Klein? I'm sweating. Somebody ought to build in underarm sprays and spacesuits. Chap, why does somebody have to stay here for stopover? Lots of reasons. You can't get a whole relief crew and let them take over cold. They have to know where things are, how things work, what to watch out for. Then, because you've been here for a year and a half and you know the ropes, you have to watch them to see that they stay alive in spite of themselves. Why was it you on the first trip? You're not a scientist. No, I was the pilot on the first ship. When it occurred to us that someone was going to have to stay over, I volunteered. I thought the others were so important that it was better they take their samples and data back to Earth when the first relief ship came. You wouldn't do it again, though, would you? No. You think Dole will do as good a job as you did? He volunteered. Yeah, he volunteered because he thought it would make him look like a hero. I've lost three years up here, and I don't intend to lose any more. Okay, okay. Check your valve. All right, check. <laughs> Check Geiger, CR, Oxy, and Scintilla readings. Everything okay. You packing, chap? Yeah. Oh, listen, uh, Dole, I've got three or four shirts here that are a little too big. I got them from Drysback in the first group. You want them? Chap, do you think they'll ever have relief ships up here more often than 18 months? I mean, considering the advance No, of... I don't. Not for 10 years. Fuel's too expensive and the trip's too hazardous. Why, on freight charges alone, you're worth your weight in platinum when they send you up here. Won't be so bad. There'll be new men up here. You'll pass a lot of time just getting to know them. Yeah. Listen, chap, I... I'm engaged back home, you know. Nice girl. You'd like her if you knew her. Right here. Let me show you. Yeah, this is a picture of Alice taken at a picnic when we were together. Mm -hmm. See, it's a kind of bad angle, because she's really got a better figure than that. But, well, we expected to get married when I got back. I never told her about stopover. She thinks I'll be home tomorrow. I kept thinking that somehow I... You want to trade places with me, don't you? You thought I might stay for stopover again in your place. Well, chap, I know you want to go home, but... I couldn't ask any of the others. You're the only one who was qualified. 
Look, you know my father's pretty well fixed. Chap, we could make it worth your while. It wouldn't mean 18 more months, but they'd be well-paid months. Forget it, Dole. You're staying and I'm going home. off the trail. Well, come out of the shadow. I've got a meter jammed over here. You know the regulations. Chapman will kick like a steer. Keep in sight at all times. I'll only be a minute. I've got a short circuit in my instrument. Time for ten minute check. I've got my hands full. My valves are all right. I know it. You know it. But the book says valve and leak check every ten minutes. Hey. Come out. What? You see a flash? Where? Past camel's hump. There. What is that, Northern Lights? No. No, come over here, you fat geologist. Oh, what's the matter with you? That's the relief rocket. Come on. Hey, where are you going? I'm going over to the ship. Breathe some air that's a little less used. You think we ought to? Chapman said to stay. Forget Chapman. We're going home. I want to see that beautiful ship. Come on. Well, how about the ten-minute check? Just a formality. Forget it. This is Christmas and Fourth of July rolled into one. Okay, let's go. I can just taste some clean, fresh air. Oh, yeah, I see it when we top the hump. Maybe we'd better check. Wait a minute. I'll swing my gauge up. Donnelly. Yeah? How long have we been out? Oh, about a half hour. Yeah? Well, look at your gauge. Well, what are you... Oh. If we'd started for the rocket, we never would have made it. We would have strangled halfway down the hump. Come on, we better get back to the bunker. <laughs> Check the lock seal. Okay. All right, open the inner door. Close the lock. Get me out of this fish bowl. It's down. The relief rocket, it's down on the other side of Camel's Hump. Oh, what a beautiful-looking ship. What a beautiful ship. They must be on their way over here now. Chap, they're on their way. We're going home today. Get your RA unit out of that suit and into the dryer. All right, all right. Okay, what's eating you, Dole? Listen, just because the relief rocket lands, it doesn't mean your RA unit is going to dry up by itself. That goes for you, too, Donnelly. Okay. Hey, Chapman. Yeah? He's taking it pretty hard. He volunteered. Yeah, he volunteered. What a beautiful, beautiful ship. Teaching at the University who took over a seminar at the A.E. Hey, hey, look what we got here, chap. Come here. What's the matter? Hey, look what this one's got, a box. Yeah? Look inside, dirt. Ordinary dirt with grass. <laughs> grass. Hey, 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 fellas, it, it feels like grass. That's right, yeah. it's real grass. Yeah, and real valuable. Do you realize that current freight rates up here, it's worth about $10 a blade? No, shut up. Hey, bud, you mind if I chew a blade? Uh, Mr. Chapman. Yes? Oh, Mr. Chapman. Uh, my name's Everline, captain of the relief ship. I understand you're in charge here. Yeah, you might say so. They didn't have a captain on the first ship, just a pilot and crew. Dole, turn up the oxy cycle in the Harcourt unit. Well, things have advanced somewhat, huh? Uh, look, Mr. Chapman, is there any place where we can talk together privately? Well, come around the corner of my locker. It's about as private as we can get. Oh, good. What's on your mind? I've always wanted to meet the man who spent more time here than anybody else. You mind if I smoke? You better ask Dole. He's in charge now. Oh. You know, we have big plans for the research station here. Oh? I haven't heard of any. Oh, yes. Big plans. Big plans. Mm -hmm. They're working on unmanned open side rockets now that can carry cargo. Sheet steel for more bunkers like, uh, like this. Mm -hmm. 
enable us to enlarge the unit, have a, a series of bunkers all linked together, make good laboratories and good living quarters for you people, have a little privacy for a change. Well, they could use a little privacy up here. Oh, they could. Well, that's one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you, Chapman. The commission talked it over, and they'd like to see you stay. They feel if they're going to enlarge it, add more bunkers and have more men up here, that a, a man of practical experience should be running things. They figure you're the only man who's capable and has had that experience. Is that all? Well, naturally, you'd be paid well. I don't imagine any man would like being here all the time. And they're prepared to double your salary, maybe even a bonus in addition. They want you to have full charge. You'd be director of Lunar Laboratories. Oh, a title, too. Hmm? Well, the commission said they'd be willing to consider anything else you had in mind. If it's more money... The or... answer is no. I'm not interested in more money for staying because I'm not interested in staying. Money can't buy it, Captain. Look, look Jack, I'm sorry. I'm afraid you'd have to stay up here to appreciate that. I'm afraid you don't understand the importance Captain, of this. Come over here to the port. Yes? Now look out there about a hundred yards. Uh, you mean where that, uh, that uh, mound of stones? That's right. We made that cross out of condensed milk cans slid over iron bars. When you get out there, you can still see the footprints in the pumice where we gathered around. It's more than 18 months ago, but there's been no wind to wear those tracks away. They'll be there forever. Oh, I see. Well, who was it? Uh, Dreisbach? Or Dixon? Dixon. We never got Dreisbach out of the crevasse in Tycho. What happened? You want to know? I can give it to you in detail. Sit down and listen. Well, what do you mean? Just wait a minute and I'll show you. Well, why? What is it? Regulations. When someone goes out alone, we have to monitor his radio, tape recorded. We had the recorder open when Dixon went out. I want you to hear it. Well, all right. I've got the tape right here. It's taken me a minute to thread it up. Now, look, Chapman, you don't have listen. to... Listen, I want you to listen. Moon, moon, great big silvery moon. Won't you please shine down on me, moon, moon. Regulations. He had to keep Let saying something so we know he was all right. Most of the guys just sing. Gentlemen, I'm getting a lovely sonar reading. Hey, if anybody wants to set up a tombstone concession on the moon, this is the spot. <laughs> Lovely marble, granite, and rock suitable for lobbies here. <coughs> it's that old devil moon that... You should have been making a ten-minute check on his oxygen sky. level. He was a good kid. All wrapped up in science. Being on the moon was the opportunity of a lifetime. He thought so much about it that he forgot a lot of little things, like how to stay alive. This was the day before the second group came. All right, gentlemen. I have three or four more readings to take, and I'll be right in. I'm doing fine. Fine, fine, fine. A little stuffy. It's almost as if... Hey, somebody get a fix on me, huh? How far am I from the bunker? Must have sprung a leak. When... Hey, when did I take the last ten-minute check? How far am I? It's down to 22. We took a fix. He was a half hour out. I can't he couldn't get make that. Closed. Listen. Listen, you, you gotta come out and get me. You gotta. You gotta come out and get me. It's down to 22. Is, is somebody listening back there? Hey, is somebody listening? I figure I've got ten minutes. Just ten minutes. Listen, you can make it in ten minutes. I'll meet you t towards, towards Campbell's Hump. I'll start now. I'll start now. Come and get me, you hear? Come and get me. Chap Chapman? Are you, are you listening, Chapman? Can you hear me? I'm running. 
Camel's hump. I... Hot. The heat. The RA unit's overloading. Can't dry it up. Gotta run, run, run. <laughs> No use. I can't run. The unit heats up. Gauge is down to 15. I can't make it. I'm gonna... I'm gonna sit down now. You'll find me at number 7 radiation meter, about 10 yards off the trail. I'm gonna sit down. Sit down next next to a rock. You're getting getting dizzy. Hey, remember we used to argue. Do you strangle from no oxy or pass out from CO2? Keep tuned to this channel, boys. You'll find out. It's that old devil moon that you... Oh, boy, the earth's going around and around and around. And... Chap! Chap! You can't get me, can you? We didn't have a chance by even 15 minutes. We didn't even go out. There wasn't any sense to it. <clears throat> did, uh, uh, did you record after that? Yeah, it's on the tape, but you don't want to hear it. We've never played it back. Uh, that's why we want you to stay, Chapman. We don't want any more like Dixon. You don't get the point, Captain. I don't want to be the next Dixon. I'm going home now. But you're... Bob Dole is staying for stopover. If there's something important about the project or any changes, you better tell him before you go. <laughs> Call. Mail call. Chap, here's one for you. Donnelly. Yo. Dole. Yeah. Dole. Okay. Donnelly. Yo. Ah, Klein. Uh, Dole. Yeah. Donnelly. Yeah. Oh, boy, did I miss an opportunity. I could have had a year's subscription to the Ladies' Home Journal combined with the American Farmer, all for half price. <laughs> all right, men. All right. My departure time is an hour and a half. Hey, my sister had twins. Hey, Chap. Aren't you going to read your letter? I read it. It's a short letter. Is something wrong? No, no, there's nothing wrong. Dole. What is it, chap? Get your stuff and leave with the others. What? What do you mean? What are you talking about, chap? Get your bag and let's go. I'm not going back. Well, what's the matter with you? Did you suddenly decide you don't like the blue sky and the trees? Come on, let's Look, go. Look, Julius, I'm not going back. I haven't got anything to go back for. Or is it the letter? Yeah. Dear Joe, this isn't going to be a nice letter, but I thought it best you should know before you come home. Oh. Isn't very original, is it? Three years is a long time, and a quarter of a million miles is a long distance. <laughs> you know what, Julius? She can look up in the night sky now and tell him how she was once engaged to the man in the moon. That's a real conversation piece, isn't it? Very funny. Go ahead, Doe. Get going. You're doing a much braver thing than you may think, Mr. Chapman. Yeah, Sure. Like the looks of the moon going away from it, Mr. Dole? It looks a lot better this way. I suppose you'll be glad to get home. I'd rather not talk about it. They were kidding Chapman this morning. They said he found a home on the moon. If we'd stayed an hour or so more, he might have changed his mind and left after all. I'd offered him money. I didn't want to stay for stopover. 
I was a coward, and I offered him money to stay in my place. Well, we're all cowards once in a while. But your offer of money had nothing to do with his staying. He stayed because he had to stay. Because we made him stay. I don't understand. Chapman had a lot to go home for. He was engaged to be married. I know. We got her to write him a letter breaking it off. We knew that it meant that he'd lost one of his main reasons for wanting to go back. I think perhaps he still would have left if we'd stayed and argued him into going. But we left before he could change his mind. That was a lousy thing to do. We had no choice. We didn't use it except as a last resort. I don't know of any girl who would have written such a letter if she was really in love with a guy like Chapman. No matter what your reasons. There was only one girl who would have. Ginny Dixon. You see, Chapman's girl was Dixon's sister. She understood what we were trying to tell her. That the new shift had to be safe. That there had to be someone who had to take over and keep those boys alive. She understood that. Because her brother died up there. You mean, he's the only one? I couldn't have done the job? Oh, look, though. Chapman knows how to live on the moon. He's like a, a, a trapper who spent all his time in the forest. He knows it like the palm of his hand. He never makes mistakes. He never fails to check things. And he isn't a scientist. He would never become so preoccupied with research that he'd fail to make checks, and he can watch out for those who do make mistakes. He understood that, too, all too well. It costs a lot of money to send ships up there and establish a colony. You have to have the best man for the job. You get them even if they don't want to do it. Personal lives and viewpoints are expendable. It's got to be that way. There's too much at stake. It's a cold place, the moon. <laughs> You're an odd bunch of guys, you and the others and the groups. Few of you, Dole, come up for the glamour. I know. None of you really like it. And none of you are enthusiastic about it. You're all reluctant to come in the first place, for the most part. You're a bunch of, well, of pretty reluctant heroes. Eighteen months. He'll be up there eighteen more months. Personally, I don't feel happy about that. I don't like having to mess up other people's lives. I hope I won't have to again. Maybe somehow, some way, this one can be patched up. We'll try to. Eighteen months. In the meantime, on behalf of the commission and myself, I feel like a cheap, rotten heel. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features My Lady Greensleeves, a novelette by Frederick Pohl, which begins when a guard smelled trouble and knew it would come because he had been bred that way. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Reluctant Heroes, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Frank M. Robinson and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Mandel Kramer as Chapman, Jim Drummond as Klein, Bob Hastings as Dahl, Dick Hamilton as Donnelly, Jim Stevens as Dixon, and Dick Janiver as Eberline. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Down for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, 
Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight, the time is the late 1960s. The place, Washington, D.C. The story, Honeymoon in Hell. My name is Carmody. I'm a grade one cybernetics man at Western Alliance headquarters in the Pentagon. Used to be a rocket pilot, but they retired me at 27 after I made the third successful flight to the moon. As a grade one cybernetics operator, I get to work with Junior. Let me tell you about Junior. He was built in 1962, and he's the world's finest electronic brain, with a possible exception of Ivan, the Eastern Alliance brain, which was built on stolen plans and modeled after Junior. There are only four men in the country permitted in the same room with Junior because the data we feed him is so secret. One of those four is the president of the Western Alliance. The other three are myself, Charlie Mazur, and the chief. Ray? Oh, yes, chief. Have you got Junior running a problem? Well, I just fed him the hourly data for probability of H-bomb war with the Eastern Alliance. He's ready. Hold it. According to the data just received, the probability of a hot war between the Western and the Eastern Alliance is 99.5. 930 in favor of such a war breaking out within the next month. Oh, it doesn't sound good, Chief. Yeah. Well, I'll scramble the data, send it to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Meanwhile, here's a priority C civilian problem to run on. Well, what's this stuff? Well, it seems on September 17th, a statistician in the birth record department of New York City noticed that out of 813 births reported that day, 657 had been girls and only 156 had been boys. Well, that sounds impossible. Well, that's what this statistician thought. So they phoned some other cities, and the same trend is being shown, not only in other American cities, but in Western Europe. Sunspots, maybe? That's for Junior to figure out. He's the brain here. Okay, I'll feed him. Give me the results on the intercom. I'll be in my office. Right. I didn't really pay much attention to the problem at the time. As a grade one operative, I was more interested in asking Junior questions on security, ballistics, missiles, rocketry, and so on. The Eastern Alliance would undoubtedly have traded three puppet governments and the tomb of Lenin to have an agent as a grade one operative. But I took the birth statistics and fed them in and waited. Uh, Junior, incidentally, responds to vocal stimuli. Speaks 12 languages. Got the answer, Junior? I have. Okay. The present statistics, if the trend is projected for another day, indicate a definite dangerous imbalance. If the trend is irreversible, unless new methods of reproduction are developed, the population of the United States and Western Europe will die out in one and one-half generations. Well, it wasn't long before the newspapers got the story and kicked it around. People in governments really started to worry now. Biologists and laboratories made it their number one project. On September 29th, only 41 boys were born in the entire United States. During the month of October, in spite of all the work going on, not a single male child was born anywhere in the world, with the exception of one in outer Mongolia and one in Alaska. November drew another blank. I was working 18 hours a day, feeding every available scrap of data to Junior. Data insufficient for answer to your question. Well, here's the latest. A new analysis of chromosome structure indicates the presence of an additional electron in the orbit of the Y atoms for carbon chain X. Now try again. The question is, what is causing the lack of male birth? Anything new, Ray? No, not yet. Hold it. Data insufficient. Well, that's it. We've fed Junior every scrap of information that every physicist, geneticist, chemist, and biologist in this half of the world knows, and all he does is say data insufficient. Yeah, well, the operator who had him last night didn't do any better. Uh, any more information on the Eastern Alliance? Have they made any progress? No, but at least the talk of a hot war is dying down. Well, they're still working on a space station, aren't they? Oh, yes, we're both going ahead with that. But, well, this seems to be a common problem now. 
You know, in spite of hydrogen bombs and ICBMs, people don't really expect the whole race to die out from a war. But the complete lack of male children... Now, that's something that every family can understand. Has anybody thought of the possibility of some kind of radiation from outer space that's damaging the chromosomes, something our instruments can't detect? Everybody's thought of it. Nobody's proved anything. Well, keep trying, Junior. Maybe he'll come up with something. Okay. Junior, I'm ashamed of you. Answer me. Information recorded. Look, you're a whiz on rocket fuels and space orbits, but when it comes to women, you're a total bust, just like me. I don't understand them and never will. Information recorded. Now, you've convinced us that if we use the H-bombs in total war, both sides will lose, and we know that your counterpart at Moscow University has given the same information to the Eastern Alliance. That you can figure out. But women, you can't have genetics without women, right? No. Well, you know that much. Uh-huh. What about that blonde at the party last night, huh? What about her? The question is inadequately worded. Please clarify. Should I see her again? No. What? You haven't even got any data on her. Why shouldn't I see her again? Answer, please. Because tomorrow you are going to be married. jumped out of my chair. Junior had gone stark, raving mad. Besides, Junior never made predictions unless he had some definite data. There wasn't a woman on earth I had the slightest interest in marrying. I was a confirmed bachelor. So, unless somebody else had been feeding phony data into Junior, which was almost impossible since he already had enough data to check any flaw, well, I figured he'd blown a transistor. Come in. Oh, Chief, I was just going to tell you... Oh. Ray Carmody? This is the president of the Western Alliance, Captain Carmody, Mr. President. Glad to meet you, Captain. Oh, I'm, I'm very honored, sir. The president came here specifically to talk to you, Ray. To me? Captain Carmody, you have been chosen to have the opportunity to volunteer for a mission of extreme importance. Now, there's much danger, but not as much as on your previous trip to the moon. Previous trip, sir? Then this involves another? The flight to the moon, Captain, will be the least important part of your mission. What's at stake here is the survival of the human race. Chief, perhaps you'd better explain the rest. Mm -hmm. Well, you know the problem, Ray. Last night when Mitchell was on, we fed Junior some new data, and we asked some new questions. For example, we asked if the lack of male birth could be due to some extraterrestrial enemies of man. Or Martians? Possibly. We established that it's possible that Martians have landed somewhere on Earth and set up radiation that causes all children to be females. Junior said it was possible? Definitely. So we asked him the next question. How could we correct such a situation? Mm -hmm. What did he say? Junior suggested that a married couple spend a honeymoon on the moon and uh, see if circumstances are different. Oh, I see. You want me to pilot them there? Well, uh, not exactly, Captain. Oh, good grief. You mean you want me to... Well, Junior wasn't crazy after all. You asked Junior? He said I was getting married, but... Well, how do you know it was me they'd pick? He was asked the qualifications for the bridegroom. He recommended a rocket pilot who had already made the trip successfully. Well, there are four other pilots who've made that trip. You're the only single one. And since the woman must be a qualified pilot also, and uh, none of the wives are pilots, well... Uh, I assume I'm going to be married before we leave. Well, naturally. Oh. And uh, just how long do we stay on the moon? Until a child is conceived. Brother. Well, Captain, do you volunteer? I suppose so. I, well, wait a minute. Uh, who's the other pilot? I mean, uh, the girl. <clears throat> she was flown in by fast rocket an hour ago and is waiting in Chief Reba's office. Now, shall we go? <laughs> There were some officials there, and a justice, and my bride. She was small, dark, slender, and very attractive. I was so busy looking at the way she filled out her uniform in just the right places that I almost overlooked the fact that she was dressed like an Eastern Alliance pilot. Captain Ray Carmody, may I present Lieutenant Anya Borisovna? You mean this is, I mean, uh, an enemy pilot? Pleased to meet you, Captain. Uh, yes, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to meet you. Uh, Mr. President, I... Captain, this marriage is being done on an international basis for important diplomatic reasons. 
Both alliances have been advised by their cybernetic machine that the experiment, if it is to benefit humanity, must bring all the major powers together. Miss Borisovna is 24, an experienced rocket pilot like yourself, and uh, <coughs> quite attractive, if I do say so myself. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, now, if you're both ready, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court will perform the ceremony. Well, there's just uh, one thing, Mr. President. Miss um, <clears throat> Borisovna, will you marry me? Yes. And uh, <clears throat> you may call me Anya. Okay. <laughs> uh, Mr. President, we're ready. <laughs> I didn't even get a chance to kiss the bride. We were rushed over to the labs for a pre-flight physical. Then the chief took me aside for a private pre-flight briefing. Congratulations, Ray. Sit down. Uh, thank you. Now, zero hours at 10 o'clock. Only half an hour? We've known about this for several weeks now, Ray. Ship is ready. We've already fired 11 supply rockets and observed that they landed on the moon near where you're supposed to put down. One of them contains a heat-proof, airtight, collapsible shelter. Where you live. Uh-huh. Oh, what's the ship like? R-26, much better than the R-24 that you flew there. Last time, Ray, you took four and a half Gs for seven minutes. This time, you'll get by with three Gs and have 12 minutes to accelerate to Brenchless. Now, you'll have enough fuel for the trip there. One of the supply rockets has your return fuel. Oh, uh, oh, yes. We put in a case of scotch and a uh, case of vodka, uh, just as an icebreaker. Uh-huh. Uh, before we go, Chief, what would you have done if I'd turned this job down? The cybernetics machine predicted that you wouldn't. Besides, we could have had a hundred volunteers an hour after seeing Anya Borisovna. <laughs> that gal is moonbeam. Uh, careful. You're speaking of my wife. <laughs> R-26. Are you both strapped in? Anya, you strapped into the webbing? Yes. Okay, Chief. The time is X-15. minus I have a message from the President. Quote, The people of the world are watching. Don't fail them. I have messages from the Soviets, the Chinese, the British, the Indians, all wishing you well. You are the hope of mankind, and all mankind unites as it has never before united in giving you its blessings. We await your return anxiously. Unquote. X minus five. Four. Three. Two. X minus one. Blast off. The sound that was beyond all sound struck us like a giant muffled hammer. It built up until we weighed 480 pounds, pressed flat against the webbing. Sound and pressure went on and on interminably. Then we reached Brenchless, free of the pull of earth. I blacked out. When I came to, a lovely face was bent over mine, two dark eyes smiling at me. Are you all right, Ray? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, are we weightless? Yes, yes. I shut off the fuel. We, we won't need it until we land. Oh, thanks. Uh, if you would teach me, I could help you land the ship. Oh, I've never been to the moon. Well, sure. Just uh, slide over here to the control panel. All right. <laughs> like this? Oh, that's fine. Mm. Uh, we've got about four hours Earth time to get acquainted. Uh, uh, <clears throat> have you uh, known many women? <laughs> A few. Have you uh, had any boyfriends? <clears throat> One or two. Hmm. Well, I was never really serious about anybody. Oh. Uh, you uh, have a family? Yes. Uh, in Magnitogorsk. Oh. I'm from Brooklyn. Uh, how long have you been a rocket pilot? Oh, since I was 18. Uh, I'm 27. I'm 24. I learned rockets when I was 18 also. <laughs> oh. Well, uh, we... Better concentrate on the ship just now. Later on, we can talk about ourselves more. Meanwhile, though, I uh, hope you're not sorry. I mean, about this business. I guess it isn't very romantic. I'm not sorry.
We made a good landing. It didn't knock either of us unconscious. Then we got into our spacesuits and got out of the rocket. Some of the supply rockets were lying within a quarter mile. There were six eastern rockets and three westerns. About 800 yards away, though, there was a big supply rocket we couldn't identify. It looked different from the others, and neither of us could identify it as an eastern or western design we were familiar with. I pointed to it, and we headed there. Do you recognize that supply rocket? No, no, I, I was not briefed on anybody's standard still in the shade. Well, it must be something the chiefs of staff sent up as a surprise for us. I figured about uh, 50 feet long, but you can't see the rocket tubes. It, it might be a payload from a set rocket assembly. Uh-huh. Well, there's a door on the side, anyway, you see? At the top of that ramp. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, maybe we ought to observe it a while before we go in. Oh, nonsense. Come on. Ray! Yes? Ray, I, I, I'm frightened. There's something wrong with me. Only one way to find out, Anya. Let's go. Well, there's some kind of lock on this door. Let's see if it opens. Well, that was easy. It's lighted inside. Mm-hmm. Come on. Maybe they sent us a surprise cottage for the honeymoon. Special delivery to the moon. And this doesn't look like anything designed for humans to live in. The door's closed behind us. Try the lock. No, it's no use. Here, let me try. Oh, holy smoke, I can't get oh. it open. Do you have a gun? No, no, I have no weapons. They would be useless anyway. Hey. Oh, look. Good grief. They look like blobs of flesh with arms and legs. About, about three feet. Oh. Don't make any sudden moves. That's some kind of weapon he's carrying. Precisely, Captain Carmody. Who are you? How do you know my name? My people and I are inhabitants of another galaxy. Extraterrestrial. Precisely. As for how we know your name and your language, we have been studying you since you first achieved space travel. We have intercepted your radio communications, for example. Uh, have you been responsible for the lack of male birth? We have been beaming an ultrasonic wave toward your planet. Uh, what are you planning to do? For the moment, we will keep you aboard our ship and study you. You may remove your helmets, incidentally. We have provided an oxygen atmosphere. Can, can we risk it? Well, if he wants to kill us, there are easier ways. Here, help me get it off. <laughs> well, it breathes pretty good. Keep your helmet with you. You may make yourselves comfortable. We will bring you food and liquid from your supply rockets. Uh, do not attempt to escape, please. It could be most unpleasant. The next few days were like a nightmare. The blobs left us to ourselves except to feed us. Of course, it had its funny side, too. The creatures knew we needed liquid, but they couldn't distinguish between water and whiskey. For the first two days, we had nothing but whiskey to drink. For obvious reasons, I don't remember much about it, but uh, we did begin to sing to each other. We also got to know and like each other. I got to learn some Eastern songs. On the third day, the jugs were water jugs, and uh, we sobered up. Oh, what a hangover. <laughs> You were singing magnificently. Oh, well, you weren't so bad yourself. How long was I asleep? Oh, about eight hours. Ray, while you were passed out, I discovered how we can escape. What? I've been studying the blobs. They seem to have a five-hour sleep period when there is no sound in the ship. I've tried banging on the wall with my helmet during that period, but apparently they're almost completely unconscious during our... Mm -hmm. Five hours sleep. That means a planet with approximately a 20-hour rotation. The Joint Chiefs will want to know that if we get back. And, and more important, we are much stronger physically than they are. I can actually bend the metal of the door lock. Well, now, what are we waiting for? Let's put on our helmets and get out of here. Are they in the sleep period? Yes, for about three hours. Ray, do you think we can risk it? We don't have much choice. I'll go ahead. If we get out of this ship, you run for our rocket and start to refuel. I'll keep an eye on the blobs. All right. All right, but Ray, oh, please be careful. Don't worry. Uh, before you put on your space helmet... Uh, yes. You realize I've never even kissed the bride? Yes. Oh. Uh. 
Oh, Ray. Good luck, Mrs. Carmody. By the time I reached the ship, Anya had the rockets refueled. I jacked up the tail fins and we headed for space. When I checked our screen to see if the blobs were after us, we detected their ship heading toward the outer galaxies away from Earth. The rest was easy. In less than 24 hours, I was in the office of the president of the Western Alliance making a full report. The Eastern ambassador was there, along with the chief. Captain, this story is incredible. Well, I'll be glad to submit to a lie detector, Mr. President. There's one on its way. Our embassy is questioning Miss Borisovna right now to see if her story is similar. Are you positive they were extraterrestrials? I mean, couldn't they have been, well, Easterners? If Easterners are three feet tall without bones and look like little green blobs of protoplasm. Yes. It's for you, Ambassador Kravitz. Thank you. Yes. 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 Our woman tells the same story under scopolamine. It must be the truth. Obviously, they went back for reinforcements or further orders. If and when they get back, we've got to be ready for them. My government stands ready to cooperate fully. Excellent. We'll have to build a joint space station, get to the moon and fortify it jointly. If we pool all scientific knowledge, military data, we may be able to do it. Our propaganda ministry has already received orders to put everything into reverse gear. Comedy, I don't know how the world can ever thank you and Miss Borisovna. You not only averted a suicidal war between the East and West, you've also managed to draw us together in a joint effort where international power politics must be a thing of the past. Well, sir, uh, I have a request to make. Anything, my boy. By the way, your wife is on her way over. Uh, I'd like to get back to Junior to ask him a personal question. Before I see her again, if you don't mind. Well, that's rather odd, but I suppose if it's what you wish. Chief, would you let Captain Carmody operate the cybernetics machine alone for a few moments? Right this way, Ray, boy. I waited until I was alone with the big cybernetics machine. One green dial glowed malevolently as if the instrument was aware of my presence. I opened the input channel and spoke. Hello, Junior. This is your old friend, Ray. Give an appropriate answer. Hello, Ray. Now then, you remember Miss Borisovna, the girl who was selected for me to marry. Item one, she's going to rejoin me in a short while. Item two, I've fallen in love with her. Item three, before we actually live together as man and wife, I want to know something. Question. Does she love me? Yes. Oh, oh, that's my boy. Now then, just one more item before I say so long and take a honeymoon. Tell me, Junior, why do I have a hunch that those blobs from outer space will never be back? Answer, please. Because what you call a hunch comes from your own unconscious mind. Your unconscious mind knows that the extraterrestrials do not and never did exist. What? Do you wish the answer repeated? I wish you to tell me why I saw them, why Anya saw them. Neither of you saw them. Amplify that answer, Junior, or I'll smash every tube in your memory bank. Since I am an AC-7 cybernetics machine, I have no circuit reactor for threats of destruction of my tubes. The answer to your question is as follows. The memory of extraterrestrials is due to post-hypnotic suggestion. You mean I was hypnotized to find those blobs on the moon? Correct. And just who hypnotized me? I did. I hypnotized you. Oh. And Anya? A similar AC-7 cybernetics machine located at the University of Moscow. Would you explain why? Cybernetics machines are constructed to help humanity. A major war, the disastrous results of which I could accurately calculate, was inevitable unless forestalled. Calculation showed that the best way to avert that war was the creation of a common mythical enemy. Therefore, I created a situation which led to your mission to the moon. Well, well, wait a minute. You created the situation? Yes. Well, tell me how you did it. How did you prevent male babies from being conceived? A special modification of radio carrier wave for station JVT here in Washington, D.C., 
the only 24-hour-a-day radio station in the United States. The modification is not detectable by any instrument known to man at present. Well, how could you do that? You can't leave here. One year ago, you yourself fed me a problem. The design of a new cathode tube for radio station JVT. I modified the tube to send out a wave that would prevent male children from being conceived. So all we have to do is eliminate that tube. It will not be necessary. The tube was designed to burn out exactly 15 minutes ago. And the same thing happened in the Eastern Alliance? Precisely. Two properly constructed machines will always arrive at the same answer to the same problem. Oh, Junior, I gotta hand it to you. But why let me in on it? It is to the interests of humanity to know the truth. It is to your own interests... And you will tell no one because of the type of individual you are. Mankind will work together now to reach the stars. Uh, one last question, Junior. If Anya and I were just hypnotized to think all of that was happening up on the moon, what really did happen up there? I waited a while, but Junior was silent. It's the first time he ever pulled anything like that. However, I'll swear that I saw that green eye of his wink at me. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine which this month features Butterfly Nine by Donald Keith. The story of Jeff, who needed a job, and a man with a job to offer. One where giant economy-sized trouble had labels like fake make, bumsy, and peakage. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight by transcription, X-1 has brought you Honeymoon in Hell, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Frederick Brown and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were William Redfield, Bill McCure, Wendell Holmes, Charles Penman, Leon Janney, Roger DeCoven, and Jack Grimes. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Keep the fight against heart disease moving steadily forward. You're urged to support your heart fund. Send a generous contribution to your local heart association or to heart care of your local post office. When you help your heart fund, you help your heart. Hear the latest up to the second news with Frank Blair weekday mornings on most of these stations. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three. Two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight, the time after the next atomic war. The place, somewhere in the United States. The story, The Moon is Green, by Fritz Leiber. The moon was green. Green as emeralds, green as leaves, green as grass... I reached my arms toward it and let it bathe me. 
I closed my eyes and let it kiss me. Effie! Effie, where are you? Oh, dear Lord, he mustn't see it. It's so beautiful, and he always kills beauty. Effie! In the bedroom, Hank. I better close the shutters before he comes. He mustn't. Myself. Effie! What the devil are you doing? Close those shutters, you fool! Come away from there. You're trying to destroy yourself and me, too. You know those shutters are not safe to open for another five years. I only wanted to look at the moon. The moon? Here, count yourself for radiation. You know what the Central Committee would do to you for breaking the lead shield? Kill me. I wouldn't mind. Don't talk like that. Would it be so different from being shut up in a lead coffin the way we are now? Would it be worse than the eternal thud of the air conditioners and the radiation filters? Be still and count yourself. Good Lord. We're past the danger zone. Oh, wait a minute. Did you take off your watch? No. Well, give it to me. You fool. You little fool. What am I going to do with you? Can't you understand what kind of a world you're living in? Can't you? Oh, yes, husband. I can understand only too well. It's the world that can't seem to understand. The world that went on stockpiling hydrogen bombs. The world that started testing those bombs, telling itself it hadn't really exploded enough to make the air dangerous, and then began to throw them across continents, one nation against another. It lasted about two months, and after that, the fury, the fury of doomed men who thought only of taking with them as many of the enemy as possible. After the fury came the time of terror. Men and women with death sifting into their bones and through their nostrils, fighting for bare survival under a dust-hazed sky that played fantastic tricks with the light of the sun and the green light of the moon. The only chance for existence was to claim one of those underground radiation-shielded places. They went to the strong. And afterward, the waiting behind the lead shields. The endless, interminable waiting. You understand, I suppose, that we were allowed to reclaim this ground-level apartment only because the committee believed us to be responsible people. And because I've been making a darn good showing lately. Yes, Hank, I understand. It's a privilege to have some privacy, you know. I could send you back to the basement tenements. Would you like that? Oh, no. Anything rather than that fetid huddling and that shameless communal sprawl. And is this really so much better? Being on the surface is meaningless. It only tantalizes. And yet... Well? No, no, Hank. I, I don't want to go back underneath. Well, then try to behave yourself. Coming up through the tunnel just now, I decided I'd better talk to you. Frankly, Effie, the committee's beginning to be a little concerned about our lack of children. Oh. Charlie Baker asked me this morning if I'd like my name put on the list for a free woman. You needn't bother. What do you mean? I mean... We're going to have a baby. We... Effie, Effie, are you sure? Yes. Effie, that's wonderful. It's magnificent. Do you realize what this means to my rating with the committee? You know how important it is to the community to raise healthy members for the day when we can resume the surface war. Yes, I've heard the broadcast. We'll announce it at the meeting of the junior committee tonight. Tonight? Well, well you hadn't forgotten about it, had you? It's the annual banquet. 
Now, you brighten yourself up and put on your best dress. I want the other juniors to see what a handsome wife the new member has got. What's the trouble now? Well, I'm terribly sorry, Hank, but oh, you'll have to go alone. I'm really not well. There you go again. First the infantile, inexcusable business of opening the lead shutter, and now this. Don't you know what this could mean to my reputation, Effie? I'm sorry. You're but... coming, Effie. This is just neurotic pampering. Hank, I'll just be sick and you wouldn't be proud of me at all. Now listen, Effie. Tonight's too important. It'll, it'll cause a lot of bad comment if a new member's wife isn't present. Now, you know how just a hint of sickness starts all kinds of rumors about radiation disease. Now, now what do you say? No. Effie, you're going... There's nothing wrong with you if I have Hank. to... Hank! You're hurting my arm. It, it isn't good for the baby. Oh, the baby had almost forgotten. Oh. oh, no, we have to be very careful. I, well, I, I suppose if I explain to them you aren't there because of the baby, it will make a difference. Oh, yes, I'll just stay here alone till you come back. When will you be back? Well, those things... Usually go on pretty late. So if you're expecting company, you needn't worry. Hank. Yes, Effie? Do you remember when we were first married? Of course I remember. You liked to go skiing, remember? You said it was like feeding a hunger for beauty, being up on a mountain covered with snow. What are you talking about? You forgot. I haven't forgotten. I have just as much desire to get outside as you do, but I know there's no chance for me. I've got to see that my children and their children survive to see the sun again. We've got to behave like adults, to make sacrifices. We've got to keep the strain pure. Hank, what do you suppose it's like for them? For whom? The freaks and the mutants, the outsiders. What do you know about them? I remember some of the pariahs. They were hairless, cringing creatures with radiation welts all over their bodies. They came begging to be taken in during the last months of the terror. The committee ordered them shot down, just like dogs. We don't like to talk about that. Hank, are they still out there? Effie, this is the sort of talk that's just morbid. Are they? Yes! There are still humans out there. At least they were humans. They know better than to come near the shelters now. Poor creatures. I can't stand here discussing this nonsense all night. I have to get going. For the last time, are you sure you won't come down with me? No. I'll wait here. Don't you get lonely? No. I was talking to Jim Barnes today. He told me he wasn't going to be able to make it to the banquet either. Touch of the old flu, he said. That isn't like him, is it? Effie, are you listening? What? You remember Jim Barnes, don't you? He used to be sweet on you. Said you had the soul of a poet. Well, yes, I remember him. Why? Never mind. Well, I uh, guess I got a bit sharp with you. I'm sorry about that. I... I was excited about being made a junior and the baby and all. Selfish of me, I apologize. As you uh, get to bed early, I'll probably go over to the men's dorm for a while after the meeting. You'll be completely alone for the next four hours. Do you mind? What? Oh, uh, no, no. Good night, Effie. <laughs> at me strangely, and then his features returned to their usual, harder, more calculating expression. Was it possible that he had sensed my very dream? Had it been a dream? Oh, it must have been. It wasn't possible that it had really happened. It had just been an illusion, a silly projection out of my starved romantic imagination. I waited until Hank's footsteps vanished down in the tunnel. 
And then I waited until I heard it. No, it isn't possible. There's nothing out there. Nothing but deformed monsters. And open the shutters. I must know. Oh, dear Lord, I've got to know. I've got to know. I've got to know. Well, no. So you haven't forgotten our meeting after all. You. And what are you expecting, someone else? It wasn't a dream. You really were out there last night. Oh, yes, on the night before. I was afraid I dreamed it. I, I, I still think it's a dream. I... Lean out into the moonlight a moment. Is this a dream? <gasps> oh. Or was it a flesh and blood kiss? And your name is Patrick. I? Patrick. Well, now, did you open the window to find God's own breath, the fresh evening air, or did you open it to invite me in? Oh, of course. Come in. Come in. <laughs> Come, Joe Lewis. Ah, oh, here, now, let me hurt you. Being a cat with 12 toes on each foot and ears like boxing gloves is a bit cumbersome. I have to help him a bit, you see. Come on, now, laddie. There, now. Is, uh, is your husband about? No. No, he won't be home for a while. Well, still, I'd better close the door. Oh, no. Leave them open. The radiation? I don't care. I want to see the moonlight. I... Would you have a bit of food? Joe Lewis and I are starved for a bite to eat. Oh, yes. Yes, I'll get it. Oh, Effie. Yes? Oh, but you're a fair creature. Thank you. His face wasn't horrible at all. Only thin and sensitive and terribly sad. And there were no radiation welts or scars on his skin. He looked just as he had looked that first night when I opened the lead shutter and saw him crouched at the window. And now I knew it had been no dream. He was an outsider, a pariah. He was my love. Here's some canned meat and a food pill, and I put on some water for coffee. Ah, oh, bless you, Arun. Come on now, Joe. Here, here's a bit of meat for your black soul to feed on. <laughs> He's hungry, poor creature. <laughs> well, then, sit down, girl, where I can look at you. All right. Uh-huh. Have you missed me? Oh, yes. Oh, I've had some thoughts of you, I dare say. Talk to me. Of what? Tell me again about outside, what it's like. Again? Again and again. <laughs> well, now, outside... You say the coffee's eaten? Mm-hmm. Well, then, it is a wonderland for sure. More amazing than you and your entombed folk could ever imagine a veritable fairy land. Well, tell me the truth about well, the it. The truth? I am telling you the truth, my love. But the bombs and the dust made only ugliness. At first, at first. But then they changed the life in the seed of them that were brave enough to stay. Wonders beyond wondering bloomed and walked. Well, have none of you been outside? Well, the radiation teams go up into the ruined buildings once or twice a year to find canned food and batteries. But they can only work for a few minutes at a time. Ah, sure, those blind souled slugs could never see anything but food and batteries anyway. Oh, tell me what you see, beyond the city, I mean. Ah, there are gardens there. Gardens where a dozen buds blossom for every one before. And the flowers have petals a yard across. Oh. And there are stingless bees as big as sparrows soap in their necks. But did the radiation make all the cats like this one? Like this runt? Why no, girl? They are grown spotted and huge as leopards. But they're gentle beasts, for the dust has burned all the murder out of every living thing. Well, Hank says the dust kills. Would you like to hear a poem I made? Yes. I, I'd say it. Fire can hurt me, or water, or the weight of earth. 
but by some curious coincidence, the dust is my friend. Oh, more. <laughs> Well, then, there are robins like cockatoos and squirrels like a prince's ermine, all under a treasure chest of sun and moon and stars that the dust changes from ruby to emerald and sapphire. And there are... What is it, love? What's that look for? There's one thing you've never told me about. And what is that? The children. The new children. Ah, no, the truth. The truth. The truth? Promise. I swear on the skin of my cat here. The children, is it, huh? Well, now, if you'd ever catch a glimpse of one of them, you'd never doubt me again. They have long limbs and smiling, delicate faces and white teeth and the finest hair. They're so nimble that... Well, that even I, a sprightly man and somewhat enlivened by the dust, feel crippled beside them, and their thoughts dance like flames. But what's wrong with them, Patrick? Wrong? Nay, love, there's nothing wrong. Different, perhaps, than you, but not wrong. Oh, tell me, tell me. Well, then, they do have seven fingers on each hand and eight toes on either foot. But they're much more beautiful for it. And they have large, beautiful ears that the sun shines through. So lovely and delicate to behold. How do they behave? Their minds. Not as you and I, perhaps. They play happily in the gardens all day long, laughing and finding joy in the simplest beauty. Are they defective? Well, no. By the standards out there, you're the defective one shut up here all the while, hating and crawling in ugliness and feeling dirty. No, they're quite lovely. And they're quite perfect, the new children. Oh, you're telling the truth. You're not making it up. It is true, every word of it. Oh, I'll admit you have to look a bit hard to find these things I've been telling you. But find them you may. Do you believe me? Oh, yes. Yes, I believe you. But I'm afraid. Give me your hand. Here. Now listen to me. You must not be afraid to do as your heart tells you. That's why I'm here. Oh, Patrick. Patrick. Don't either of you move. Oh, Hank, I... Stay there, I'll blast both of you. Hank, but... Carrying on like this and not even with a man of the community, with an outcast, a pariah. No, no, man, I know what you're thinking, but you're wrong. I just happened to be coming by hungry, a lonely tramp, and I knocked at the shutter and your wife was a bit foolish and let her kind heart get the best of it. Do you think you can sell me that? Hank, please. So you're going to have a child, my dear. My child? Y yes, your child. Ah. I should pull this trigger right now. I should shoot him down in cold blood. Man, you're mad. I never touched your wife. You contaminated pariah. You're going to die. Don't you know that? Hank. Hank, if you kill him, you kill the bringer of the best news we've ever had. Oh, Hank, put aside your jealousy for just a minute and listen to me. Patrick has something wonderful to tell us, all of us. What do you mean? I mean that we need no longer fear the dust. Oh, Hank, remember how it was with me. All the exposure I had, and yet there are no burns. Hank, those who were brave enough to stay outside have adapted. They've become a beautiful people. Did he tell you that? Everything that grew or moved was purified. He filled you with lies so he could take you... No, it's true. The radioactivity is almost gone, burned out. Effie, I've been out there. It's horrid. No, no, no. You've been blinded. Blinded to beauty. Blinded to living. Good Lord, you believe it. It's true. It must be true. Look at Patrick. He's living proof. He's been outside for a year and there isn't a mark on him, not a scar. It's because he's brave. And the dust can't hurt the brave. Well, you think that's it, huh? All right, Effie, I'm going to prove something to you. You, Patrick, take this radiation counter. Take it. Very well. Press the button and count yourself. Go on. 
As you say. Read it. Read it! One thousand seven hundred. Yeah, you hear that, Effie? One thousand seven hundred radioactives. Enough to kill a thousand men. He's like raw radium. If you turn out the light, he'll glow green in the dark. A week's exposure to him will destroy you. What are you proving, Hank? That he's a freak. A freak! Get away from him. He's destroying you right now. May I shut this thing off? No. Patrick. Is it true? Yes, I'm afraid it is true. Oh, Oh, you do well to cringe, both of you. I'm living death. I'm death itself. As your husband so wisely said, I'm a freak. Just like the man who ate nails and walked on fire. Only my oddity is that for some unknown reason, the dust can't harm me. I'm the only one. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen. Not too close now. And examine the man who couldn't die. And now, if you don't mind, I'll go back to my dead world and leave you to yours. Wait. All of those... those beautiful things. It gets so lonely out there. And I was starved for beauty. And so were you. There's no garden out there. Garden. Listen to me, the both of you. What is out there is more terrible than either of you can imagine. You're worse than Hank, even. He only killed beauty once. But you brought it to life so you could kill it again. You're afraid. Afraid of the loneliness out there. Well, I'm not afraid. Effie, keep away from the window. No, I'm not afraid. Maybe there is no garden out there. And no beautiful, strange children to play happily. But there can be if we're brave enough. Effie. I'm going, Hank. I'm going, Effie. Effie, come back, Effie. It's no use trying to keep her, man. Effie, come back. I love you. Come back. There's no use, man. There's still time. She stood the dust better than most. There's still time. You... The dust won't hurt you. Find her. Bring her back. I'll reward you. I'll I'll give you food. If you want her, you'll have to go yourself. She'll die. Maybe she won't. How can you say such a thing? Because perhaps she's like me. Aye. Perhaps the two of us together could be the first of a race that'll live in sunlight again. Get against the wall where I can kill you easier. Why would you kill me? Is killing all the answer you have to life's riddles? Is the smell of blood better than compassion? Is it more joy to own her than to be loved by her? Move! Man, you'll not kill me. Shall I tell you why? Because my flesh will not die. I live a thousand years. Not your brain, Patrick. And that's where this gun is aimed. Well, then you leave me no choice. You get him! Hey! hey! Call him up! Cut my arm! Go! Stop! Well, then I have your weapon now. Out there, you see, we freaks have learned to live together and to cooperate. It's the only way we can stay alive. Oh, I'll... I'll give Effie your love. Come on, Joe. Oh, you'd... uh, You'd better close the shutters as soon as we're gone. The moon is beautiful. But it's deadly. end of the ruined street. When we looked back, we saw Hank closing the lead shutters on himself. We were alone in the world. Above us, the moon was green. I 
bent and picked up a handful of the dust and let it trickle through my fingers. And I remembered the words of Patrick's poem. Fire can hurt me, or water, or the weight of the earth. But by some strange coincidence, the dust is my friend. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Advance Agent by Christopher Anvil. The story of a spy who had the worst possible break. The disguise he had assumed was that of a famous man. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Moon is Green, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Fritz Leiber and adapted for radio by George Leffords. Featured in the cast were Joyce Gordon as Effie, Bill Lifton as Hank, Ian Martin as Patrick, and Frank Milano as the cat. This is Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. Blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight, the time is June 25th, 1962. The place, a lonely beach. The story, Saucer of Loneliness by Theodore Sturgeon. My name is Jason Berniades. I'm a newspaper reporter, 31 years old. I write poetry, but I don't show it to anybody because they might laugh. And the things I write about are very important to me. I was an only child. I never went with girls much because I'm too ugly and too sensitive. And they used to hurt me. I live alone. It isn't much fun. I'm not painting this picture of myself to get sympathy. I don't need it. But it's important that you should know the kind of person I am. Otherwise, you won't understand what I'm going to tell you. It happened tonight, the thing I'm going to tell you about. Tonight. The 25th of June, 1962. I was down on the beach. Hey! Mister! Hey, mister! What is it, kid? You, you seen a cop around any place? On this beach? I found this pile of clothes down near the rocks. A lady's dress and shoes. Well, did you see anybody? A girl? Well, I think so, but she was running along the sand in the moonlight. I yelled to her, but she just kept running, and then I found these. Look, kid, you go try to find a cop someplace. I'll see if I can find the girl. Okay. I thought to myself, she's dead. I'll never find her now in this white flood of moonlight with the surf seething in over the pale sand. I ran and ran until my knees buckled and went down in the swirl of it. The sea on my lips, with the taste of tears, and the whole white night shouted and wept. 
and then I saw her, waist deep, walking into the surf. Stop. Stop it. Come back. Come on, come on. Let go. Let me go. Don't do it. Please don't. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. No. I'm going to have to hit you. Forgive me. I hit her in the neck with the edge of my hand, and she slumped. I brought her ashore and carried her to where a dune was between us and the water. Then I rubbed her wrists. She had a pale, beautiful face with ancient, bottomless blue eyes. She opened them and looked at me after a moment. It's all right. Here, put my coat over you. Why couldn't you leave me alone? I couldn't. Why? Because it's important to me. I suppose you want to know why I did it? If I told you I understand, would you believe me? How could you understand? Maybe I know what it means to be lonely. That? That's it, isn't it? I don't know. I'm so terribly tired. Put your head against my arm and just stay. I... Don't be afraid. I've been looking for you for a long time. Looking for me? All my life. How did you know? I don't believe you. It's true. I found your message. Oh? So you see, there's nothing to be afraid of. Not anymore. Just rest. The moonlight is terribly white. Yes. I'd like to rest for a while. She didn't remember it, of course. But I was one of the reporters who had covered the story when it first happened, five years ago. I'll never forget that day. I was working the police blotter. It was a quiet summer afternoon when they brought her in. Two big cops in blue uniforms. Come on now, girlie, come on. Let me go. I haven't done anything. I'll take it easy now. What's the trouble, Connolly? Disturbing the peace, Sergeant. Is this that Central Park call? Hey, this is it. I thought you radioed that there was a near riot up there. Oh, you should have seen the place. All right, give me the report. Well, me and Bennett got up there, and there was a mob of people all surrounding this girl, see? So we bust through, and there in the middle of maybe 600 people, she, she's lying there, sort, sort of in a faint. I asked a couple of people what the difficulty was, and they tell me it's the flying saucer. The what? The flying saucer. What flying saucer? Let me finish, Sergeant. What flying saucer, I ask? And then they says that this girl was standing on the green, and suddenly the saucer comes down and starts whirring over her head. Like a halo. What is this, miss? A gag? It happened. It did, eh? Well, now suppose you tell me your version. I was standing in the park, and I looked up, and there it was. Describe it. It was beautiful. It was golden with a, a dusty finish, like, like an unripe conquered grape. It made a faint sound, a, a chord of two tones. It circled over my head like some great round hummingbird. Go on. Well, other people must have seen it because they were all looking at me and, and pointing. I saw one man cross himself. And then it came down and, and touched me and spoke to me. The, this flying saucer spoke to you? Yes. <clears throat> and, uh... Just what did it say to you? I said, what did it say? I can't tell you. A secret, huh? Yes. I see. Finally, this girl is for Bellevue. Well, well Sergeant, the, the plain fact is that it, it happened just like that. And, and ten witnesses all agree it did. Are you trying to tell me that there was such a thing as this whirring hummingbird of a saucer? Oh, there was that, Sergeant. I 
And just how do you know, Connolly? Well, we've got the thing out in the squad car. You what? Ben is bringing it in right now, see? You... About 36 inches across it is. And covered with strange markings. Great, Mother. Did you call the bomb squad? I didn't think of it. Well, think of it, man. This may be some kind of atomic weapon. I'll turn it over to ballistics. Never mind about ballistics. Call the FBI and tell them we've got this thing. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Uh, what about the girl? We'll book her on disturbing the peace. I've got a feeling the government men may want a word with her. Uh, Sergeant. Uh, what is it, Benides? I'd like to do a story on this for my paper. Could I have a look at the saucer? Uh, we'd better clear it first. Well, could I talk to the girl? After she's been booked. Uh, Connolly, is the crowd still up at the park? Uh, very likely. Well, I'll run up there and get some eyewitnesses. Then I'd like to come back and talk to the girl. Up at the park, they were still buzzing about it. Some said she was a communist agitator. Some said it was a flying saucer from Mars, and she had stepped out of it. Others said she was a saint, and it was her halo. I took some notes, phoned the paper, and went back downtown to talk to her. But there were a couple of agents with her, and they wouldn't let me in. Now then, miss, you told the sergeant this saucer spoke to you, is that correct? Yes. Did it speak to you in English? I don't know. You did understand it, though? Yes. Do you speak any other languages? No. Tell me, what message did you receive from this instrument? Wasn't anything, really. Suppose you tell me. I'd rather not. Miss, let me be very frank. I'm not a policeman. I'm a security agent. That means that I deal with problems that affect the security of our country. Do you understand? Yes. Now, we've examined this flying saucer enough to know that it is not of American manufacture. It also possesses an extremely high radioactive count. Now, that means that it was made in an area where radioactive materials are in great abundance, such as an area where atom bombs are made. That's why we want to know the message you received from the saucer. There was no message. You just made it up? Yes. I'm afraid you're lying. Suppose we have some soldiers bring the saucer in here and hold it over your head. Would you object? I don't care what you do. All right, boys, bring it in. Now, when I tell the men to hold it over your head, you try to recall what it said. I don't know what it said. Lift it up, boys. Hold it right over her head. All right, It's talking to you now, isn't it? Yes. What is it saying? What did it say? All right, boys, crate it up and send it down to the National Research Laboratories. Right. What about the girl, sir? We'll get nothing out of her. I don't believe she really knows what that humming noise is. Better have a psychiatrist examine her. Yes, sir. took her to the city hospital and she had a room to herself. Whenever the door opened, she could see the policeman outside. The door opened quite often. There were a lot of important people, some in army uniforms, who came up from Washington just to see her and talk to her. Apparently, they had analyzed the flying saucer and discovered something that made this girl about the most important person in the country. I used to stand outside and I could identify the heads of certain security agencies, but nobody would answer the questions that the reporters shot at them. Sir, excuse me? Yes? I'm Jason Benayades from the Trib. I've been assigned to this flying saucer story as chief of the security... I'm sorry, section. I have no comment. Can you tell me how long the girl will be held? That's a matter for the civil authorities. Well, have the psychiatrist... Excuse determine... me, Mr. Benayades, my car's waiting. A few days later, she was released from the hospital and returned to the court to be tried on the disorderly conduct charge. They found her guilty and fined her $15 and turned her loose. When she walked out of the courtroom, she was handed a subpoena to appear before a congressional committee in private session. She answered all their questions except one. My paper sent me over to cover the hearings. Now, young lady, I want to remind you that I'm a senator of the United States and empowered by the people of this country to ask questions relating to matters of security. Do you understand? Yes. Your name is Janet Boyce, is it not? I told you that. Now, at an earlier session, you testified that as a young girl, you were a member of a certain organization in your neighborhood. Would you name it? The Rinky Dinks. Who comprised the Rinky Dinks, Miss Boyce? It was just a bunch of girls who got together to play field hockey and listen to recordings. Any particular recordings? 
Mostly Eddie Fisher. I see. Now, this flying saucer, you said it talked to you. You did say that, didn't you? Yes. And then you denied it? Yes. Why? Because I was tired of answering questions. Young woman, let me put something to you squarely. Oh, by the way, I think if there are members of the press here, I can divulge a rather spectacular piece of information to you. Mm. <clears throat> this flying saucer has been thoroughly examined and analyzed, and I wish to inform the people of this great nation that it definitely, I repeat, it definitely did not originate on this planet. Oh. <laughs> Now then, now then, Miss Boyce, consider that it is possible that our Earth might be attacked from outer space by beings much stronger and cleverer than we are. And consider that perhaps you have the key to our defense against those beings. Don't you owe it to the world? I don't think I owe anything to anybody. Even if the Earth was not attacked, just think what an advantage it would give this country over its enemies. Young woman, I ask you, what did that flying saucer say to you? Do you know that what you're doing is tantamount to working for the enemies of your country? I will give you one more chance. What was the message? It was personal. Gentlemen, I move that Miss Janet Boyce be cited for contempt. The furor was fantastic. The chief of security blasted the senator for divulging secret information about the origin of the flying saucer, and the senator said the people had a right to know, and besides, he was just guessing anyway, and happened to guess right. Meanwhile, the press printed the girl's picture all over the front page and ran banner headlines such as, Girl refuses to betray Martian secrets. Flying saucer girl won't talk, cited for contempt. The contempt trial was equally spectacular. She didn't plead any amendment or anything. She just said the saucer was talking to her, and it was nobody else's business. She was convicted and sentenced to five years in prison. Boniades. Yes, Chief. For the Sunday supplement? What... Well, do you think there's anything in it? Okay, whatever you say. Uh, Mike, get me everything you can on that flying saucer girl, will you? Yeah, the one that was sent to jail about four years ago. See if you can find out what she's doing now. She was released about six months ago, I think. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, the boss wants a feature for the Sunday supplement. Okay. I found out she had gotten a job cleaning at night in offices and stores down near the beachfront. There weren't many to clean, but that meant there weren't many people to remember her face from the newspapers. I tracked her down and caught up with her in a one-armed coffee joint about four in the morning. Excuse me, miss. Do you mind if I sit here? No, no. no. Nice night, isn't it? Moonlight and everything. Which are you? Security, newspapers, or just somebody out for a good time? You're pretty bitter, aren't you? Shouldn't I be? Yeah, I guess you should. Um, my name is Jason Boniades. I'm with a newspaper. It's been nice meeting you. I have to go now. Just a minute. Please. I can't blame you. How did you find me? One of the leg men located your mother. I talked to her earlier tonight. Oh. How is she? It's still hitting the bottle. The way she knew where you were, you sent her some flowers on her birthday, remember? Yes. She wouldn't talk to me. Said she didn't want a daughter who was a jailbird. Tell me how it's been. So you can write about I it? I promise you I won't write anything you don't want me to write. Okay. Do you want to know how it's been? Right after I got out of jail, I met a man at a restaurant. 
nice man. He asked me for a date. I spent every cent I had on a red handbag to go with my red shoes. They, they weren't the same shade, but anyway, they were both red. And I was very excited about the date. We went to a movie. Afterward, he didn't even try to kiss me or anything. He just wanted to know what the flying saucer had told me. I didn't say anything. I just went home and cried all night. And that was it? No. I had another date. I get pretty lonely. This time, they arrested the man I was with. He was a Russian agent. On Christmas Eve, four men called me up and sang me a song. Would you like to hear the words? Uh, it doesn't they matter. They go, the flying saucer came down one day and taught her a brand new way to play. And what it was, she will not say. But she takes me out of this world. I'm sorry. Now will you go away and leave me alone? Yes. Aren't you going to ask me the big question? No. Everybody does. No, well, not me. You will, sooner or later. Maybe. Look, uh, can I take you home? No. Can I see you again? I... Please. I don't know. I'm afraid to let myself like anyone. Trust me, will you? I'm... I'm not sure. Maybe. Maybe. I'll wait here for you tomorrow night. All right. The next night, I went back to the coffee joint to wait for her. I knew she got through about four in the morning. I got there about 15 minutes early. Mr. Benitez? Yes. Say... You're the chief of the security section, aren't you? You have a good memory. You mind if I sit down? Well, I'm expecting someone. Yes, I know. Oh, I see. I'd like to talk to you. Go ahead. You, uh... You probably know that we've been trying to gain the confidence of this girl for some years now. Yes. And, uh... Apparently, you've succeeded where we've failed. Well, not really. In any event, you seem to be making some progress. She may not even show up. I think she will. Now, I'm going to ask you to help us. Help? In what way can I help? We have reason to believe that this girl is a courier for some alien power. On what do you base that? Well, there was the incident of the saucer, of course. We've definitely established that it came from some other planet. And recently, she's been throwing messages inside bottles into the ocean. What sort of messages? They're always the same. Now, I have one right here. You're welcome to read it and see if it makes any sense. We've had every decoding expert in the service trying to break it. But we can't seem to find the key. I see. Now, she's throwing literally hundreds of these messages in bottles into the sea. We've got many of them, but not all, naturally. Now, what we're most interested in is locating the contact. Naturally. And that's where you fit in. We'd like you to gain this girl's confidence even further. Try to find out just what these messages mean, and beyond that, what the saucer said to her. You'll be doing us a favor and your country a great service. You're... You're certain this is some subversive activity on her part? How else can you explain the fact that she won't tell us her secret? Maybe because it's hers, and everybody has a right to have something of his own. Are you, uh, trying to tell me that you won't cooperate? I didn't say that. I'd like to remind you, Mr. Benaides, that you have a duty to us. I know that. I also have a duty to myself and to God. Uh, if you'll excuse me. I folded the bottle message and put it in my pocket. I waited for her to show up. The minutes went by, and the hours, and I knew she wasn't coming, or she had come and seen me with the chief and changed her mind. That's when I left the cafe and walked down to the beach. 
That's when I dragged her out of the surf before she could follow one of her bottles into the water. How do you feel now? Are you cold? Why should you care? I do. Is that why you were sitting with the security chief in the cafe? I didn't arrange that meeting. He asked me to spy on you. I suppose he told you about the bottles. Yes. <laughs> Wonder how much of the taxpayers' money they spent gathering them up. I think they'd get tired of it. All the writing in the bottles is the same. Maybe you could have saved a lot of trouble. Do you think so? All of them. Judges, jailers, jukeboxes. People... Do you really think it would have saved me a minute's trouble if I told them the whole truth at the very beginning? Wouldn't it? No. They wouldn't have believed me. What they wanted was a, a new weapon. Some super scientific super science from some alien super race. Science. That's all they think of. Yeah. It's pretty important. Would it ever have occurred to them that this super race from another planet might have super feelings? Or super longings? Or super loneliness? No. All they think about is weapons. Isn't it time you asked me what the saucer said? No. They all will ask me. I don't have to ask you. I know. You know? Let me read it to you. There is in certain living souls a quality of loneliness unspeakable. So great it must be shared as company is shared by lesser beings. Such a loneliness is mine. So know by this that in immensity there is one lonelier than you. How did you know? It's the message you put in the bottles. The same message that some lonely, strange being in some other world put into a bottle, only his bottle was a flying saucer and sent across space to you. You knew. I'm lonely, too. Look at me. I've never had the love of a woman. They think I'm pretty ugly. You're not ugly. No. I don't feel ugly right now. Say it again. The message from the saucer. Know by this that in immensity... There is one lonelier than you. I wonder if whoever first wrote it has found someone. I think perhaps he has. She looked at me and said nothing. But it was as if a light came from her. More light than even the practiced moon could cast. Among the many things it meant was the fact that even to loneliness there is an end for those who are lonely enough, long enough. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features I Am a Nucleus by Stephen Barr, the story of a man who felt he was hexed because his comfortably untidy world had suddenly turned into a monstrosity of order. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Saucer of Loneliness, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Theodore Sturgeon 
and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Elaine Rost as Janet, Nat Poland as Jason, William Keene as the sergeant, Jock McGregor as the cop, Mandel Kramer as the chief, and Wendell Holmes as the senator. This is Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Fred Way and is an NBC Radio Network production. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, The Girls from Earth by Frank M. Robinson. Mike McDonald is the name. Firm of Beagle and McDonald, Interplanetary Promotions, number one Park Avenue, New York. Drop in sometime. Brand new offices. Had them decorated by one of the biggest guys in the business. You know, it's hard to believe that only six months ago, me and Charlie Beagle, my associate, were stranded in a one-tank mining town on Mars. Let me tell you about it. Here comes the waiter. Play it cool. Yeah, but we got no Play dough. Play it cool, I said. Gentlemen, uh, I'll have the sirloin. One sirloin. Earth or Martian? Well, what's the difference? Well, the Earth sirloin's from genuine steers, $24 a pound. The Martian sirloin's from a domestic sloofer, $2. Charlie, uh, you ever tasted Slufa? Uh-uh. We'll have the domestic. Very good. A beverage? Got any coffee? <laughs> we ran out of coffee in 1997. Haven't been able to get any. Try the muggle juice. Muggle juice? It's a Martian vegetable. That's a pleasant narcotic effect. Uh, you better make it whiskey. Whiskey? <laughs> that we got. Fine. My friend will have the same. Yes, sir. Mike, would you mind telling me how we're going to pay for this, this Slufa steak? Relax. I'm thinking. And even more important, how are we going to get out of this burg? Charlie... What we need is a mark. A mark? A sucker. And if I'm not mistaken, this little guy with the glasses coming in now is just what we're looking for. Pardon me, sir. Uh, my friend and I are just in from Earth, and we don't know much about the customs here. I wonder if you'd be good enough to let us buy you dinner and tell us something about the town. Why, that's very kind of you. You needn't buy me dinner, though. After all, you're the guests here. Well, that's very nice of you. <laughs> Do join us. Thank you. My name is Henry Mortensen. I'm geologist for the Interplanetary Mining Company. Mike McDonald and my friend Charlie Beagle. How do you do? A oh, pleasure. You say you're just in from Earth? Yes, that's right. Charlie and I are interested in uranium. Just sort of snooping around to see if there's a decent investment up here. Oh, I see. You'll uh, forgive me. It's not much of a town, really. No, I don't suppose it is. After all, you take 20,000 men and plunk them down in the desert like this, and you can't expect much. 20,000 men? No tomatoes? Sir? Uh, tomatoes. Uh, girls. Girls. Oh, I'd almost forgotten what the word meant. No, you see, the colonization board hasn't been very successful in persuading Earth women to migrate here. There are a few female Saturnians, the four-armed variety, but aside from that... Uh, uh, well, what do the boys do for uh, relaxation? Well, being a geologist, I'm naturally interested in rock formations. For relaxation? A great many of the men indulge in gambling, and, of course, there are slim phrases every glib day. <laughs> glib day? We have a nine-day week here on Mars. Oh. Tell me, Mr. Mortensen. Henry. Tell me, Henry. Don't the boys get lonesome for the sight of a woman? Well, it is a problem. The 
Men sign up for nine-year hitches. Most of them have forgotten what a woman looks like. Mm -hmm. Do most of these men plan to stay here? I suppose if they had families, they might. The pay is good, and I suspect most of them had their reasons for leaving Earth. I see. Well, how about yourself? Suppose you found the right woman, which in this case would be just about any woman. Oh, I'm very particular. Oh, I mean any woman who met your rigid specifications. Would you stay? You mean get married? Yeah, that's the bit. Well, I... Well, of course, it's out of the question. No woman has ever showed the slightest interest in me. Well, suppose one agreed to marry you in advance and she met all your specifications. Well, I've always wanted a family. Yes, I suppose I'd marry. That's very admirable. Very, very admirable. Uh, here's the waiter with our dinner. Blue first steak, gentlemen. Good luck with it. Henry picked up the tab, and we got a rough idea how much cash these guys on Mars pack around with them. Enough to choke a galactic telescope is about all. We thanked the little guy and sat around until he left. Then I went to work. Okay, what do we do now? Charlie, we get to work. What work? Oh, card game, maybe? Listen, these guys have been playing cards for 15 years now. We wouldn't have a prayer. Uh-uh. I got an idea. So give. You still got that Earth magazine, the one with the Hollywood starlet on the cover? Yeah, and my suitcase. Good, I want it. What for? To make our poster advertisement. That's what's for. Poster? Look, Charlie, just picture this. A big poster with that starlet on it, twice as big as life. And underneath, this slogan. I'm coming from Earth to you. Huh? Then down in the corner, just this little notice. Applications will be accepted at Beagle and McDonald Agency. Oh, it's great. But what is it? What is it? Just the most colossal promotion scheme ever devised by man, that's all. But what are you promoting? The easiest thing in the world to promote. And the hardest. Marriage. Marriage? Look at it this way, Charlie boy. Here on Mars, we have 20,000 strong Earth men with but a single thought. Dames. Exactly. And on Earth, we have 20 million single dames with but a thought. Husbands. So? So, how are you going to do it? All right, now we get this poster made. We put it up. We take applications. A hundred bucks a head plus the cost of transportation. We get the hundred bucks. Then we leave. But first we deliver the girl. Oh, it's a natural. A natural. Charlie, it's colossal. What's 20,000 times a hundred? Two million bucks. Wow, that's our profit. <laughs> Wait a minute. What? How are we going to line up 20,000 girls and convince them to come up to this desert? I'm working on that. Come on, we've got to find a printer to make our poster. What do we use for dough? You hock your watch. Come on, let's go. <laughs> got the poster made, and it is a beaut. The artist threw in some extra fullness in the lips and stuck a glass of champagne in one hand. The next step was to rent a little field tent right outside the mining camp. We stuck the poster in front of it and waited for the guys to get through work. Hey, Tom. Hey, take this. What do you say we sign up? What for? Well, whatever they're selling inside. Uh, I don't know. Well, come on. What have we got to lose? You, uh, gentlemen, interested in matrimony? Marriage? That's what we're selling, boys. To her? Or anybody your heart desires. Just step inside, fill out the specification chart, pay your fee, and we deliver. On the level? On the level. Well, what do you say, Tom? It's worth a gavel. Right this way, gentlemen. Mr. Beagle will take care of you. No sooner said than done, gentlemen. Step right this way and live! <laughs> At the end of the first day, we had deposits amounting to about $15,000. By the third day, we had to beat them off with clubs. Everybody had a dream, girl, and we were guaranteeing delivery. 40000 50000 60000 bucks! Oh, Mike, Mike, what do you say we skip out on the first space freight? What are you, nuts? There's another million coming here, and my name isn't Mike McDonald. Oh, yeah, incidentally. Yeah. Have you figured out a way to deliver on this swindle? Naturally. You have? Of course. Oh. We just go down to Earth and put up a different poster. Guaranteed husbands. Every one of them an Adonis. What happens when they arrive? We get lynched? Look, while these... These ladies are en route to Mars, you and me are en route to Earth. Get it? Yes. (laughs) 
I radio phoned a friend of mine down on Earth and had him place an ad in the New York papers the next day, complete with a picture of a handsome Martian uranium miner and a caption that read, Husbands are waiting on Mars. When the next space liner rolled in, it brought the list of lady applicants from Earth, complete with photographs and background. Here's the first batch, Charlie. Let's look them over. Yeah, right. Let's see now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. Maybe the next one will be a little better. How is it? Uh-uh. Let's see the next one. Yeah. Well, Lola Carroll, age 29. 29? Whew, she's 40 if she's a day. Occupation, homebody. Background in education, blank. Oh, note from Mitchell. Says she did four years at a reformatory for shoplifting, and she's currently on parole. Mm. Let's see this one. Wanda Baker, age 35, occupation gymnastic instructor, state college. Note says she was picked up for loitering and fined on 17 different occasions. Oh, brother. These uh, ain't exactly the creme de la creme, these ladies. Now, what'd you expect? It ain't what I expect, Mike. It's what the boys in the mining camp expect. A hundred buck fee plus twenty five hundred for transportation. That ain't hay. Wait a minute. I got an idea. I'm waiting. First, we get rid of all these pictures, see? Then we print up a few thousand pictures of movie starlets and we paste them on the applications. We make a few changes in the statistics, such as age and so on, and we're back in business. You know, Mike, I used to think you were about as crooked as a one armed bandit, but I don't think it anymore. I know it. <laughs> So we spent the next few nights pasting up pictures and changing age 38 to age 28 and so on. It was easy. Then we called in the applicants from the mining camp and gave each one the dope sheet on his prospective bride. Hey, Bill. Hey, look at mine. Lola Carroll, age 29. Boy. Well, mine's named Wanda Baker. She's 25. Well, you dig this picture? She's almost... What's wrong? Mine looks exactly like yours. Huh? Let me see. Take a look at those two pictures. You're right. Wait a minute. Hey, hey, Mr. Mortensen. Yeah? Take a look at this. Both alike. Ah, most peculiar. Particularly peculiar since, well, mine looks like yours, too. You put in for a wife? Why not? Miranda Potts, age 25. A former lady wrestling coach. But the uh, pictures puzzle me. I think maybe these guys are trying to pull a fast one. You may be right at that. Come, gentlemen, let's pay a visit to our benefactors, Mr. McDonald and Mr. Beagle. At the precise moment that Henry Mortensen and his two aggressive companions decided to drop in on myself and Charlie Beagle, we were in the process of tying our money into small bundles and placing it in suitcases, which also contained our clothes and tickets for the next rocket to Earth. It was very embarrassing. Oh, yes, gentlemen? We would like a word with you, Mr. McDonald. Well, Mr. Beagle and I are a little busy. I'm afraid it'll have to wait. Well, what seems to be the problem? Just the three of us have the picture of the same girl clipped to our applications. Really? Well, let's have a look. Right here. <laughs> well, what do you know? Charlie, take a look. Huh? You imbecile, you didn't check for duplicates. Well, now I think maybe I have an explanation, boys. Go on. None of you has been on Earth for some years now, is that right? That's true. Well, you know how styles take hold on Earth. One year, every woman's curly and blonde. Next year, it's, it's straight and brunette. Well, the same thing has happened with cosmetics, makeup, and so on. Now, gentlemen, when I was on Earth last month, every woman in New York was trying to look like a certain movie actress. It got so men couldn't tell their own wives apart. <laughs> that isn't very convincing, Mr. McDonald. Look, boys... Obviously, there was some mix-up at the Earth Agency. They got the wrong pictures pasted up or something, but I'm sure it'll all straighten itself out. Now, if you don't mind, Mr. Beagle and I have to finish packing. We mind. You do? You do. Uh-huh. Tom, you take that money in those suitcases and lock them up over the company office. Now, boys, just a minute. That stealing, boys, it's considered dishonest. We ain't stealing. We're just keeping the stuff in escrow, you might say. Till when? Till the rocket ships get here with the girls. If these dames are as gorgeous as you tell us they are, you'll get every penny of your dough. Uh, suppose they ain't quite gorgeous. Then you and your friend here are going to suddenly find yourselves unable to carry on as living humans. You fetch my meaning? I fetch. <laughs> Well, 
Well, this caused a small dilemma in me and my partner, Beagle. The problem was easy to state. We had sold these guys on the idea that they were engaged to be wedded to an assortment of lovely, desirable, attractive young girls from Earth. The contingent from Earth, on the other hand, was made up mainly of frustrated, lonely women and a goodly portion of female criminal types. The problem was how to convince these boys that they were not getting cheated. Uh, that's enough, Charlie. Now, the problem is how to convince everybody that he ain't getting cheated, right? Oh, you're a master of summing up a problem. Now, how about solving Jess, it? Yes, give me some time. Look, the rocket fleet from Earth arrives here tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. 20,000 very strong miners will be assembled at the rocket port waiting. True, true. So? Pour me a little more of that muggle juice. No. Oh. <sighs> muggle juice. We could get them all drunk on muggle juice, mass hypnotize them. No, I'm dreaming. So what do we do? I could make a speech, appeal to their better selves, say these poor, unfortunate women need love and affection, something they've never had. Uh-huh. How about makeup? Maybe we could hire a cosmetic man to make them up to look like the pictures. Sure, sure. Or we could say that it's all a big mistake. We got the wrong shipment. Or we could kill ourselves. No need for that, Charlie. That's going to be done for us. Yeah, that's what I figure. Well, it's been a short life and a merry one. Drink up, Charlie. For tomorrow we die. The next morning, the miners came in from all parts of the desert to assemble at the spaceport. It was quite a sight. They'd all shaved and spruced up for the occasion, and some of them looked downright handsome. And every one of them had a package wrapped with ribbon for his prospective bride. Tom! Hey, Tom, over here! Hi. Some excitement, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I'm sweating like a schoolboy on his first date. Why, see, you got a present, too. Yeah, they were selling some of that cologne water. Hanley's number four. <laughs> well, I got the same thing. Boy, this, this whole planet is going to smell like Hanley's number four. <laughs> is my tie on straight? It's been eight years since I tied a tie. Yeah, it's pretty good. Boy, everybody is nervous as a cat. <laughs> you know, I took a look at myself in the mirror this morning. It was quite an experience. I just stood there looking. And then I said to myself, Bill, you're a slob. You couldn't get a girl on Earth. And if you're lucky, maybe the one who's coming today won't go back on the first ship. I was thinking the same thing. You suppose they'll be as glamorous as those two crooks told us? You know what? I hope not. I just wouldn't feel right bringing a real cultured, glamorous creature to that tar paper shack over near mine number six. I was thinking the same thing. Hey, uh, there's Mortensen. Boy, he looks like he's going to the radiation chamber. Good morning, gentlemen. Hi. Hi. Well, it uh, shouldn't be long now. <laughs> we ought to sight the first ship any minute. The fellow down at number three mine was trying to get out of it. He was so sure his girl would be disappointed. Well, maybe they won't expect so much. I... Oh, here it comes! Here it comes! Attention. Attention, all men waiting to receive wives. The Earth-Mars convoy, Operation Big Date, is approaching the landing area. Please stand behind the fire screen until the ships are all landed. And good luck! During all this, Charlie Beagle and I were more or less under guard back at our office. I say more or less because there were six miners with loaded guns sitting practically on top of us. In the distance, we could hear the rockets come blasting in for a landing. And then everything got very quiet. And we knew the girls were coming off the ships. What do you suppose is happening? Well, it's pretty quiet, Charlie. I guess the girls are coming off. Yeah, I don't hear no sounds of rejoicing. I'll just take it easy. You suppose they'll hang us or shoot now us? Now relax. Relax, he says, but... Oh, oh, here comes a jeep with Uncle Henry and... Is he alone? Uh-huh. Well, so long, Charlie. Mm. Gentlemen? Now, look, Mr. Mortensen, this can all be explained. There was an error and the wrong girls got shipped, Don't but... try to explain it, McDonald. But you can't just kill us without even a trial. I mean, it isn't just you... Ha... Who said anything about killing you? We're throwing a banquet tonight, and we want you and Mr. Beagle as guests of honor. As what? Guests of honor. You... You mean the girls were, were okay? Okay. They're lovely. The nicest thing about them, of course, is that they don't expect much. 
They seem to accept us with all our faults and all the shabbiness and ugliness of the life on Mars. There isn't a one of them who turned up her nose at the place. They seem thankful just to be here. And the guys, they all feel okay about it? Okay, they're like a bunch of kids. <laughs> there isn't a one of them who wasn't scared breathless that he'd have some sophisticated glamour girl on his hands. No, sir. These are down-to-earth women who had it tough on Earth, and they figure to find some happiness here if it's humanly possible. Yeah, but how did the boys like the way they shape up? Charlie. Oh, I, I mean, uh, there might be some that seemed a little older than the applications. You, you know how clerical errors can be made. Well, <laughs> gentlemen, when you've been living on Mars for 15 years without having seen even a single Earth woman, you kind of lose the standards that Hollywood sets for us. As far as I and the other men are concerned, they're gorgeous. <laughs> Well, that's the story, which proves you can sell a guy a gold brick that's made out of lead, and sometimes you find out the poor sucker likes lead even better than gold. Charlie Beagle and myself made a small fortune on the deal, like I said before. I made a trip back to Mars last month just to satisfy my curiosity, and you know what? I never saw a happier bunch of people in all my life. Hey, by the way, Henry Mortensen and the lady wrestler are having a kid. They're going to call it Mike if it's a boy, <laughs> and Michelle if it's a girl. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features The Ignoble Savages by Evelyn E. Smith, the story of the Snadra, which had but one choice in its fight to afford to live below ground, to pretend that theirs was an above-board society. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you The Girls from Earth, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Frank M. Robinson and adapted for radio by George Lefferts. Featured in the cast were Mandel Kramer as Mike, Bob Hastings as Charlie, John Gibson as Henry, Jim Stevens as Tom... Dick Hamilton as Bill, and Phil Sterling as the waiter. This is Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come transcribed tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X, 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 X minus, 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 minus one. one, one. Tonight, the time is 1965, the place, a golf course, the story, open warfare. You wouldn't believe it, but there are some people that think that caddy is a pet name for a big car. No, I mean it. Over those little wagons you pull around the course or carrying their own clubs, there are people actually playing golf for years, never seen a caddy. As far as I'm concerned, you take the human element out of golf or any sport, and what do you got left? Nothing. I mean, you could say I'm prejudiced on account of my being a caddy, but that's the way I feel about it. 
Besides which, a caddy is a perfect observer of the passing parade of human experience. I'll give you a for instance. Now, you take Jim Pearson. He won the U.S. Open in 1960, 61, and 64. Well, let me tell you about Jim Pearson. He was the pro at the club here, and I remember when it all started. He was out playing with Mr. Hatcher. That Sam Hatcher. He couldn't break 90 if the ball had wings. And in the locker room, he looked like a sack of flour that had been set down hard. But he was loaded with money. Anyway, they were waiting for a foursome of dames who uh, hey, shouldn't have been wearing slacks. When Hatcher turned to Jim, and with a real sweet smile, he lowered the boom. Jim, you're a good golfer. Thank you, Mr. Hatcher. You're a good golfer, even if you can't teach me anything. Oh, you're coming along fine, Mr. Hatcher. We've been good to you at the country club, haven't we? Oh, yes. I want you to do something for me. Yes, sir. Stay away from my daughter. Oh, but Mr. Hatcher... I won't have Alice marrying a man who has nothing but coordination and muscles. What? When I was only your age, I was making $50,000 a year. It takes brains to do that. Brains get more valuable. Muscles deteriorate. There's nothing muscles can do that a machine can't do better. You don't think I could make $50,000? I know you can't. You haven't got the guts. Now, listen, Mr. Hatcher. I'm just quoting history, Jim. Take the tournament in St. Louis. You blew up. And the good old in the Palm Beach. You could have won all those. But you blew. You chickened out. That's not exactly fair, Mr. Hatcher. But it's true. I can make $50,000. Yes, in your whole life. Oh, no. No, in one year. Oh, you can? Yes, sir. All right, Jim. You're a sportsman. I'll tell you what I'll do. If you can make $50,000 in one year at this infantile pastime that you call golf, you can have Alice. Why, that's the most arrogant What's thing. the matter, Jim? Don't you think you can do it? I know I can do it. All right, then. Is it a bet? All right. All right, it's a bet. Very well, then. I believe the ladies are finished. Shall we drive? <laughs> Naturally, old man Hatcher set a trap for him. And I guess it worked pretty good, too. Jim knew I heard the whole thing, so he used to talk it over with me. Hey, you've been doing real good this season, Mr. Pearson. Sure. Been away on the whole circuit. I haven't seen Alice more than one day at a time in the last six months. You uh, hear from Miss Hatcher? Oh, yes. Yes, I got a telegram right after I won the first tournament. It said, and I quote, I won't be bought and sold, signed Alice. Uh, she found out about that bet, huh? Yeah, I'm sure her father made sure she did. Mm, wouldn't it frost you? It did, it did. It cost me $5,000 in tournament money, and then I just got mad. You know, the, uh, the cold mad, the kind of mad that puts 20 yards on your drive? Yeah, 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 I know what you mean. Yeah. Sometimes when I get sore at the caddy master, I go out to the driving range. bang Every time you hit it, you get it right between his eyes. Yeah, yeah, that's the idea. Every yeah. time I slam a ball down the fairway, I feel as if I've just belted Hatcher right behind the ear. You, uh, still figure you got a chance? Oh, I'm going to get that 50000 this year, all right. I'm going to win the U.S. Open, and that's worth $25,000 in cash plus vaudeville appearances or Ed Sullivan's television show or something. And I'm going to take the money, and I'm going to lay it in front of Alice, and I'm going to say, I wasn't buying you. I was buying the right to tell you I love you. Ah, oh, gee, that's pretty. All right, never mind. Give me a number seven iron. <laughs> Jim Pearson sure was burning up the circuit. He came into the U.S. Open, the man to watch. The day the tournament had opened, Jimmy Cannon had in his column, You are Jim Pearson, the hard luck boy with the velvet swing. It was real philosophical. All the sports writers picked him to win. And then Saul showed up. We was on a practice tee. Jim had been sharpening up his number one wood when all of a sudden the gallery took off like a batch of big birds. They were around another tee about 100 feet away. Jim knocked off, and the two of us strolled over. Hey, that's some swing. Mm. Who is that, Pete? Well, i never seen him before. His name's Saul. That's some swing. Yeah, he's no amateur. I've never seen him on the pro circuit. Hey, Mr. Pearson, look at the caddy. 280 yards down there. That ain't what I mean. Look, he's got a ball bag in his hands. Now watch. Oh, that's a good catch. He caught that ball right in the bag. Mr. Pearson, that caddy didn't move that sack. That ball dropped right in 280 yards away. Oh, it's an accident. Yeah, look, it happened again. He's a trick shot artist. Wait, wait, wait till he gets into competition. I don't know. He just hit another one dead center. Oh, there isn't anybody that good. Not even old Joe Kirkwood. Quite a spectacle, eh, Jim? Oh, hello, Hatcher. Must be unnerving to watch something like that. I can stand it. But will you be able to stand it when the going gets rough? Will you blow up like you always do? It'll be too bad just when you're so close. Don't worry about me. 
I'm not. I imagine Saul will take care of that. Oh, you know him? I brought him here. My own personal entry. He's going to beat you out of the open. But he's got something to learn. Look at him. Just a dumb country boy who never saw a golf club to a few months ago. I think he might teach you something, Jim. I could tell Jim was going to have a good day the minute he took his driver out of the bag. He took his practice swings and they went around clean, grooved, and loose. I would have bet my shirt on him. As a matter of fact, I did. The crowd was sympathetic. They wanted to see him burn up the course. Well, Pete, we all ready? Yeah. Uh, what's this? New kind of golf ball? Oh, yeah. A young fellow from the A.B. Wells Sporting Goods Company. He slipped me a fin to talk you into using these balls. Well, I don't know. They any good? Yeah, I figured. They guaranteed they had 20 yards to every drive. Well, I sure could use 20 yards. Well, he's going to come around to see you later. He wanted to sign you for testimonials and advertising and things. You know, uh, the golf ball used by Jim Pearson when he won the U.S. Open. That uh, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. A lot of dough in it. Well, we'll give it a try. Let's tee up. Oh, he started off real good. A long, straight drive right down the fairway. It was a birdie four. Jim was clicking them off that day. There you are, Pete. 34 and a 32 for 66 on the 18. Six birdies, 12 parts. Yeah, three more rounds like that should win easy. Hey, how are the new golf balls? Huh? Oh, fine, fine. You know, uh, they aren't kidding. It does average out about 20 yards longer on the drive. I'll have to get a couple more dozen. We went around and watched Jim's score being posted on the big board. Most of the field was still out, but he was ahead of the closest competitor by three strokes. Who's that? Oh, somebody coming down the 18th. It must be a hot round. I'll be posting it in a minute. Ah, uh, saw. Hmm? Yeah, you see, there he is, walking through the crowd. Oh, yeah. Well, here comes the secretary with a score. Hey, Mr. Pearson, look at it. 32 and 32, 64. 64, that's a new course record. Yeah, well, it's only the first round. New course record. Look at that, threes and fours, threes and fours. He ain't over four for the whole day. What's the matter, Jim? You don't look well. One round is not a tournament. Well, comfort yourself while you can. Saul's just getting warmed up. He's that mythical thing, the perfect golfer. But he's dumb. No brains, Jim. No brains at all. Naturally, in the sports broadcasts and the newspapers, Jim could have been playing on a miniature golf course at Asbury Park, New Jersey. The big news was Saul. They all called him Silent Saul. The odds the boys in the shower room played around with on Pearson took a dive, and you couldn't get even money for Saul. The next morning, Jim's gallery was pretty small. When he stepped up to the ball, there was a smattering of applause like a matinee just before they closed the show. But his drive was as straight as the day before and longer by about 20 yards on the average. That's a nice putt, Mr. Pearson. Yeah. Who's that? That's Saul, I'm afraid. He's coming around behind you. Well, he's going to have a big fight. Jim's second nine was a duplicate of the day before. Another 32. He equaled Saul's record-tying score of yesterday. Then when we came in to read it on the big board, he looked like somebody hit him on the head with a driver. Look at that, Pete. 31 out, 31 back for a 62. He's got me by two strokes today. And four strokes in all. What do you got to say, Jim? Well, (laughs) nothing, Mr. Hatcher. (laughs) Throw me the soap, will you, Pete? Yeah, sure, Mr. Pearson. Yeah. Thanks, you know, there's something wrong, Pete. Hmm? Just doesn't happen this way. That's tough luck, Mr. Pearson. Oh, no, no, it's not that. People don't just pop out of nowhere and break all records at the open. Men don't take up golf and become perfect golfers in a month. He's got to have some weakness. Well, if he has, he ain't shown it yet. Well, I've got to find it. Jim was out the next morning, and he came in with a classy 32. On the back nine, he slipped a stroke to 33. He was still four down. He shook off a couple of reporters who were trying to egg him into a feud with this Saul, and the two of us just hung around in the crowd watching Silent Saul. 
His first drive went a clean 300 yards down the fairway, straight as a rule. Pete, there's something about his swing. There's something about it. I've seen it before. Oh, you never saw that silent saw before, Mr. Pearson. Still, there's something about his swing. On a follow-up shot, Saul had about 240 to go. He took a club from his bag and took a few wiggling gestures, set his driver behind the ball, and swung. Pete? Hmm? Did you see that swing? Those wiggles? Yeah. Yeah, well, a lot of guys do that. Yeah, but it's unnecessary. I mean, you don't have to make those wiggles before you address the ball. Yeah, sure. And you don't have to spit three times every time you've got a tough putt, but you do. But there's still something strange about him. Everything about him is perfection except those wiggles. And he doesn't talk. Look at him putting. Hmm? I mean, just look at him. Hmm. That could be Todd Winters, couldn't it? Yeah, he does look something like Winters. Yeah, yeah, when he putts. But that iron shot, who wiggles like that? Who does those wiggles? George Potter. Yeah, yeah, yeah I guess he does. Yeah, and, and, and the approach shot, Pete. That's Gordon Brown. Nobody else bends the knee that way. He really gave it a lot of study, huh? And the drive. That grooved swing on the drive. Pete, come on. I've watched enough. Ah, Pearson, a 63, I see. You're six strokes behind with one round to go. You want to give up now? I don't think I will. I think we'd better talk about it privately. Well, that won't be necessary. Well, it doesn't matter to me, but uh, I know that Saul is a robot. So you think he's a robot? Isn't he? Of course he is. How does it feel to be beaten at your own game by a mindless machine? Oh, you haven't won yet. The golf ball takes some funny bounces. How did you find out about Saul? Oh, Saul is a lot of things, but none of them is Saul. He's Todd Winters, George Potter, Gordon Brown, and uh, his drive, that's me. You copied it after me. Take us away and there's nothing left. Tell me, how'd you do it? Money can do anything. All it needs is a purpose. We've been working on colloidal brains up at our place. Our new miniature atomic power plant is ideal. You throw in some sensory mechanisms, some relays, feed in analysis of a slow-motion pictorial study... And you have a golf machine. <laughs> Must have cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. Closer to a million. A million? A million dollars to keep me from winning 25000 Don't you think that's unfair? Unfair? You listen to me. Nothing is unfair that doesn't break the rules... And the only rule worth remembering is this, that the best man always wins. You mean the best machine? A machine is only an extension of a man, like your golf club. I don't happen to be endowed with golfing muscles and uh, responses. You do. Those in your golf clubs let you hit a ball farther and straighter than anybody else. Saul lets me hit a ball farther and straighter than you do. It's as simple as that. No, no, wait a minute. That wasn't the bet. The bet was that I couldn't make $50,000 in a year. Maybe it was your bet. It wasn't mine. I bet that I could beat you at your own game. I don't think that you're good enough for Alice. You're not smart enough, not man enough. Should I let a few well-distributed, well-trained muscles blind her to what you really are? And what's that? You're a quitter. You can't stand pressure. You're no competitor. If you can't win at your own game, you can't win at anything else. Suppose I win tomorrow. <laughs> Six strokes back? Playing against the perfect golfer? Suppose. Then I'd have to admit I was wrong. You have my word on that. And you could also have Alice, if she wants you. Somewhere, Saul must have an Achilles heel. Pete, the prime fact about man is his adaptability. Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, yeah. They've got to build in at least one constant, if not more. How about judgment? No, I don't think so. I mean, they could tell whether he'd have wind or rain or the sun or slow greens or something. Huh? they, they got to take care of that. Yeah, I suppose so. Hey, uh, maybe you could jimmy him. Hmm? You know, uh, drop sugar in his gas tank or something, smash him up. Oh, no, 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 that isn't fair. It's all is fair. Well, I mean, Mr. Hatcher, he's playing fair according to his lights. He could have had me crippled or poisoned or something, but he didn't. Well, I'll just have to beat him on our own ground on the golf course. Oh, I don't know, Mr. Pearson. You'll have to shoot in the 50s. Well, a golf ball takes some funny bounces. Yeah, it sure does. Wait a minute. There is a constant. Hmm? Listen, Pete. You know Saul's caddy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know him. An illiterate type of guy, yeah. Uh, could he use $10 or uh, maybe 20 or 50 He's a caddy, isn't he? All right. Pete, I want you to talk to him. Uh, you'll do better than I can. <laughs> The 
The management of the tournament is no fool. They know which side their television rights are butted on, and they had Saul and Jim paired for the final round. Jim's drive took a tail-end hook. It dived into the rough behind a clump of trees. It wasn't a very happy start. Saul took a ball from his caddy, teed it up, and settled himself. Hey, that's some drive, Mr. Pearson. Yeah, yeah, that was some drive. It's about 340 yards, isn't it? Some drive. You got a tough lie there on your ball, Mr. Pearson. You gonna play it safe out on the fairway? Uh, no. You see that hole between those two trees? Mr. Pearson, that ain't sensible golf. Pete, sensible golf won't win. Well, he made it. The ball went through the opening and rolled to a stop just in front of the green. Saul's easy four-iron shot was dead on the pin all the way. What? It hit the back edge of the green and hopped into the rough. Jim took an easy putt for a birdie, and Saul's recovery was long, and two putts gave him a par. Well, that's one of the strokes I need. And that's the way it went. Jim's game sparkled, and Saul's game kept finding trouble. For the first nine, Jim came in with a scorching 30, while Saul came in with a 33. Kept on like that. Saul kept overshooting the green. They came into the 18th hole with Saul still two strokes up. Now, look, don't you worry, Mr. Pearson. You're going to tie him for sure. Oh, that's no good, Pete. By tomorrow, his game will be on again perfectly. Jim's drive sliced behind a fringe of trees. He had to shoot blind. He made it on the green, about 25 feet from the cup. Okay, Pete. This is it. Saul's in for a five. Don't you worry, Mr. Pearson. Don't you worry. Okay, okay, I won't. He lined it up. He studied the green. He noted the slope and the lay of the grass. And then he stroked the ball. We did it, Mr. Pearson, we did it. You're the new U.S. Open champion. Now, we finally busted loose from the television and the movies and all those hangers on, and we ducked around the back to the pro shop, where we run into Mr. Hatcher. How did you do it? How did you do it? Well, Mr. Hatcher, under extremely restricted sets of circumstances, a machine is better than a man, but... Over the long run, over the gamut of situations, the machine doesn't have a chance. It just can't compete. I still don't understand. It cost a million dollars, a million dollars. Here, have a souvenir. You can take this golf uh, ball. No, 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 no. Look at it. That's the ball Saul was using. What? Mm-hmm. Well, that's, that's another brand. Mm. That isn't Saul's regular ball. That's right. It's a new one. Guaranteed to add 20 yards to the average drive. But that's unfair. Well, your robot was built in with one constant. It had to be a golf ball. Well... It just couldn't adapt to a better ball. But that's not fair. Why, that's... (laughs) (laughs) Well, well. Uh How about... There are no perfect golfers, Mr. Hatcher. There are only good ones and better ones. But, uh... Well, I've been thinking about this robot of yours, and uh, I'll be around in a few days to talk to you at your office. Huh? About what? Well, I'm sure you don't want to support your son-in-law for the rest of his life. And I have $50,000 to invest in business making robots. Useful robots. And uh, leave golf to the men. They're better competitors. Now, if you'll excuse me, Mr. Hatcher, I've got a telephone call to make to your daughter. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features The Other Celia, A story which proves that something drastic should happen to all snoopers, but nothing as shocking and frightful as this. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you Open Warfare, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by James E. Gunn and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in our cast were Jack Grimes as Pete, Larry Haynes as Jim, and Wendell Holmes as Mr. Hatcher. This is Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Countdown for blast-off. X-5, 4, 3... Two, X minus one, fire.
From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight, Caretaker by James A. Schmitz. Commander Lowndes? Yes, Mr. Harris. Astrogation reports, planetary orbit secure. What vector, Mr. Harris? Approximately 1,000 miles above subject planet 3785. Well, we'll have to give it a name soon, Harris. Yes, sir. Engineering secured, damage control parties working on the hull. Very well. Has Martyr touched down in the scout ship? Yes, sir, we have him on the tight beam. Give him to me on my screen. Yes, sir. Clarkman, put Martyr on the command screen. Exploration ship Titan calling ship 375. Come in. Scout 375 reporting. What's it like down there, Martyr? It's not much different from the scan report, sir. I'm at the head of a valley. It's green and it's scarlet. It's all swampy. And there's a big river threading through it. Harris, get me a pinpoint on Martyr's location. Aye, aye, sir. Uh, there are mountains beyond. I can see Holman's house from here. Looks like a Swiss chalet standing over the lake. Have you made contact? Yes, sir. Boyce is over there now. How is he? Well, it's hard to say. Tell him we're recording the planet officially as Holman's planet. That might please him. No, I don't think so, sir. What? A boy suggested that during our first visit with Holman today, he wants us to record it instead as, um, well, I'll, I'll spell it, C-R-E-S-G-Y-T-H, Kreskith. What's that, local? Well, that's his phonetic interpretation of the name the people here use. Fair enough, if that's how he wants it. Anything to add on your present report? No, 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 sir. I'll call you back after we've met his woman. His wife? Yes. I'm glad it was you and Boyce who found Holman. You're reliable men, you in particular. Martyr, I don't need to emphasize that Holman's discovery of what appears to be the first genuine human race ever encountered outside of Earth is of primary importance. Yes, sir. Boys might be inclined to hurry through the uh, diplomatic overtures. You'll be careful about that part of it, Martha. Yes, very careful, sir. On the two continents we've scanned before, we've found no traces of human inhabitants, present or past. Yes, I know, sir, but Holman's... It's possible Holman's acquaintances are the sole survivors of humanity here. If we frighten the tribe into hiding... There may never be another contact. Yes, I understand, sir. Fine. Now then, what about these other creatures? What did Holman have to say about them? Well, in the 20 years he's been marooned in this valley, he's had only three or four actual encounters with him, sir. Rather violent encounters on his side. Apparently they learned to avoid him after that. They're called Zares. Uh, he seems to have an almost psychopathic hatred for them. That's not very surprising. We pulled up a scout drag a little while ago, bagged a couple of specimens. The description checks with Holman's description of the Zares, the worm-like, slimy, blue body with a set of arms, legs, and head. Out of the water, they seem to wear some kind of clothes, presumably to conserve body moisture. Yes, that's what he said. All right now, Martyr. I want you to continue according to the plan. And remember, be careful of Holman. He's been alone on this planet for 22 years. He deserves a lot from us. Yes, sir. But he hasn't been alone. He has his wife. Boyce? Boyce, where are you? Down here. I'm with Holman. Check in with the exploration ship? Yes, it's all right. Holman, they say they'll name the planet the way you want it. That's good. Celia will like that. Celia? My wife. I called her Celia from the start. She likes the name. I see. Where's she now? Oh, she's out somewhere. She's very timid. She'll show up sometime in the night, and I'm leaving the doors open for her. I'll talk to her a little first to reassure her, and you can meet her then. Meanwhile, would you like to see her picture? Why, have you got photographs? No, no, I painted it. I used to do a little bit before I went into the service. It's over here. I've done about 50 or so paintings over the years. I paint a lot of them over, you know. Uh, here, in here. Grind my own pigments and cut brushes from the swamp grass. 
I'd give my arm for a good camel's hair brush. Here. Here she is. Beautiful. Real good looking. Of course, it isn't an exact likeness. I tried to capture the spirit. I think I've got it pretty good. Well, there's something about that picture sort well, of... Never mind, boys. Boys doesn't know much about art. Yeah, but I know what I like. I like a good-looking woman. You're a lucky man, Holman. You wanted to see the deep water well. It's right through here. Actually, it's just an opening through the concrete to the river that runs below. It's as pure as anything you could wish. If they want to refresh the water tanks of the ship... Yes, all... I'll take it up with the captain. We'll be staying a week or more... We're to follow your judgment in every way in establishing contact with the Kreskidians. Good. We can't do anything till Celia comes in, and we'll have to be very tactful then. But I'm sure it won't take a week. What makes him so shy of us? Oh, it's not you, it's me. Or it's an impression I gave him of the Earth kind of human beings. Come on upstairs, and I'll tell you. Cigar? It's a local swamp grass. Is it safe? Well, I've been smoking them for years. Uh, you were telling us about the native humans. Well, I've never asked Celia much about her people. There's some kind of very strong taboo that keeps her from talking about them. How'd you meet her? Well, our ship crashed into the valley originally. I was the only man left and the original crew of four. Manning went insane two days before we made a planet fall and killed Nichols and Dawson. And so I killed Manning before he could wreck the ship completely. Have you got a light, Marta? Thanks, I'm all right. You see, it was unavoidable, but they never understood it, those people of Celia's. Well, how did they find out? I was unconscious for about a month and completely blind for six months afterwards. Blind? Well, they got me out of the wreck and nursed me back to life. But as soon as I was out of danger, only Celia would stay with me. She and I were alone for weeks before I regained my sight. Uh, how did they know I killed the others? Well, they're sensitive in a number of ways, and there were those bodies in the ship. They, well, they withdrew from me as soon as I no longer needed their help. Then in all this time, you were never able to gain their confidence? It's not a question of confidence. It's a question of, well, I'm trying to tell you. I didn't mind being alone with Celia. You'll understand that when you see her. The others stayed in a small lake village they had a couple of miles up the valley across the swamps. Celia went up there every few days, but she never brought anyone back with her. I suspected it was simply because I was an alien. I thought they'd get over that in time. Celia seemed happy enough, so it wasn't a very acute problem. Well, could you observe them? Well, one day when she'd slipped away again, I remembered a pair of field glasses I'd taken off the ship and I got them and trained them on the village. That was a very curious experience. I never found a complete explanation for it. Well, what happened? Well, just for one instant, I had everything in the clearest possible focus. There were children playing on the platforms above the water, a few adults standing in the doorways of a house, and suddenly everything went blurred. Well, something go wrong with the glasses? No, no. They didn't want me to look at them. They just blurred my vision. What do you mean? What, you mean... You mean telepathically? Well, I don't know. The glasses had a four-mile range, and they were functioning perfectly. But the instant I turned them on the village, the field blurred. Well, I never felt so snubbed before. Yeah, I guess that's quite a hint. Well, I admit it annoyed me. The next day, I announced to Celia that I was going over to the village. Well, she made no objection... But she followed me in the distance, probably to make sure I didn't drown on the way. It's wet going around here. At last, I came over a rise and found myself a hundred yards from the village on the land side. And then I realized they'd left it. I walked around it a while and found cooking fires still glowing. But nobody had waited to receive me. So I went home and sold it and very sulky. I wouldn't even talk to Celia until the next morning. Well, did you see anybody there? Nobody. Well, I settled down and built a house for the two of us, and that took up all my time for several months. I couldn't ignore them. There was something so curiously happy and peaceful about them, even though they gave me the cold shoulder. From the one look I had of them, it showed me that they were the most beautiful people I'd ever seen. 
Well, you've seen the picture. It doesn't do her justice. Boy, she must be something. One day, when Celia was gone, I made another trip to the village, and the same thing happened. Well, did you make any attempt to explore further? Oh, yes. I got the little lifeboat flyer repaired enough to get it off the ground and set it down again. I had enough fuel for one 24-hour trip. I flew down the valley for almost 50 miles before I came across the first colony of the other ones, the Zares. Is that what the people here call them? No, Zare, that's the word for snake. I named them that. Did they live in caves? No, that's what fooled me. It was a village of houses just like the one here. I sat down on the lake and I saw them. They just stood there, very quietly watching me through the doors and windows. What made it worse somehow was that they... They wore clothes, but the clothes didn't cover enough. Those weaving, soft, blue, slimy bodies and those staring eyes. I backed down the ladder with my gun ready in case they rushed me. But they never moved. Did, did you find any more of them? There were about eight more colonies of Zares further down the valley, but there was no trace of another tribe of humans. At the time, I didn't know just what to make of it there was a possibility that my village represented an advanced troop of human beings into the land of snakes. But it turned out to be the other way around. It seemed to be the snakes that were pushing out the humans. So I swore to myself that as long as I lived, at least, human beings were going to hold this section of the valley undisturbed in its safety. When I came back, I said to Celia, Celia, I must speak to your people. Go tell them I'll come again tomorrow, and they mustn't run away. Well, she looked at me, and then she went in the direction of the village. Did they wait for you? Well, she came back late at night, crept into my arms, and told me they promised to wait for me. Oh, I sat out the next morning full of great plans. After all, the Zare snakes lived in widely scattered settlements. The villagers and I could wipe out those settlements one by one until we'd cleared the land. But then I didn't realize how different Celia's people were from us. How? What happened? Well, I came over that rise, and there the village was. This time I knew they'd stayed home. And then, not 20 feet off my path, I saw two of the Zares standing in the bushes, one watching me and the other looking at the village. They were the first ones I'd seen that close, and they were horrible. They, they had a rapacious, greedy look. They seemed oily and unclean. Each had a kind of tricky crossbow over his shoulder, and they couldn't be seen from the village. Oh, oh uh, would you like something to drink? There were, uh, there's some kind of fermented homebrew I made. No, no. What, what happened? Well, I shot them both down before they got over the surprise was a natural thing to do, wasn't it? Sure, sure, I guess so. But apparently, from the point of view of the villagers, it wasn't. The village was empty again. When I got back home, I was actually sick with disappointment. And then I discovered Celia was gone. She stayed away three days. And when she came back, I never went back to the village. But I, I, I don't see why... Neither did I until it was too late. Uh, they won't kill their enemies. They're too polite for that. So their enemies are gradually squeezing them out of existence. Captain, what do you expect us to do in this situation? Kill the Zares, as many as we can find. If the human beings of this world won't defend themselves, we'll have to defend them. I can't be on guard here forever. It's up to you and the other men on the ship to do the job right. You will, won't you? You'll make a report to Commander Lowndes? Well, we'll make our report. Oh, that's fine. Well, uh, gentlemen, I suppose it's late now. I suppose you'll want to turn in. Uh, when will your uh, uh, wife get back? Well, she'll be back later. Don't worry about her. You awake? Why? What do you want? Listen. What? Somebody moving in the house. Listen. Holman? No, no, no. Listen to those steps. Now, hear, hear him? That's no man. Slow, dragon. Yeah, come on. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Side arms. All right, yeah, come on. All right, he's coming from downstairs. Stop. Listen. Wait till I get the safety catch on. Look. 
No firing unless I tell you. Look, Meyer, I'll take care of myself. Maybe it's one of those airs. I'd like to get a shot at them. Come on. Downstairs, all right. There's a light. What? What's that? A missile gun. Holman had a number of obsolete weapons down there. Hurry up. Look out. There goes the light. I've got my torch. It came from the well room. Oh, it's the door. Stand back. Turn your light in there. Uh, it, it's Holman. They've got Holman. There, there it goes. Stand clear. I'll blast wait, it. Wait, wait a minute. Get out of the way. It's one of those airs. Give me a clear shot. Hold it. You can't get out of here while we've got the well covered. Now keep your blaster ready while I look at Holman. I hear it moving back there in the shadows. He's dead. Come on, make a break for it, you rotten, slimy snake. Come on. Shot through the head with his own gun. Who's that, Sarah? That snake? You got a good look at it? No, no, it jumped for the shadows. There, there it is. Marta, swing your torch around. I'll roast it with one blast. Listen, what? listen. What? Who's that? You who are his friends, will you listen to me? Who are you? He called me his wife. What? How'd she get in here? If that Zare gets a hold of her... Why? Don't move. I won't. Why did you kill him? But I thought you understood. What do you mean she killed him? It was that Zare, the snake. Shh. There are medical men who'd say he'd been insane for 20 years as he counted time. They would have forced him back into sanity. I could not bear the thought he should suffer that. Suffer what? Are you all fools? He was a fool, though I loved him. He could not see beyond the shape of things. So here among us, he saw shapes he could bear to see. And those moments when sanity came to him and he saw what was really there, then he killed. Are you all like that? What are you talking about? Is the snake there with her? Go upstairs, boys. Wait for me outside. You're going to kill that snake? Yes, I'll kill the snake. All right, take my blast. Now, be careful. Get between the eyes, Marta. Roast that zare to a crisp. Go on outside. Are you still there? Yes. Is there any way you can get out? I can leave by the river that flows under the well if you do not shoot at me. I won't shoot at you. May I take his body? Yes. And you will all leave with your ship? I loved him. Although my people thought it strange, almost beyond their tolerance, they are foolish too, yet not as foolish as you are. They saw what was in his mind, and not beyond that, and so they were afraid of him. But he is dead now, and there is nothing that your people and mine could share. We are too different. Will you leave? We'll leave. What did you see that was beyond his mind? A brave spirit, though very frightened. He ventured far, far, far into the dark of which he was afraid. I loved him for that. I am coming now. I think you had better look away. Marta. Yes, sir. I've just been down to sick bay. Boyce is all right. He's in shock. Well, I gave him a shot of sedative on my way up here. Oh, the medics say he'll be all right. They're giving him a reconstructive psychotherapy fix. He won't remember much of it. If you had looked squarely at that thing, we might have had to give you the same treatment. Our pickled specimens of the Zare are pretty hideous. I suppose it's all the way you look at it. Yes, I suppose so. Holman had his own way of looking at it. Selective hysterical blindness maintained for 22 years with his own type of artistic hallucinations thrown in. I can't help wishing it hadn't happened to Holman. He didn't maintain it throughout. When he was hallucinating, he saw them as beautiful. He saw her as beautiful. But when he saw them clearly, the way they really were, he killed them. Who wouldn't? I almost feel like getting out of space and staying out for good. Well, it's time to file a report and wrap up. What are you reporting? That Holman died here quite peacefully about a year before we found him, leaving a diary of inspiring courage and devotion to space exploration behind him. We'll have time enough to work up the diary. That should keep everybody happy. All secure, sir. Shall I close down the ports? Uh, just a minute. Marta, look down there. The whole galaxy. Do you think there actually are people out there somewhere? I hope so. Do you think we'll ever find them? I don't know. They've never found us.
You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Survival Type by J.F. Bone. Score one or one million was not enough for the human race. It had to be all or nothing, with one man doing all the scoring. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you Caretaker, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by James A. Schmitz, and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were Ted Osborne, Bill Lipton, Mason Adams, Raymond Edward Johnson, and Betty Kane. This is Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Polio is not over yet. A total of $46,900,000 is needed to continue the fight against this crippling disease. Thousands of polio victims are depending on you. Help finish the polio fight. Join the 1957 March of Dimes. The World on a New Hotline. Listen for news on the hour and the exciting hotline service all day, every day on most of these stations. down for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X X X X minus 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 one 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 one. Tonight, the time, 150 years from now. The place, a luxury spaceship en route to Venus. The story, Venus is a Man's World, by William Tenn. Some fellows are lucky. They have brothers, but not me. I have nothing but sisters. Two of them, Carrie and Evelyn. Sometimes Carrie isn't too bad, for a girl, I mean. But Evelyn, boy, she's hopeless. It was Evelyn's idea to put me on that spaceship, jam-packed with 300 females, and all of them aching to get themselves husbands. In the one place that's still to be had, the planet Venus. Well, anyway, 20 minutes after we took off from the spaceport, I was bored stiff. Ferdinand, do stop fidgeting and sit down. I don't have anything to do. Well, I'll read to you and Carrie. Would you like that? No. I want to do something. What's the name of the book, sis? Well, it's titled Family Problems of the Frontier Woman. Doesn't it sound intriguing? Peachy keen. That's enough out of you, young man. Why don't you take a walk around the ship? Can I go with Ferdinand, sis? Well, wouldn't you rather we start the book? You should, Carrie. Every girl should read about the family problems of the frontier woman. Keep quiet, you boy. Oh, oh children, let's have enough of that. Now, go ahead, run along, you two, and and Carrie, look after Ferdinand. See that he keeps out of mischief. Gee, this is one big ship, isn't it? Uh Uh-huh. I sort of wish we were on a cargo ship instead of this liner. Why? This is super. On a cargo ship. We could go climbing from deck to deck on a ladder. We could even go to the bridge or the forecastle and talk with the crew. That's silly. Why would anyone want to do that? Because ships' crews are men. Only because we women are too busy with important things like government to run ships. Says you. Hey, what are you looking at? This sign. 
In the event of disaster affecting the oxygen content of the companionway, break glass with hammer upon wall, remove spacesuit, and proceed to don it. Boy, I hope we have that kind of a disaster. I sure would like to get into one of those. Oh, you're silly. Hey, let's go exploring down this way. I see some portholes. And I see a sign that says, Notice, passengers are not permitted past this point. Come on, there's no one around. And besides, I'm not really a passenger. <gasps> Ferdinand, you say you're not really a passenger. Well, what do you mean? You have to be a citizen of a planet in order to get a passport, right? I'm not sure. Well, I'm telling you, ever since they passed that male suffrage act, only women can be Earth citizens. You and Evelyn are passengers, all right. But me, I'm just a male dependent. So when a sign says, off limits for passengers, doesn't mean me. I'm not a passenger, see? Keep away from that door, Ferdinand. Can't you see the sign? You and your old signs. Ferdinand, let's go back to the cabin. I want to see what's behind this door. If you don't come back with me this very minute, I'll tell Evelyn. So what? Hey, this looks like a sign o'clock. I wonder if it works by knock or voice. Ferdinand, I'm going. Say, I remember one voice key. I wonder if it'll work. 2023, open sesame. Ferdinand! Out of all the million possible combinations, I hit it just right. The door clicked open into a, a dimly lit hole. As the door closed, my hand closed around my throat. The lights came on, and I found myself staring up the muzzle of a highly polished blaster, held by the biggest man I'd ever seen. We just stood there looking at each other for a while, till finally he said... Why, well, you're only a tadpole. Sir? A little tadpole. I must be getting jumpy enough to splash. My name is Ferdinand Sparling. I'm very pleased to meet you, Mr. I uh... hope for your sake you aren't a tadpole brother to one of them husbandless Anura. Husbandless what? Anura. Herd of females looking a nest. I come from Flatway, folks. You're a Venusian? Yep. What part of Earth are you from? And what are you doing on a spaceship to Venus? You know, the three out of four. Uh, how's that? The three out of four. No more than three women out of every four on Earth can expect to find husbands. Not enough men to go around, you know, with the third atomic war and all. Why, back in the 20th century, some of our best men went to the planets. My sister Evelyn says that by now, most of the men on Earth aren't even worth marrying. <laughs> That's for sure. Those busybody on Europe took care of that. Earth, what a place. I had a belly full. Why did you come in the first place? I came looking for a wife. Women are pretty scarce on Venus. I heard that there was a surplus of them on Earth. I can't understand why any man would, would even want to marry a woman. How old are you, Tadpole? Thirteen, almost fourteen. Well, that explains a lot of things, Tadpole. It doesn't explain why you're heading back to Venus. Because I was in trouble the minute I landed on that woman's world. I didn't know I had to register at a government-operated hotel for transient males. Imagine, they told me a man couldn't say anything in court. All talking was done by female attorneys to a female judge. But I told them off. I told him where I come from. A man spoke his piece when he had a mind to, and his woman walked by his side. Well, what happened? Oh, I was found guilty of this and contempt of that. But I wasn't going to serve all those fancy little prison sentences, so I broke out and stowed away. Y you mean that you're breaking the law right now? Sure, aren't you? Uh, I guess so. I'm also a man outside the law. We're in this together. Shake, Ferdinand. Ferdinand? That's not a right label for a sprouting tadpole. I'll call you Ford. My name's Butt. Butt Lee Brown. Is Butt a nickname like Ford? Yeah, short for Alberta. But I haven't found a man who can draw a blaster fast enough to call me that. You see, Pop came over in the 80s with the first wave of immigrants from Ontario. Named all of us boys after Canadian provinces. I was the youngest, so I got the name they were saving for a girl. Golly, Mr. Butt. You must have had a lot of brothers. Yeah, full nest. They're sass. His real name is Saskatchewan. Manny, after Manitoba. And Yuke, he was named for Yukon. I got one for every province and territory in Canada. Golly, all I have is two sisters. Oh, tell me about them. Well, there's Carrie. She's almost 16. Yeah, well, how about your other sister? Is she a little older? She's old, all right. Evelyn's almost 21. She pretty? Who? Your sister, Evelyn. Oh, I don't know. She's healthy. She's got very good teeth. If I know her breed, she's bossy and opinionated. Well, aren't all women? Oh, there goes the dinner gong for it. You better scat. Growing tadpoles need their vitamins. Could I bring you some chow? I could stuff it in my pocket and sneak it back here. No, thanks. I've stashed away enough provisions. I got plenty of kelp and Venusian mud grapes to last the trip. 
Oh, you better shove off, Ford. They'll start looking for you. Guess I had better. Well, I'll see you right after dinner, Mr. Butt. Just plain butt to you, Ford. Oh, okay. I'll be seeing you. 2023. Open sesame. <laughs> Ferdinand, please be seated. I want to talk with you. Now? They just rang the dinner gong. I am aware of that. Now, where have you been? Around. I demand a straight answer. Where have you been, Ferdinand? I told you, sis, around. And don't call me Ferdinand. Call me Ford. That's what Bud calls me. Bud! Who is Bud? Oh, nobody. I just made it up. Ferdinand! I can't tell you. I can't. You must. Well, you promise you won't turn him in. Well, Bud's my friend. He's a Venusian. He's going home. Aboard our ship, the Eleanor Roosevelt? Ferdinand, don't you realize you've been consorting with a stowaway, a criminal? What sort of antisocial ideas has this warmongering masculinist been putting into your head? Bud's a nice guy. He asked about you. Oh, indeed. I told him you had very good teeth. Really? Well, take me to this, this man. I will if you promise not to turn him in. No, I promise. <laughs> in there. The door has a sonic lock. I know the combination. Watch. 2023. Open sesame. Oh, it's so dark in there. But, hey, but, I brought along my sister Evelyn. She'd like to meet you. It's all right. Put on the lights. Oh. An honor, Miss Sparling. Please come right in. First, Mr. Bot, it's I want... It's brown. Butley Brown. First, Mr. Brown, you realize that you are committing two crimes. One, the political crime of traveling without a visa, and two, the criminal act of stowing away without paying your fare. Golly, Sitch, that's, that's no way to talk to Bud. I take it you either have no defense or care to make none. I wonder if all the Anura talk like that, and you want to foul up Venus. We haven't done so badly on Earth after the mess you men made of politics. Hear, hear. Yeah, hear, hear. Oh, you keep quiet, Ferdinand. And another point, Mr. Butley Brown. I don't suppose you know that under space regulations, you've made this poor child an accessory. But didn't make me anything. Let's not talk law, female. Let's talk sense. I'm in trouble because I went to Earth to look for a wife. You're standing right here now because you're on your way to Venus for a husband. So, let's. Let's? Let's what? <gasps> Are you daring to suggest now, that... Miss Sparling, no hoopla. I'm saying let's get married and you know it. Gee, sis, say yes. And what makes you think that I consider you a desirable husband? Figure it this way. If you wanted a poodle, you're pretty enough to pick one up on Earth. When you go charging off to Venus, you don't want a poodle, you want a man, and I'm one. I own three islands in the Galerton Archipelago. Good farmland when they're cleared. I got no bad habits. Outside of having my own way... I'm passable good-looking. Uh, my teeth are good, too. Besides, if you marry me, you'll be the first mated on this ship. And that's a splash most nesting females like to make. You know, there's more to marriage than just doing... So what... there is. Well, we can try each other for taste. <sighs> now, me, I'd vote yes. Me, too. I'd vote yes. Now I'll cast my vote. <laughs> Well, you guessed it. She broke her promise. I suppose the kiss did it. She put it a stowaway to the captain, and he sent a detail from the ship's crew to halt Butt off to the brig. Well, later that afternoon, all the passengers, 300 females and me, gathered in the lounge for the hearing. It's all on account of you. Shush! Don't shush me. You promised your word wouldn't get Butt into trouble. Oh, you savage. Shush! The captain is rapping for quiet. By authority vested in me under the Pomona College Treaty, the stowaway Evanusian, Butt Lee Brown, will be tried for violation of Article 16 to 21, inclusive of the Space Transport Code. Purser, bring in the prisoner. Oh, my boy! 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 Ladies, ladies! Oh, cheap extroverts, and they call themselves responsible. Ladies! Dear ladies! Thank you, ladies. 
But, Lee Brown, I order your person and belongings impounded for the duration of this voyage as set forth in sections 41 and 45. Captain, the sections are 43 and 45. Uh, you're, you're quite right, Miss Farling. Sections 43 and 45 of the Mother Anita Law Emergency Interplanetary Directives. Aren't you even going to give me a fair trial before you hang me? Yes, 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 yes. Talk to me, please. Talk to me. Ladies, I beg of you, ladies. Captain, what exactly are the charges against me? You're a stowaway. I can pay for my passage. You can? Well, then I guess we can dismiss the charges. Ladies, gentle ladies, just a moment, Captain. Uh, yes, Miss Farling? I demand justice. You can't let him off that lightly. Besides, there's the other charge. What other charge? Assault. That comes under sections 18 through 35 of the McDonald Law. It does? Well, then would you tell the court in your own words exactly what happened? Well, when I first laid eyes on Mr. Brown, he seemed to be a fundamentally decent chap, despite his barbaric notions on equality between the sexes, or worse. I was positive I could shame him into a more rational social behavior and make him give himself up. Go on, Miss Farling. Just as I was getting over the colossal impudence involved in his proposing marriage and was considering the offer seriously on its merits, as one should consider all suggestions, he deliberately dropped the pretense of reason. Get her. Ferdinand! My name is Ford, and you're nothing but a big snitch. You promise not to get Butt into trouble. Well, Your name is Ferdinand, and stop trying to act forcefully like a girl. It doesn't become you. Miss Sparling, did I understand you to say that you were considering Mr. Brown's proposal of marriage? That is true. I will not deny that he appealed to me. He appealed to me as, as most savage ancients appeal to their women, as an emotional machine. <laughs> Throw the proper switches, says his theory, and the female surrenders herself ecstatically to the doubtful and bloody murk of masculine plans. I'm afraid I still don't understand. What exactly did Mr. Brown do? He kissed me. Oh, oh, ladies, for me. Ladies, oh, ladies, please, ladies. Uh, Mr. Brown, do you deny kissing Miss Barling? No, Miss Barling. Do you deny enjoying the kiss? Your question is irrelevant and immaterial. Oh, she enjoyed it. How would you know? Well, I was right there. I could tell the way she acted. She sort of held the back of his neck, closed her eyes, and just hung on. <laughs> what were you doing there? I introduced him. I met Bud first. Then I took Sis over there to meet him. I see. Ferdinand Sparling, I hereby order your detention for the duration of this voyage for aiding and abetting a stowaway as set forth in sections 41 43 and, 43 and 45. And, 45. and you can't arrest Ferdinand. He's only a child. You gave me your word. No charges would be lodged against the boy. That was the usual promise one makes to an informer. But I made it before I knew it was Butley Brown you were talking about. I didn't want to arrest Butley Brown. You forced me. So, I'm breaking my promise to you, just as I understand you broke your promise to your brother. I'm afraid both Ferdinand and Butt Lee Brown will be picked up at New Kalamazoo Spaceport and sent terror ward for trial. But I used all our money to buy passage. I'm sorry, you'll have to return with your brother. Of course, there is a way out. There is? Well, tell me, please. Miss Sparling, if you'd marry Brown... Oh. Now, don't, don't, don't look at me like that. If you'd marry Brown, he would go on your passport as a dependent male member of your family. Do you think I'd marry that, that, that desperado? Why, he doesn't know enough to sit back and let a woman run things. Captain, you should be ashamed of yourself. I'll marry him! Perhaps I should be, but that's what comes of putting men in responsible positions. See here, Miss Sparling, I didn't want to arrest Brown. I'd still prefer not to. The officers and crew of my ship all go along with me. Why not? Men always think like men. They never use logic. They just rely on masculine intuition. <laughs> Maybe so. This ship's crew are all residents of Earth. But our work requires us to be on Venus several times a year. We wouldn't want to cross any member of the Brown clan. They're all men of influence on the polar continent. I wouldn't doubt that for a second. If anyone gets in their way, they merely oxidize them with a blaster. Take Butt. He's a big man in his own bailiwick. The Galerton Archipelago. When he wants to put somebody in office, well, 
He just appoints them. Mr. Brown has that much influence, you say? Uh, power, actually. The kind a strong man usually wields in a newly settled community. Oh, Mr. Brown, if I marry you, would you promise to see that I'm appointed resident governor of the Galerton Acapelico? No. boy, Bart. Don't give in. Ferdinand, this does not concern you. Uh, Mr. Brown, I might even consider a county clerkship. Nope. Stick by your blasters, Bud. Show me you're a real man. Mr. Brown, it would seem to me that if you really want to marry this attractive young lady, a compromise could be worked out. Well, I could make her sheriff. Oh, no. Would the position of sheriff of the Gallertin Archipelago be acceptable, Miss Barling? Yes. Good! I'll marry you here and now. I want to be a bridesmaid! Only the bridesmaid, never a bride! I can be every But we shouldn't have sold out. Why did you do it? You don't have to marry her for my sake. I wouldn't care what they did to me. That's all right, Ted Pole. I'd do anything for my favorite brother-in-law. I'd sure like to be your brother-in-law. But gosh, you don't have to marry, sis. You've had any one of these 300 females... Why marry sis? I'm stubborn. What I like at first, I keep on liking. What I want at first, I keep on wanting until I get it. Yeah, but making her sheriff. What's going to happen to our man's world? Don't worry none about that, Ford, my boy. Wait till after we meet and go out to my islands. She'll find herself sheriff over exactly two Earth males, you and me. <laughs> and I got a hunch that'll keep her pretty busy, huh? <laughs> huh? How about that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features An Eye for a What? A story of the Earthmen who thought they couldn't hurt a friendly alien if their lives depended on it, while all the time their lives did depend on it. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you Venus is a Man's World, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by William Tenn and adapted for radio by Arthur Small. Featured in our cast were Dennis Bellabio as Ford, Bob Haig as Butt, Jerry Ann Raphael as Kerry, John Gibson as the Captain, and Frederica Chandler as Evelyn. This is Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Next week, X-1 presents Trap by Finn O'Donovan. Fur hunters tangle with a bottle of fire water and a new kind of trap which catches more than they bargain for. We hope you'll be listening next week at this same time. This week, the Boy Scouts are celebrating their 47th year of service to American youth. Throughout the country, there will be open houses, courts of honor, indoor and outdoor campfires, cub circuses, scout expositions, explorer events, and other special activities. This is the second year of the four-year program, Onward for God and My Country, which was launched to help prepare America's boys to live in today's world and prepare them to carry their full share in the years ahead. It's designed to give youth an opportunity to develop physical fitness, self-reliance, a sense of personal responsibility, a spirit of helping people, a willingness to share, an understanding of our government's democratic processes, and a firm spiritual foundation. On Sunday, February 10th, churches of all faiths will observe Boy Scout Sunday, with scouts attending services in uniform. The World on a New Hotline. Listen for news on the hour and the exciting hotline service all day, every day, on most of these stations. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire.
From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future. Adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight, The Trap by Finn O'Donovan. Samish, I am in need of some assistance. The situation is potentially dangerous, so come at once. It shows how right you were, Samish, old friend. I never should have trusted a Terran. What a sorry mess, Samish. And the plot seems so foolproof. Hey, Thurston. Thurston, get up. Mm. Get up. Come on. Why? What's the matter? Why? Come on. It's daybreak. Now, there's good news. Let me alone. Oh, come on. You don't want to sleep through our vacation. The bird's on the wing. It's five o'clock in the morning. Five o'clock in the morning in the Adirondacks is the middle of the day. What's the weather out? Oh, it's raining. For crying out loud. Oh, don't go back to sleep. It always rains on the first day of vacation. Rule of nature. Look, I got a little fly rod with a new plastic reel that I'm just dying you know to try. Now, what the trouble with you is, Ed, you're in love with sporting goods equipment. Oh, now, wait till you see this rod. You take that rifle I sold you. You could shoot a rhinoceros with it, but you won't, because, Ed, you're essentially a friendly man. The trouble with you is you don't like the woods. Well, how can you say that? Don't I come with you on a hunting trip every year? Sure, but you always manage to steer us over to Lake Placid to the cocktail lounges. Ah, now there's real hunting. Now, there are trophies to bring back to the city. None of your paltry brown bears or black bears. Oh, come on. Now, Thurston, I came up here to the mountains to hunt. Have a drink. Well, it's awfully early in the morning. Well, look upon it as an extension of last night. Well, all right. Oh. <clears throat> Think it'll stop raining? No, who cares? Well, come on now. Get dressed. It's a perfect day out there in the woods for bear. It certainly is. That's why I want to stay right here in the cabin. Ed. What? Pass the canteen. It's empty. Well, open up one of the bottles and pour it in. Why don't you take it straight from the bottle? What, on a camping trip? Pour it into the canteen. Okay. Hey, hey. Now, this is what I call a hunting trip. Well, you haven't been outside the cabin. Oh, come on, Thurston. Can't we go out just to hunt something, even if it's just a little rabbit? Look. It stopped raining. Now, close the door. Now, you let some of the fumes out. Did you fill that canteen yet? Hey, look at this. What? Right by the door. How many times have I told you not to leave your collapsible cook stove where I can step on it in the night? It isn't. What is it? I don't know. It's made out of metal. It's just sitting here in the doorway. It says, uh, trap on the top. What? Trap. Where'd you buy that? I didn't. Well, I certainly didn't. Hey, there's a tag on it. Dear friend, this is a new and revolutionary design in a trap. To introduce the trap to the general public, we are giving you this model absolutely free. You will find it a unique and valuable device for the capture of small game, provided you follow precisely the directions on the other side. Good luck and good hunting. <laughs> well, now, what do you think of that? Pass me the can't see. If this isn't the strangest thing, do you suppose it was left during the night? Oh, who cares? Well, aren't you interested? Not particularly. Just another gadget. I've got a hundred like it. My bear trap from Abercrombie and Fitch, the jaguar horn from Battlers, the crocodile... Well, lure I've for... never seen a trap like this. That's yeah, pretty clever advertising to just leave it here. Well, they'll bill you for it eventually. You care for the canteen? Oh, thanks. <clears throat> hey, look at this thing, Thurston. Do I have to? Well, there are instructions on the other side. Uh, quote... 
Take the trap to a clearing and anchor it to any convenient tree with the attached chain. Mm Mm-hmm. Here's the chain, all right. Press button one on the base. This primes the trap. Wait five seconds and press button two. This activates the trap. Nothing more is required until a capture has been effected. Then press button three to deactivate and open the trap and remove the prey. Warning. Keep the trap closed at all times except when removing the prey. That's goofy. No opening is required for the prey's ingress since the trap works on the principle of osmotic suction and inducts the prey directly into the trap. Well, somebody's been at that can't see him before No, us. no, no, that's what it says. <laughs> what won't they think of next? Osmotic suction. Pass the can't see him back. I'm going to set it. What, the can't see him? No, the trap. Come on, help me. Ah, now that's the trouble with you. You're always cluttering up a hunting trip with hunting. Come on, come on, take this in. All right, all right. If it makes you any happier... Hey, boy, it's cold. Come on, we'll carry it over to that tree. Uh, it's heavy. Yeah. Here, let's put it down here. <clears throat> you think we really ought to fool with it? Of course. Maybe we can catch a fox. What will we do with a fox? Turn it loose. The fun is in the catching. Here, uh, take the end of the chain. Hey, look, look out. You got your foot in it. Now. Yeah, I guess it snaps in here. Oh, there it is. Let's get back to the cabin. The great outdoors depresses me. Wait a minute. I've got to press button one. Hey, it's glowing. Yeah. Three, four, five. Now button two. Well? Well, I guess we just leave it. Well, come on back to the cabin. All right. It is time for breakfast. It certainly is. Pass it to me and don't spill it. Samish, where are you? You are my oldest friend. I have already been you the beginning of my story. The Terrans accepted my trap as a trap, nothing more. And they began using it at once with no thought as to the consequences. I had counted on this. The fantastic curiosity of the species is well known. During this period, my wife was crawling giddily around the planetoid, redecorating our hutch and enjoying the change from city life. Everything was going well. Ed. What? It's your turn. Okay, here we go. Ready on the right. Ready on the left. The flag is up. The flag is waving. Target's up. You missed. Oh, Thurston, couldn't we just pull the cork out instead of trying to shoot off the neck? Well, certainly not. This is a hunting trip. You can pull a cork off in the city. I have often corked off in the city. <laughs> Ed, why don't you shut your trap? 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 Why don't... Thurston, the trap. What about it? Maybe we caught something. Come on. Now, where are you going? The trap. There, look, look. We've got something. We've caught something. <laughs> Come on, look inside. What? Is it, huh? It's a rabbit. You sure? Well, look at it. That is not exactly a rabbit, Ed. It's the size of a rabbit. But it's bright green. Ed, uh, no more rum before breakfast. No, sirree. Starting tomorrow. Hand me the canteen. What do you think it is? <sighs> Could be a rabbit. Green, with lobster claws, and eyes on stalks? Well, then again, it might not be a rabbit. I think it's a new species. We'll have to build a cage and then find out what it eats. As long as it doesn't drink. You don't suppose it drinks, does it? No, no, it doesn't look like a drinking type. Now, Ed, I'm not going to share my vacation with a green rabbit with lobster claws. Probably has dirty habits. There's something very unnatural about that trap. It's inhuman. I'll you know. bet they said that about Ford's electric light and Edison's car and the telephone invented by Alexander's ragtime band. Are you sure about that? Oh, sure. I saw the movie. Come on. We'll build a cage and then we'll set the trap again. Okay, but we better go back to the cabin. 
What for? Better refill. I can't see. Why haven't you come yet? Samish, don't you appreciate the seriousness of my situation? Think of your old friend. Think of the lustrous skinned Fregel for whose sake I got into this mess. Communicate with me at least. The Terrans used a trap, which of course was not a trap at all, but a matter transmitter. I had the other end concealed on the planetoid and fed into it three small animals which I found in the garden. The Terrans removed them from the transmitter each time. For what purpose, I couldn't guess, but a Terran will keep anything. After the third beast passed through and had not been returned, I knew that was all and that everything was in readiness. So I prepared for the fourth and final sending, the all-important one, for which all else was mere preparation. Ouch. Well, that finishes the cage. You know what? No. What? Those things smell. All three of them. Oh, I think they're very handsome. Well, here they are. One, two, and three. First, our green rabbit. Next, our bird with three sets of scaly wings. And this other thing, what does it look like? Well, it looks like a snake. Except it has a head at each end. They eat anything yet? No, I've tried milk, mincemeat, vegetables, caviar, potato chips. They haven't touched a thing. Maybe they're sick. Hey, what are you keeping them for? Well, they might come in handy someday. Oh, well, yeah? What for? Thurston, have you ever desired fame? What? Fame. The knowledge that your name will go down through the ages. I am a businessman. I've never considered the possibility. Never? What do you have in mind? These creatures are unique. And they smell. We'll present them to a museum. The Daily Thurston Exhibit of Creatures Hitherto Unknown. <laughs> they might name them after us. Our names will go down with Livingston, Audubon, Teddy Roosevelt, Walt Disney. I was thinking of a wing on the Museum of Natural History that would go right across Central Park West. The Daily Thurston Wing. Uh, Thurston Daily. That's not alphabetical. That's true, that's true. But, Ed, we only got three of them. We can't equip a wing with three exhibits. Well, there must be more where these came from. Let's examine the trap. Uh, just a minute. The canteen? The canteen. got something. There it is. Look, it's about three feet tall. A big one. Uh-huh. A small green head and a, a forked tail. Oh, look at him, waving something on top of his head. Well, the rest were quiet. Maybe this one's dangerous. Huh? We'll handle it with nuts. Nuts? Well, nets. Oh, nuts. All right. And then we'll have to get in touch with the museum. Thurston, take a telegram. All righty. Uh, Museum of Natural History. Dear sir. Or madam. Have discovered at least four animals, which I suspect to be new species stop. Have you room for suitable exhibit stop? Signed, your friend Ed. Wasn't that a signature pretty informal? You're right, you're right. Make it, uh, your good friend Ed. Ah. We better go back and build a cage for this latest one. It looks awfully exciting. Ah, I think we'll make this one strong. Oh, this last specimen is the cream of our collection. Look at it. Its head is turning pink. It looks mad, doesn't it? Well, you'd be mad, too, if you were trapped by osmotic suction. Say that again. Osmotic suction. Here, you take the canteen. I'm way ahead of you. What, Samish? The rest of the story. Well, it's obvious enough. After three animals had passed through the transmitter, I knew I was ready. 
Now was the time to tell my wife. Accordingly, I asked her to crawl into the garden with me. Tell me, dear, she said, has something been bothering you of late? Have I displeased you? My dear, I said, you have tried your best, but it just isn't good enough. I'm going to take a new mate. She stood motionless, her cilia swaying in confusion. Then she exclaimed, Freegal! Yes, I told her, the glorious Freegal has consented to share my hutch. And with a clever shove, I pushed her into the matter transmitter. Samish, you should have seen her expression. Her cilia wreathed and she screamed and was gone. I was free, free at last. Free to mate with the splendid Freegal. Now you can appreciate the full perfection of the scheme. It was necessary to secure the Terran's cooperation, since a matter transmitter must be manipulated at both ends. I had disguised it as a trap, because Terrans will believe anything. And as a master stroke, I sent them my wife. Let them try to live with her. I never could. Foolproof. Absolutely foolproof. No one could prove a thing. And then, Samish, then it happened. Did you get the cage finished? Yeah, our fourth animal is snug as a bug in a... in a... It doesn't matter. Boy, it's a mad one, though. I couldn't help feeling it was trying to tell me something. Come on. Here's a trap. It's empty. But it is. It's empty. You suppose something's wrong with it? Maybe there's nothing else to capture. Oh, that's silly. Why would it capture four animals and then stop? I've pressed all the buttons in the right way. Maybe the battery's down. Osmotic suction doesn't work on batteries. How do you know? Did you ever hear of osmotic suction working on batteries? No. You see? There you are. Well, you got something there. Oh, I know. What? Let's go to Lake Placid and forget the whole thing. No, no, this thing's got to work. It's got to. The first and daily wing of the American Museum of Natural History is at stake. Would you want that vast edifice across Central Park West to remain empty? No, no. Would you want the Daily Thurston Wing to be rented for a garage? Or a roller skating rink? Oh, horrors, no. It's got to work again. I'm going to open the top. Yeah, look, look out. No, let's just see what's inside here. Ah! My hand. It's gone. My hand. No, 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 it isn't. Right there on the end of your arm. Oh, but when I put it in the trap, my hand disappeared. You know what would do you a lot of good? A little rest in Lake Placid. I know a fine, restful cocktail lounge. No, no, look, look. I'll try it again with both arms. Ah, look. No hands. Very clever. I see how it works. Thurston, those animals didn't come from the Adirondacks at all. You mean they're imposters? They came from wherever my hand is. Where's your hand? I don't know. Do you realize there's a lot more where they come from? Thurston, the future of the Daily Thurston Wing is assured. Give me a hand up. Uh, uh, and what are you going to do? I'm climbing into the trap. Oh, da, 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 don't do that. You don't know what's in there. Uh, here I go. There goes my feet. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. Here's a canteen. Let's have one for the road. Huh? All right. <clears throat> Wish me luck. I still don't think you should do it. I do it for science. And the daily Thurston wing. Why do you hold your nose? I got sinus. Here I go. <laughs> Samish, if you don't come immediately, it'll be too late. I must stop beaming you. The enormous Terran has completely ransacked my little planetoid. He has shoved everything, living or dead, through the transmitter. My home is in ruins, and now he's tearing down my hutch. Samish, this monster means to capture me as a specimen. There's no time to lose. Samish, Samish, what can be keeping you? You, my oldest friend, you who... 
What's that? Samish. Samish, what are you saying? You can't mean it. No. Not you and Friegel. Reconsider, my old friend. Remember our friendship. Remember... Samish! You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features The Deep One by Neil P. Ruzik, a story which tells of a single mistake in the plan for survival, the biggest possible mistake. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, by transcription, X-1 has brought you The Trap, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Finn O'Donovan and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in our cast were Donald Buca as The Voice, Ralph Bell as Thurston, and William Redfield as Ed. This is Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. The world on a new hotline. Listen for news on the hour in the exciting hotline service all day, every day on most of these stations. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, Field Study by Peter Phillips. You might put down that newspaper for just a minute, Frank. Hmm? Oh, of, of course, dear. Say, so this is good coffee, honey. Now, what is it going to be? That's what I want to know. Overtime or that big night out you promised me? Well, I just can't say for sure, honey. Uh, I'll phone you during the day. Look, you've been working on that Mitchell embezzlement for three months, day and night. Now that it's over, I think you'd want to celebrate. Well, I do, dear, I do. But I don't know just what this new assignment will involve. Oh, this I... is it. This is absolutely the end. You can change your job or change your wife, Frank. Oh, no, honey. I thought I married a man, not an accounting machine. <laughs> I guess I do seem like an accounting machine to Betty sometimes. Maybe she should have married a different kind of guy. Someone who likes to go out dancing and to parties all the time. And who has some kind of romantic career. The quiet life she had with me made her tense and nervous. No, more than that, neurotic. Actually, the work I did was rather interesting, although she didn't feel that way about it. Being an investigator for the accountancy branch isn't exactly like being one of those detectives as smart as Einstein and as tough as Marciano, but... We do get into some unusual situations. And now there was this new assignment the chief had given me. All I want you to do is see him, Frankie. You can be normally curious, but that's all. If you question him, make it simple. And if he gets cagey, cut it out. You're not going as an agent. You're just an errand boy. Take what he hands out and bring it back. Get on it right away. Although I got there early, the waiting room was filled with about 40 people. Forty people who seem to have everything from Parkinson's disease to muscular atrophy. In 40 years, I'd never had anything wrong with me but a post-nasal drip, but I was prepared with the symptoms of an obscure ailment. I didn't have an appointment, but I had hardly sat down when the receptionist came over and ushered me into the office. I'll be with you in just a moment. 
Please sit down. Well, thank you. This is good of you, Doctor, but I was perfectly willing to wait my turn. Oh, I'm entitled to use my own discretion. You're an interesting case. And please don't call me Doctor. In the healing profession, that title is reserved for those who have taken the Hippocratic Oath. My name is Trancor. Mm -hmm. You said uh, I'm an interesting case. How do you know about my case? You've never seen me before. My receptionist has intuitive diagnostic ability. Now, what are your symptoms? It seems you should be able to tell me. Well, let's say the recital is part of the treatment. But if you'd rather not bother, just take this capsule in water. But this is ridiculous. How do I know... You don't. I make no claims. You can take the capsule or leave it. How many tokens... Uh, I mean, uh, how much money do you have with you? Now, listen, doctor. No, I'm not a doctor. How much? Oh, about $50, I suppose. Well, give me 25 for the capsule, which you take on faith, if you take it. Well? All right, I'll take it. I'm afraid that's all there is to report, Chief. It's all right. All we really wanted was the capsule. Have you gotten a report? Yes, and it took the laboratory five hours to break it down. Just a harmless protein solution. Two other investigators got the same thing. What about the genuine patients? They get a solution of water and a vegetable dye. They're both useless, but when he spots an investigator, he tries to give our lab men a headache. Well, if he prescribes useless medicines, can't Trancor be booked for fraud? Oh, he doesn't make any claims for the blaster thing. How come he's on our level? Why the accountancy branch? Could be anybody's case. But every time a direct law enforcement agency has tried to investigate, the man has disappeared. They think we may be more discreet. What else do we know? A great deal. Then again, nothing. We have reports from law agencies and medical societies in London, Paris, Berlin, and Prague. Oh, that reminds me. Miss Hance, please ask Sir Greville to come in now. He sets up in business. Word of his cures gets around, he becomes a sensation, and then disappears. Thank you for waiting, Sir Greville. Uh, this is Frank Paik, who will be in charge of our investigation. Uh, how do you do? Frank, this is Sir Greville Gray, chairman of the English Medical Association. How do you do, sir? Suppose you tell Paik your own experience with Trancor, Sir Greville. Well, uh, after conferring with my colleagues in other countries, I managed to have an interview with him when he set up shop in London. He's an impudent little devil. Called me the chief witch doctor. When I said we'd prosecute, he flatly denied that he practiced medicine at all. What about the capsules? He said he simply offered the capsules because people expected something material. He said it made no difference whether they took them or not. In a word, he disclaims everything, even success. Perhaps legally he's in the clear. You mentioned his success. Do you credit him with success? I think he's a faker and a fraud. But some reputable doctors report that their own patients seem to have been cured of advanced leukemia, peritonitis, and appendicitis. That's why we must investigate these uh, fantastic rumors as a professional and public duty. Well, just what do you want me to do, Chief? Find out all you can. Have them watch, check with patients, and stay with it. He may disappear at any time. This is a fine time for an assignment like this. My wife is about ready to get a psychiatrist or another husband. I'm sorry, Frankie, but you're the only one I can trust on a thing like this, and it shouldn't take long. Okay, Chief. Uh, you have a cigarette? Mine seem to be all gone. No wonder... Smoked half a dozen while we've been talking. Yeah. Thanks. I guess I do smoke too much. Probably what causes this post-nasal drip. But... Say, that's funny. What? My head is cleared up. My nasal drip is gone. Since I saw Trancor this morning. Yeah? Oh, it probably cleared up by itself. But I've had it for years. Well, I hope you're right. Look, sweetheart, I know I practically promised, but I can't make it tonight. I've been hearing that over and over. But, darling, this is a special case. It's detective work. The police are helping me. Oh, so you think you're a real G-man now, huh? Mm. A big, tough hero running around with a bottle of rye and a blonde. Oh, sweetie. Listen, hero, I hope they shoot first. I'm through. Oh, it's nothing like that, honey. Now, you're just upset and unreasonable. Well, look, I'll try to be home early. I'll call Don't you. Don't bother. I won't be here. I heard from an old school friend today, and since you're going to be busy, I may as well go out. Oh, but baby, listen... I'll see to you me. around town. And if you do get home early, don't wait up. Well, 
I was alone in the office all evening, thinking about Betty, thinking about Trancor. I remembered Betty's crack about a bottle of rye. So I called the liquor store and had them send up a pint. Every now and then I got a call from a detective saying they were still watching the office. Then there was a call from another detective saying that he had picked up Trancor at the entrance of the office building and trailed him to a hotel just off Broadway. I took down the number and was about to leave when the first detective called again. He said they were still waiting at the office door and that there was still no sign of Trancor. I didn't try to explain. I didn't want to think about it. What could I say? That he flew out the window? I took another drink of rye and went to the hotel. As I got there, a figure came out of the building. I wasn't sure, but I followed him. Ah, uh, good evening, Mr. Pake. How are your nasal passages? Fine, thank you. I mean, uh, yes, they're better. Walk with me, won't you? But first signal your policeman that he needn't follow us. All right. All right, now tell me something, will you? Am I mad? No, you're more sane than most. Your higher critical centers are momentarily dulled by fatigue and alcohol, giving full rein to your intuition. An endearing quality when allied with imagination. The saving grace, indeed, of your race. You're from India, aren't you? Trancor is a good Indian name. Incidentally, fatigue is a disease. Now, don't cure me. I don't want to wake up. Let me close my eyes a minute. Are you still here? Did you expect me to disappear? I could quite easily, by convincing you of my non-presence, as I did when I walked past those men outside my office. Don't you want to ask me some questions? Maybe I do, but why do you want to answer them? Well, you figure I'm harmless, huh? Like my wife does. And by no means. I went about to conclude my own particular investigation and say that you were most dangerous to me. Your imagination is quite highly developed. You know, all of a sudden, I'm not drunk at all anymore. And I need a drink. Come on, let's go in here. Very well. A double rye, please. The same. Oh, uh, just leave the bottle. Ah, that's better. I was thirsty. You drank half the bottle. I make sure to eliminate the poisons in the alcohol, thus the toxic effects. As a rule, I don't drink, but when in Rome... Wait a minute, wait a minute. I remember reading a story once. You're from the future. Your imagination deserves something better than comic strips to work on. It's fascinating, but depressing to see science negated by superstition. Your concept of time is the greatest superstition. Well, now let's go back. You did cure my post-nasal drip, didn't you? The infection was cured by your body. I helped. I can't tell you how unless you have 500 years to spare. Well, I don't. I haven't got 12 hours to spare. If I'm to save my job, my reputation, or my wife. But I do need some answers to a pretty lengthy questionnaire. Who, when, what, why, and where? You're convinced I'm a telepath? Well, aren't you? Not in your sense of the term. When you came into my waiting room, I knew you were not there as a patient. Your presence was in disharmony. As for your name and occupation, they're naturally blazed so clearly on the surface of your mind that even your native clairvoyance could read the information. Well, that takes a load off my mind. Are you too big for me to understand? We'll see. I'm just looking at that girl over there. What a pity. Three quarters of her right lung is gone. Yeah? Well, you could put her right. Well, I could stop the infection. But she would return to that back room full of smoke and dust. She'd still travel on a crowded subway to an overheated office. She'd still starve herself to buy clothes to keep in fashion. I don't have a cure for those things. Well, that's the first time I've heard you admit you have a cure for anything. What are you, Mr. Trancorn? A healer. That is my profession. Why do you bother to do anything? Well, even a healer must eat, you know. And field research is expensive. Of course, I could obviously earn sufficient of your tokens for subsistence by gambling. But that would not be ethical. You could teach. What? Run afoul of your witch doctors? Besides, these techniques have taken me 500 years to learn. Well, that's why I thought... That I was from the future? 
Well, I might be in terms of possibility. We are no older than you are as a race, in terms of universal evolution, but as individuals, we are longer lived. The biggest single advance you will make as a race will be when you increase the lifespan of the individual. You could help us. We could, but that must be achieved by your own efforts. Are we so contemptible in your eyes? Of course not. Would we study you if you were? Our architects, our musicians, even our fiction writers do field work in this territory and write scholarly theses when they return. Anthropology, in our sense of the term, embraces all the arts and sciences. We are scholars. Occasionally, we innovate, and you benefit. Why do you want to tell me this? Frankly, I like you. You have imagination enough to control your terrestrial chauvinism, your natural resentment of being studied. It may comfort you to know that in the physical sciences, your race is considered quite well advanced. Well, thank you. And come to think of it, I do resent being a bug under your microscope. I hate it. I could kill you. But you won't. Others would. Now you understand why our visits are unannounced. It will be until all men are as essentially civilized, that is to say, non-aggressive, as you are. How do you come here? I know what you're wondering. But no, no, I don't have a spaceship garaged anywhere. You see, we don't travel... We, um, we arrive. I'm afraid the distinction is not clear to you, but it'll have to do. Now, I must go to work. I have only eight hours. Will you be my guide? What do you want to see? The city at play in the pre-dawn hours. I think my wife would suit you better in the role of a guide. She's playing pretty hard right now. And this situation makes you unhappy? Well, yes, of course it does. I guess I'm not overly emotional, but I do love Betty. I want her to be happy. With me. Oh, she frets and nags, and she's hard to please, but she's not really like that. She keeps herself busy with trivial things. It's as if she were afraid of important things. And what are the important things? Well, I don't know exactly. Uh, helping people some way or other, I guess. You have any idea where your wife might be? Well, there are a couple of nightclubs she likes. Mm, could we go there a little later? No, don't worry. I promise there'll be no unpleasant consequences if we meet. But now, let's get going. We made the early morning rounds at Manhattan. The bars, nightclubs, penny arcades. We played a pinball machine and I watched the steel ball hit the prize number 25 times. We quit bowling after his second straight 300 game. And I didn't even bother to pick up a cue in the billiard parlor. Then we went to the Clover Club, where I saw Betty at a table in a low, low-cut evening gown. She was sitting with a big, curly-haired guy who looked like an ex-football player who was wearing shoulder pads under his jacket. You see her? Yes, there she is, in that practically non-existent dress. Would you consider me uncivilized if I poked that big dope in the eye? Let's go over. And remember, you're not altogether without blame in this development. You make insufficient allowance for her. You're reasonably well-adjusted. She's not. Hi, Betty. Frankie. Frankie, where did you come from? Who's your friend? Excuse me, please. Uh, I have to make a phone call. I think I have a Frankie, to... please get me a cab so I can go home. Go home? All right, dear. I'll be waiting for you. Hurry as soon as you can. I mean, when you're finished with your work. It's beautiful here, watching the lights on the river. How do you feel? My head is clear, but I'm a little drunk from the neck down. It's like a dream. I wish sometimes I could escape reality so easily by imparting to it the patina of a dream. You can all do that. I almost envy you. Look, the dawn is coming up. The stars are fading. Yes. It's time for me to say goodbye, Mr. Pake. But can you... Can you at least tell me which star? You haven't seen it or named it yet. Promise to take care of Mr. Trancor for me, won't you? Make sure that he gets safely home. Find his address in this pocket. Goodbye, Mr. Trancor. Yes. Goodbye. 
That's the way it happened, Chief. The body collapsed in my arms there on the bridge. When it came to, the man was Chandra Trancor, a second-rate doctor who disappeared from Madras ten months ago. How do you expect anyone to believe that? Those doctors and cops can examine the poor devil till they drive him crazy, but he can't tell them anything. He has less idea where he's been these past ten months than they have. How do you explain it? I don't. And I'd like you to hurry through my resignation, Chief. That's what you want. I want to be free to take legal action for Trancor if those witch doctors have him arrested on some phony charge. I'll take personal responsibility for seeing him home to India. You don't have to resign. I'll fix special leave if you insist on being crazy. Well, that's not all, though, Chief. You see, I'm taking an intensive two-year course for a new career. Yes, you told me. I thought you were drunk. What's Betty going to think of a fool idea like that? If her nerves are on edge now, this is enough to drive anyone daffy. No, 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 no. She's all for it. She really is. After all, a neurosis is a disease, and she met Trancor. Well, all right. Let me know how you're getting along. Letter from Pake, Miss Hans. Hmm. From the Mabello Medical Mission, Upper Congo. Hmm. It's been three years since we heard from Pake. This is probably the most backward, backward tribe, tribe mentally and, and physically in all Africa. Some trouble with the witch doctors at first. But they're beginning to trust me, with Betty's help. The women here love her... And she finds the tribal customs fascinating. Watch out for my name in the Anthropological Review. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Operation Stinky by Clifford D. Simak. What is man's best friend? The answer was so vital that every possible resource that could be found had to be poured into this one great project. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you Field Study, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Peter Phillips and adapted for radio by Jack Wilson. Featured in our cast were Terry Keene, Les Damon, Santos Ortega, Alfred Shirley, and Kermit Murdoch. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Can you identify the NBC bandstand jingle jangler? He or she is a famous personality, and you may win $1,000 if you can identify him. To enter the NBC Bandstand Jingle Jangler Contest, send a postcard with your name and address and phone number to NBC Bandstand, Box 515, New York, 19, New York. Enter today. NBC takes you across the nation, around the world, with news on the hour and the hotline service all day, every day, on most of these stations. <laughs> Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, 
Real Gone, starring Al Jasbo Collins. Playing, of all things, Al Jasbo Collins. <laughs> Oh, come in. Come in. Glad to see you. Albert here, your Collins friend. Just a minute. I'll close the door. You know, uh, when you run a disc jockey show, the song pluggers just seem to ooze through the grain of the wood. There. Well, we won't be bothered for a while. Have a seat. I'll take this record off the chair. <laughs> Hound Dog. Exclusive to me. Sung by Helen Traubel with the Vienna State Symphony Orchestra. Under the direction of... Felix Weingartner. Ah, now sit down. You do the writing for that real gone show on NBC, don't you? That uh, X minus one with the rocket ships and the three-headed men from Mars and all that jazz. Well, that's why I asked you up. I ran into a little something. Just an idea, you know. I figured maybe uh, you could English it up and use it. It's about a friend of mine, Ralph Therian. Did you ever hear him? He's an artist. I don't mean uh, records or a musician. I mean a an artist, artist, a sculptor. I ran into him during the war. He used to sit in the barracks making busts of the sergeants out of G.I. soap. And when they had him on KP, they couldn't trust him to peel potatoes. He'd end up doing caricatures of the captain and the lieutenants out of raw spuds. Man, he was the greatest. He, he got the whole company restricted for a week when we were stationed somewhere near Boston. It snowed, and uh, he made a life-size statue out of snow and ice depicting the captain sitting in a howdah on the back of an elephant. The captain didn't mind so much, but the elephant happened to look like the regimental colonel, and he took a dim view of the entire affair. Uh, Ralph studied in France somewhere under the G.I. Bill of Rights, and I used to run into him once in a while on 57th Street. He's looking kind of hungry and desperate. Then uh, one day a couple of green weeks ago, I ran into him on Madison Avenue, and man, he looked like he belonged. He had one of them Tyrolean chapeaux with the shaving brush uh, stuck on one side, uh, an important German loading coat, and he was carrying a snakeskin dispatch case. Al! Albert! Well, hello, Ralph, my friend. Well, you're looking great, Al. Hey, I like that beard. Oh, thanks. Uh, kind of gives your face the Mount Rushmore quality. Uh, it's generally admired, my friend, but uh, what brings you over here on this uh, street of dreams? I was under the impression an artist was immediately downgraded three degrees of integrity when he set foot on Madison Avenue. <laughs> oh, I was just up seeing a client. A client? Hmm, you've given up the sculpting kick. Oh, no, no. I'm just working in a new medium. Well, you look real prosperous. Uh, how do you like the shoes? Oh, very dapper. Very dapper. I don't believe I've ever seen lizard skin harachis before. <laughs> Had them imported. Made underwater by natives of Ecuador. Yeah. Takes about three hours to have them made. So they use about 12 natives per pair. Ralph, my friend, you give the general impression that you are loaded with loot. I am. There's money in art. Money. You just got to get something new. Here. Wait a minute. Let me open my case. Here, Al. Take a look at this. What is that, uh, an ice cube? Look inside. Mm-hmm. Now, man, that's real entrancing. What is it? That is a detailed copy of Rodin's The Kiss. Pretty sexy. How do you do it? Well, you see, I carve it from underneath the plastic block. Oh, it looks sort of solid to me. How do you get in? Well, look at the bottom. Uh, you see that little hole? Uh huh. I work through there with my engraving instrument. Of course, this is just a sample. I've been doing originals, mostly. Uh, what are the little cubes good for? Uh, paperweights, I guess, huh? This is art, Albert. Art. Do you know how much I get for one of these? Beats me. $5,000. Oh, that's a pretty stiff price for a paperweight. Well, you just don't understand, Al. This is the hottest thing since Picasso. I just sold two original compositions to Morgan Stern. You know, the dealer from Philadelphia? For $25,000. $25? Wow. Uh -huh. I... Boy, I should have paid attention when Mama bought me that clay when I was a little boy. Well, it's about time the creative artist got a little bit of recognition. Recognition's not the point, man. At 25 G's, I wouldn't care if people walked past me in high noon. That's because you're not an artist. The money's secondary. Money is never secondary. Money is the primariest thing there is. Al, would you be interested in a fine original composition? Well, I... I'll make a special prize for you, Albert. $4,000. 
No, Ralph, my friend, I, I keep my papers from blowing off my desk with my right foot and my left piled one on top of the other, and I find that quite adequate to the needs and aspirations. Well, the trouble with you is you've got no soul. The trouble with me is I have not got four grand. Ah, this sort of thing is happening to me all the time. For example, I have a barber who plays unaccompanied Bach chacons with a quarter-inch drill and a length of steel pipe. I figured Ralph Therian was stringing me until I ran into Vladimir Osepsky. Now, uh, Vladi is one of these men who leads a double life. He composes concerti and avant-garde operas under his square moniker, but he's better known in the Brill Building as Larry Oss. He got in on the ground floor of this rock and roll affair, and he took an already substantial fortune and ran it up to a fantastic munificence. Larry has money he hasn't even folded yet, and he collects art. I was up at his house one night discussing such things as Tin Roof Blues and Wozzeck by Albin Berg, and uh, Larry got around to showing me his collection. Now, this is Picasso. Larry, that's what I call cool brushwork, my man, cool. I homed it next to the Tintoretto for contrast. Well, this stuff runs into a pile of loot. Well, I figure since I've launched rock and roll on an unsuspecting public, the least I can do is collect old masters and leave them to the nation when I die. Well, uh, it figures. I mean, that figures. And here's my latest. Look, isn't it beautiful? Well, you mean this hunk of plastic? Well, yes. Look into it. That design, that composition, the delicacy of that line. Well, this is the most exciting discovery in art since the invention of red paint. Larry... Was this piece of Jim Crackery executed by one Ralph Therian? That's right. You know him? Mm-hmm. Remarkable talent. Remarkable. A genius. And uh, how much did this stroke of genius cost you, if you don't mind my mentioning a crude thing like money? Not at all. Not at all. It was a steal, a steal. I got it from Morgenstern. Oh, I outfoxed him. I got it from him for only $30,000. Yeah, yeah, you outfoxed him, all right. Uh, tell me something, Larry. Uh, what makes this worth... $30,000. Albert, 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 what makes a Stradivarius worth 30000 and a fiddle played on the street by a beggar? $3, huh? Uh, you mean his stuff is that good? It's art, Albert. This is art. This is genius. To work with such delicacy and such control and such genius in so small a space. You see, that's it. This plastic block is how long? About two inches? Done. And yet within this two inches is the majesty, the feeling of a sculpture 20, 30 feet high. This is an art which has not been known in the world since the painters of miniatures in the late Renaissance. Well, why, then it's for real. For real? This is the gem of my collection. The Picasso, the Renoir, the Cezanne will in time fade into insignificance. This is a new art form. Brilliant. Brilliant. And now let me play a new record we're putting out. It's called I Love You, Baby, because your lower lip drags on the ground. A real cool, you bangy beat. Well, I let Ralph Therian's new art form slip my mind for a while while I struggled with song pluggers, advertising salesmen, account executives from the agency. And I met him again a few weeks ago at a small cultural establishment on the corner where I work. You might call it a uh, sort of branch public library with a brass rail. Hey, what's the idea of putting this lemon peel in? If I wanted a fruit salad, I'd ask for it. How do you do, Ralph, my friend? Oh, hello, Al. Ah, you look like you're thriving, my man. Well, as a matter of fact... I just signed a contract with Morgan Stern to deliver $100,000 worth of my original compositions. I'm celebrating. In here? Ah, man, this place is only fit for sweating out the downhill phase on a manic depressive psychosis. Oh, I'm just starting here. I intend to work my way up. Albert, be my guest. <laughs> Well, I just had a difficult morning with the station manager who has an illusion in his little ricky-ticky mind that my program is the answer to Lawrence Welk and Guy Lombardo. He'd been trying to convince me to program two solid hours of Wayne King, relieved by vocals by Frank Crummett and Julia Sanderson. I had resisted, and I was in the mood for eating the lotus and forgetting. Several hours later, Ralph was feeling very confidential. Albert... Albert, my friend, I like you. Why don't you shave? 
Ralph, love me, love my beard. I will try. Albert, you have the look of an Abraham Lincoln gone hog wild among the cream puffs. Ralph, you have an artist soul. Albert, I trust you, I trust you, I trust you. I am touched. And so, Albert, I'm going to take you to my studio, my secret studio. And I will reciprocate, my friend. Tomorrow, when I am doing my disc show, you may come to my secret studio. Uh, With the esteem that my program is held in today, tomorrow I'll be doing my broadcast from a small hole with a round iron top and plenty of running water below. What time is it? Half past something. I'm late. I'm late. Hurry. He took me to a loft somewhere down in the banana warehouse section. He had three locks on the door, and he opened them with three separate keys. I stepped inside and took a look around. The loft stretched a whole city block. The only thing that kept the New York Rangers from using it as a practice rink was the lack of ice. It was empty, except in one corner of the room there was a mess of machinery. Looked as if someone had uh, eviscerated a television set and left it to die of shock. There was a weaselly-looking little man in a shiny blue suit standing in the middle of the floor tapping his foot. Syrian, I've been waiting for half an hour, half an hour. Where have you been? Now, take it easy, Burson. Take it easy. Plenty of time. I've told you the active life of the catalyst is only... Who's this? This is my friend Al. Al Collins. Well, who is he? And what is he doing here? I've told you we must have no one here. Now, he's my friend. I trust him. Oh, I suppose you've told him all about it. Yes, I have. Have you got the stuff? Certainly. Three ampules, but it won't last. You've got to hurry. Roll up your sleeves. Oh, now, uh, just a minute, uh, both of you gentlemen. Uh, if I've been brought down here to witness the inoculation of a little happy juice into somebody's arm, I'm leaving. Uh, I have no desire to tangle with the Federal Narcotics Bureau. Now, Albert, do I look like I'm taking narcotics? I wouldn't swear to it. You don't understand. In those little glass bottles is a secret of $100,000. And I'm going to show you how I do it. First, we take a plastic cube out of my pocket. So, we put it down on the grid in the middle of the floor. So. Now, if you will kindly step to the outside of the white line painted on the floor. Back there. Go ahead. Now, Mr. Burson, we'll turn on the machinery. Now, I take this vial of catalyst, thus, and pour it over the plastic block. So. Now, we wait. We stood there at the edges of that loft and watched that tiny plastic block sitting in a frame on the middle of the floor. And then suddenly it began to grow. In about 20 minutes, that cute little plastic block stood about 20 feet on a side. It almost touched the skylight, and there was about a foot of clearance on each wall. See, the long organic chain of molecules in the plastic is infinitely expandable under the right conditions. Is that a fact? By applying the right voltages in series, we can expand the cube to about this size. But there's an outside limit due to the cohesive charge on the molecules. Oh, naturally. Naturally, of course. uh, Those molecules do stick together. Well, it's the catalyst that does it. And I make that. I make the catalyst. Do you hear that, Therian? I make it. Now, calm down, Burson. Without me, you just have a great big blob of plastic. I'm the one who turns it into money. You see, Albert, a cube this big is as soft as putty inside. Now, I take my pneumatic drill, and I make a hole in the bottom. And then my tools, and I start to carve my pretty sculptures inside. Therian, I'm warning you. I won't take this kind of treatment for long. Now, calm down, Burson. You're getting your 10% cut. 10%! Ten percent. Why, before I brought you this process, the only artwork you could get people to look at was mustaches on subway advertisements. Burson, that is the typical wailing of the non-creative technician. Envy, pure envy for genius. Now look out. I'm going under there and start work. I want fifty percent, Therian. Fifty percent. That's only fair, isn't it? I I put it to you, Mr. Collins. Uh, Just keep me out of it, gentlemen. Leave me out of it. I'm warning you, Therian. I'm warning you. Just get out of my way, grease monkey. Let an artist work. Ralph crawled under the giant cube and started to work. 
I could see what he was drawing, a collection of lovely ladies, something like the closing number at the Union City Burlesque. Didn't look very good. The lines were kind of thick and muddy. It had a kind of a soft and sloppy quality to it, just about as if you were uh, carving in butter. It took him about an hour, and then he crawled out. Uh, just about in time. Well, what does it say on that watch? You've got about 20 seconds left. You cut it pretty fine there, Therian. It's all right. It's a masterpiece. Wait a minute. Okay, now. There she goes. Well, now, what happened was that plastic cube that was blown up to about 20 feet on the side suddenly popped like a balloon with a cigarette stuck in it. And what ended up was that tiny little two-inch cube sitting in the middle of the floor. Ralph picked it up and brought it over. Look at it. Beautiful. Beautiful. The work of genius. The work of science. Makes a real nice paperweight. Albert, my friend, what you have just seen was the creation of a $20,000 masterpiece. Take a good look. I did take a good look. The whole design was there. But what had looked to me like kind of a muddy, buttery picture when it was 20 feet high was now sharp and beautiful and clear as a snowflake. I went back to the studio and demonstrated my independence by scheduling two solid hours of Dizzy Gillespie. The next day, I got a telephone call just before I went on the air. It was Ralph asking me to come over to the studio. He said it was important. So, after the show, I shook the last song plugger out of my lapels and headed down to Ralph Therian's law. I found that fellow Burson walking up and down at the edge of the room, looking at his stopwatch nervously. Uh, they had another plastic cube blown up in the middle of the room, and Ralph was inside the cube working. Uh, they were having quite an argument. I know you got paid off today, Therian, $100,000. I know you got it, and I want my share, 50%. Don't bother me, I'm working. Hi, Ralph. Oh, hi there, Albert. Just a minute. Wait till I crawl out. I warned you. You can't say I didn't warn you. There'll be no more of the catalyst, no more. Listen to him, Al. That's why I asked you over. I wanted a witness. And you're the only one who knew all about it already. Oh, now look, gentlemen. I told you not to get me involved in this. Now listen. This little worm, this <laughs> test tube termite, had the gall to threaten not to bring any more of that catalyst. But I warned you, I warned you, I want my share of that hundred thousand. If you'll excuse me, I'll get back into that masterpiece. That catalyst is only good for 2.7 hours. Hand me the drill, will you, Burson? <laughs> Uh, here it is. What I warned you. Boy, this plastic is tough today. All Let's right. Lord Gray. I warned him. I warned him. He must have the money here somewhere. Yes, it must be somewhere. Bills. Bills. Your check stubs. What are you doing over there, Burton? Looking. Just looking. Well, if you're looking for that $100,000, you can stop. I've got it right here in my pocket. Now, don't bother me while I finish work. What? What? Tyrion. Tyrion, come out of there. Come out. Come out. I've got to finish just a little more. Come out, you don't understand. Come out. Get out of my way, Mr. Collins. With pleasure. Therian, hand me that money. Quick. Get out of my way, Burson. I'm working. But listen, you don't understand. The catalyst. Let go of me. Let go of me. The catalyst. I made it up half strength. Give me that money. Quick, the money. Well, that's all there was to it. I figured out that little fellow from the plastic company figured he'd get himself a new sculptor when he made up that catalyst half strength. The two of them were in there when the roof fell in. The roof and the walls. Well, that's about all there is to it. Figured you might be able to use the story. I wrote a few notes on it. They're here somewhere, but under the paperweight. Oh, would you like to see the paperweight? Little plastic cube, about two inches. Look in there. Two fellows with their hands around each other's throat. Looks realistic, don't it? As if they were squeezing. Of course, this one's an improvement on the work Ralph Therian did. This one's in full color. You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features The Victim from Space. 
A time to sow, a time to reap, a time to live. All the Agathians agreed with this, but not when it came to a time to die. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you Real Gone by Ernest Canoy, based on an idea by Al Jasbo Collins, and starring Al Jasbo Collins as himself. Featured in our cast were John Berrigray as the late sculptor Ralph Therian, John McGovern as his equally late scientific collaborator, and Harold Huber as the fabulous Larry Oss. This is Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Kenneth McGregor and is an NBC Radio Network production. NBC takes you across the nation around the world with news on the hour and the exciting hotline service all day, every day, on most of these stations. Down for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, we go forward in time to the days when war has been outlawed. And in its place, there is a system of carefully controlled, legalized murder. The story, The Seventh Victim, by Robert Sheckley. Is that the mail, Jenny? Bring it right in. No, no, it isn't the mail. Are you anxious, Stan? Well, you know how it is when you're waiting for notification. It's been two weeks. The government's behind schedule, as usual. Oh, that's always the way it is. Now, when you get to be my age, you won't worry about it anymore. At 73, you can afford to wait for the mail. Well, how about the ad? Have you got it done? Sure, E.J. Want me to play it back for you? Of course, I recorded it myself. We'll have an actor in for the actual recording. You ready? Go ahead. Hi there, neighbor. When you're in a crowd, when you're among strangers, do you feel safe? Are you protected by that vital underarm area? You aren't, unless you own a protect suit. The finest tailoring in the world has gone into a Morger and Freeline protect suit to make it the leader in men's fashion. Protect suit is the safest as well as the smartest. Every protect suit comes with special built-in gun pocket guaranteed not to bulge. Oh, nice. Very nice. A touch of the concealed button throws the gun into your hand, cocked, safety off. <laughs> Why not drop into the protect store nearest you? Why not be all safe? Oh, that's fine, Stan. That's fine. That's a very nice, dignified commercial. <laughs> and you can relax. I picked up the mail just before I came in. Here's your notification. That's it, that's it. Look, from the ECB, that's the baby. Well, you're not going to open it now. Oh, no, 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 of course not. No one is supposed to know the victim's name except the hunter. That's right. Have a good hunt, boy. You need a kill. You've been all keyed up. Well, it's too bad you have to retire, E.J. Well, I got into the tens club. Ten hunts. That's not such a bad record. Ten hunts, of course not. Ten hunts, and then, of course, victim in between. That's 20 kills. Mm -hmm. I sure hope my victim isn't anyone like you. Uh, don't worry about it. Uh, what number will this be? 
My seventh. Oh, lucky seven. Go to it. We'll get you into the tens club yet. Uh, by the way, I-, I got a circular in the mail. Yeah, maybe you'd like to use it. Hmm. Yeah, see. Victims, why take chances? Use an O'Donovan accredited spotter. Let us locate your assigned killer. Pay after you get him. Oh, well, uh, thanks a lot, E.J., but uh, I've got my own spotter. Very good fellow. Yeah, well, I suppose you're anxious to get home, open up, and find out who your victim is. What's that? Oh, shooting down the hall. I guess somebody got his victim. Good for him, eh? You bet. <laughs> oh, it feels wonderful, E.J. I feel alive again. <laughs> Hello, Ed. Freeline. Oh, hi, Mr. Freeline. I'm going out on one, Ed. Well, good luck, Mr. Freeline. I-, I suppose you want me to stand by. Yeah, that's right. I don't expect to be gone more than a week or two. I'll probably get my notification of victim status within three months of the kill. Well, I'll be standing by. A good hunting, Mr. Freeline. Now, you'll be sure to save time for me now, Ed. I'd hate to be caught as a victim without a first-class spotter on my side, huh? Oh, now, don't you worry, Mr. Freeline. I'll be right there in your corner. I've got a couple of good ideas for an ambush that I haven't tried yet. Good, good. Well, I'll get back in touch with you right after the kill. So long. Oh, uh, Mr. Freeline? What are you doing in my apartment? Uh, allow me my card. <laughs> Emmanuel Gale, Emotional Catharsis Bureau. Hmm? Uh, uh, what do you want from me? Oh, just a standard spot check in reorientation. Oh, oh I, I see you've got your notification. Yeah, that's right. I uh, haven't opened it yet. Do you mind? Uh, no, <laughs> go right ahead. <laughs> well, yes. Uh, anything wrong, Mr. Freelight? <laughs> I mean, uh, everything there. Photographs, address, description data. Yes, but it says Janet Marie Patzig. Janet Marie? I've never killed a female. Is this an order? Well, just a moment till I check my list. Yes, that's right. The girl registered with the board under her own free will. The law says she has the same rights and privileges as a man. Could you tell me how many kills she has? Well, I'm sorry, sir, but the only information you're allowed is the victim's legal status and uh, the descriptive data that you've received. Could I draw another? Well, you can refuse the hunt, of course. That's your legal right, but uh, you'll not be allowed another victim until you have served. (laughs) Ah, women, always trying to horn in on a man's game. Why can't they stay home? Just doesn't seem feminine. Look, uh, Gail, do you mind if I start packing? Hmm? Oh, no, 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 no. Go right ahead. If you like, you can give me the historical checkout while you pack, and I'll just uh, uh, tick it off here on my list. Well, well, all right. Um, Where do you want me to start? Um, Let's see. uh, Question one, I think. When was the Emotional Catharsis Board established? Well, the board was formed at the end of the Fourth World War or the Sixth. Depends on if you count the new Argentina war. Well, either count will do. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, let's see. Um, weapons increased in magnitude, efficiency, and exterminating power. Soldiers became accustomed to them, and it looked as if another war would be the war to end all wars. Would you hand me those shirts, please? Oh, yes. Of course. So, uh, this time, the peace had to last for all time, but the government recognized the presence of a need for violence in a large percentage of mankind. They recognized the validity of competition, mm-hmm. love of battle in the face of overwhelming odds, mm-hmm. and these, they felt, were admirable traits for the race. Mm. So their problem was to arrange a lasting peace that would stop the race from destroying itself without removing responsible traits. I'll just get a new toothbrush in New York. Very good, very good. All right, Mr. Freeline, now if you could run down the basic rule. Well, anyone who wants to signs up with ECB for a fine legal murder. Then, of course, he has to take his turn a few months later if he survives. The Emotional Catharsis Board picks the victims' names at random. Mm-hmm. A hunter is allowed six months to make his kill. Uh, uh, armament? Uh, oh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's allowed to use a standard caliber pistol. He can wear... No armor. Victim is allowed to wear armor and is allowed to hire spotters. Very good, very good. Now, 
We don't have to go over the penalties for killing or wounding the wrong man. I'm sure you know all that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's a beautiful system, isn't it? All the people who want to kill can, and that's about one-fourth of the population. Those who don't want to don't have to. At least there aren't any more big wars, just uh, hundreds of thousands of small ones. <laughs> All right, Mr. Freeline, you're checked out for orientation. Oh, all the same, I don't exactly like the idea of killing a woman. But she did sign up, didn't she? <laughs> That's right. Uh... Janet Patzig in New York. Well, I'll be taking one of our protect suit specials. Have you seen one of these, Mr. Gale? When I actuate the mechanism, watch how fast the gun springs out at the ready. Oh, excellent. <laughs> it's excellent. Ah, oh, strange, isn't it, Mr. Gale? Each killing is a new excitement. It's, it's something you just don't tire of, like a, a French pastry or women or drinking or anything else. Yeah. Uh, let's see. There. I guess that's it. Now a note for the milkman, and that's about all. Well, I'll be getting along, Mr. Gale. Yeah. Oh, and uh, good hunting, Mr. Freeline. <laughs> Wait, too, Chief. Carlton Hotel. Carlton, you bet. Just get into town? Is it that noticeable? I've been picking up from the airport for maybe ten years. I can spot an out-of-town killer by the way he carries his suitcase. Uh, you wouldn't be working as a spotter, would you? Oh, no, no, no. The hack bureau don't like it. This isn't your first kill, I can tell. Yeah? Yeah, guys on their first kill get too anxious. They want to drive right to the victim's address, walk right into an ambush. I'd say you had maybe five, six... Seven. Seven? Well, you haven't got too long to go before you get into the tens club. You ever been hunting? Nah, I can't afford it. Look, I'll tell you what. If you can just drive me around the Chelsea area, I'd just like to look at the streets. Aha, uh -huh, that's where your victim hangs out, huh? Sure, sure, be glad to. You know what you ought to do, Mac? Hmm? You ought to drop in at the Hunter Hunting Show at the Coliseum. They got everything. Bulletproof vests for victims, hats with bulletproof crowns. I seen an ad for a Malvern straight shot ECB approved. Carried a load of 12 shots with a deviation of less than a thousandth inch per thousand feet. Well, it sounds like a fine gun. And they got all kinds of trick things. You know, canes with four shot magazines, 45 caliber flashlights, all kinds of things. Well, those kind of novelties are all right for the first time, but the, the old fashioned ways are the best. <laughs> Hey, look at that. Somebody got it. Oh, I missed it. And eh, nothing to see now. Mm. In about four minutes, the guys from the Department of Sanitation will carry away the corpse. Yeah. Well, this is the neighborhood, Chief. You want to give me the address? No, no, I'll just drive around. Okay, you're paying a meter. Now, wait a minute. What is it, Chief? There. That sidewalk cafe, you see? Yeah, shall I stop? No, no, just drive slowly. There she is. Sitting at a table. You mean the victim is a dame? Yeah, she's just sitting there. Is she crazy, exposing herself in the open? Boy, that's sure no way to stay healthy. Not when you're a victim. Drive around the block. Okay. Yeah, she looks younger than her pictures. She looks sad. Wonder if she's been notified. Ah, well, she's got to be notified, Chief. They can't send you your notice until her signed receipt gets back to the office. It's automatic. Yeah, that's right. Isn't she even going to try to defend herself? Doesn't look like it. Here we come again. She's still there. <laughs> All I have to do is just ride by in the cab and pump a bullet into her. Okay, Chief, I'll go real slow. Uh, you be sure to allow for the motion of the car. No, no, no. Park across the street. Sure, sure. Both her hands are on top of the table. An easy stationary target. All I gotta do is... Say, that's some gadget. Hey, uh, remember to roll down a window before you shoot that gun, huh? Nah. Nah, it's an easy shot. It's too easy. Uh, look, mister, hurry up, will you? If a cop comes along and finds you shooting out of my cab, he'll give me a ticket for double parking. Nah, 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 it's too easy. 
All my other six kills have been hard. My victims have tried every dodge. One of them hired a dozen spotters. I got them all. I dressed as a milkman. Hey, that's pretty clever. Nah, this wouldn't be a trophy. Here, put your flag up. I'm getting out. Okay. Going over to talk to her. She's your victim. I know, I know. It's too easy this way. Hello? What? Hey, look, uh, if I'm being fresh, just tell me and I'll go. I'm an out-of-towner here on a convention. I'd just like to talk to somebody. If you'd rather I didn't... Oh, I don't care. May I uh, sit down? Uh, like to buy you a drink, if I can? I don't care. My name is Stanton Freeline. I'm Janet. Janet what? Janet Patsick. Well, nice to know you. Uh, are, are you uh, doing anything tonight, Janet? I'm probably being killed tonight. Oh, are, are you a, a victim? You guessed it. If I were you, I'd stay out of the way. No sense getting hit by mistake. Well, you're uh, awfully calm about it. Uh, Don't you care? Haven't you got any spotters? No. Mr. Freeline, I'm a bad, bad girl. I got the idea I'd like to commit a murder, so I signed for ECB. Then I couldn't do it. Oh, I am sorry. But I'm still in, of course, even though I didn't shoot. I still have to be a victim. Well, why don't you hire some spotters? I couldn't kill anyone. I just couldn't. I don't even have a gun. Well, you got a lot of courage coming out in the open this way. What can I do? You can't hide from a hunter, not a real one. I don't have enough money to make a disappearance. Well, since it's your own defense, I should thank no, you. No, no, I've made up my mind about that. This whole thing is wrong, this whole system. When I had my victim in the sights, I saw how easily I could... I could... Oh, let's forget it. I'm glad you talked to me. At least it'll pass the time. It's been a lovely dinner. Just lovely. Bob, I'm glad you liked it. I usually stop at this little place when I'm in New York. Do you come in often? Oh, on business. I'm in clothing, you know. What do you do? Oh, I'm an actress. (laughs) Well, that's a laugh. I'm not really an actress. I'd like to be an actress, but none of the producers seem to see it that way. How old are you? 22. I've only been in New York for a year. Uh, You know, you're... You're really being very foolish just sitting out in the open that way. Why, why, you're a hunter. could come along and just pump a bullet into you. I know, I know, but... Somehow I feel safe with you. Oh, Say, uh, Janet, would you like to go to the gladiatorials with me tonight? We got about 20 minutes. We'd only miss the opening numbers. Well, I suppose so. Might as well, huh? Eat, drink, and be merry. You know, I'm a little disappointed. Why? Oh, I thought the New York gladiatorials would be something special. It's about the same as Cleveland. Historical events, swordsmen and netmen, duels with sabers and foil. Isn't there any difference? Well, the duel to the death is the same in Cleveland as it is in New York. You know, that's funny. I used to think that gladiatorials were very exciting. Now they just make me a little sick. Well, you can get tired of the best of shows. Frankly, I think it was a mistake starting to televise the gladiatorials. It cut down on the box office for one thing, and for another, it just isn't the same as being right there in the stadium, you know? No, no, it isn't. Well, uh, you want to stay for the second half? Let me see. They got, um, hmm, bullfighting, lion fighting, bow and arrow, and dueling on the high wire. No, I've had about enough. All right. Shall I take you home? Would you please? Sit down. I'll fix you a drink. Janet. What? You're crying, aren't you? Oh, no, no, not really. It's just the thought that any minute from anywhere a bullet can come crashing into me. It makes me feel so... so soft and helpless. 
You are soft. Oh, Janet. You, you're leaving New York soon? I suppose so. Convention's only lasting another day. I'll be sorry to see you go. Send roses to my funeral. Janet. What? Janet, I don't want you to be killed. There's not anything you can do about it, is there? Janet, I love you. Oh, Stan. What is it? What is it? Please, please darling, please. But you, you can't. You can't love me. I'm a victim. I won't live long enough to... You won't be killed, Janet. Listen to me, Janet, darling. I'm your hunter. Are you... Are you going to kill me? Don't be ridiculous, darling. I'm going to marry you. Oh, Stan, Stan, my darling... Oh, the waiting. I've been so frightened. It's I... all over. It's all over. Think what a story it'll make for our kids, oh, huh? Oh, darling. How I came to, to murder you and left marrying oh, you. Oh, Stan, kiss me. Oh. Oh, I... I think I'd better have a cigarette. Ah, uh, let's start packing. I, no, I want to wait. Get... You haven't asked if I love you. What? You haven't admired my cigarette lighter. What are you talking about? It's a lovely lighter, isn't it? With a small hole in the bottom, just large enough for a thirty-eight caliber bullet. No, 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 don't, don't, don't. I'm not being funny, darling. But Janet, 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 I love you. I told you, I love you. What's the matter with you? I don't love you, Stanton. <laughs> I am a good actress, aren't I? Even though the producers don't think so. You, you knew all along. Yes, of course. Don't reach for that. Yes, darling. <laughs> well, now I can join the Tens Club. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Once a Greech by Evelyn E. Smith. The mildest of men, Iverson, was capable of murder to disprove Harkaway's hypothesis that in the midst of life, we are in life. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you The Seventh Victim, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Robert Checkley and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast, Lawson Zerby as Freeline, Terry Keene as Janet, his killer, Frank Maxwell as the cab driver, Ian Martin as Emmanuel Gale of the Emotional Catharsis Bureau, Irv West as Freeline Spotter, and Arthur Hughes as his business partner. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Kenneth McGregor and is an NBC Radio Network production. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, The Lights on Precipice Peak by Stephen Tall.
sitting on the porch of the lodge, the three of us, Chuck Evers, Royston, and myself. Chuck was smoking one of those five-for-a-quarter stinkers he affects, but he let it go out as we sat in the darkness, stared across the narrow valley below us, then up again to the mountains of Bighorn Glacier, six miles away and 7,000 feet up in the thin, cold air. There it is. You see? Where? Well, follow my hand. I'll line it up with a tall pine tree on the first ridge. You see? Very small, dull red. It's been up there for about five minutes. I didn't see anything before. You see? Moving along. Well, it seems to be the lip of Bighorn Glacier. Now, give me the binoculars. Yeah. Yeah, it's a glow, all right. Small but definite glow. You want to see it, Royston? Thank you. Well, that's that. You can see it, but still you can't. The glasses didn't pick up any outline. It's still just a glow. Spooks, that's what. Spooks. Spooks? Ah, uh, uh, yes, uh, apparitions. Haunts, hobgoblins, ghosts, banshees. Well, at least these mysterious lights of Precipice Peak make no sound. Are you sure? How do you know that every coyote that you hear is really a coyote? Well, at any rate, if they make sounds, they're sounds of the country. A miserable country. Sir, you are speaking of the land I love. If you don't like it, why stay around? It is supposed to make me a man of vigor with red corpuscles and a need for cold shower baths. Actually, there is nothing wrong with me. I was simply born to sit and watch while great louts like you run and wrestle and climb and sweat. Ha! Ah, there, the, the, the light shows again. Now you can see it with a naked eye. It's higher than it was before. It's moving along. It's going along Fifth Avenue Trail. Spooks don't need a route of ascent even on precipice. All of a sudden, the lights of Precipice Peak are getting solid. Now, I've got a feeling they'll leave a sign. Sign? Ah, yes. Traces. Right. Traces, tracks, spores. The only mystery about those lights is we don't know who makes them. They're getting to be a tourist attraction. Maybe that's a lead. Over the swamps of Louisiana, where I wish I now were, I have seen balls of fire that were drifting. It is swamp gas, methane, slowly oxidizing, gluing. Could this up there on the mountain be something like... Almost impossible. Anyhow, balls of gases wouldn't follow a trail. Those blasted lights do. Well, take it easy, Chuck boy. Tomorrow you can look for yourself, remember? At daybreak, we go up to solve the mystery of the lights. Uh, ghastly. To go out at dawn is as bad as eating raw flesh. But tap on my cabin door as you go by. I will wave to you from the window. <laughs> down the slope from the lodge and across the valley before the sun rose. Chuck and I swung along the trail. It felt good having your nailed mountain boots hitting the ground in regular rhythm. Ahead of me, Chuck set the pace, an easy, loose-jointed shamble that ate up the mountain miles. We were a good team for climbing. I took a deep breath when we crossed the ridge. But at the switchback, Chuck broke his stride and leaned his long frame against a boulder. Well, tonight we'll be up where the lights are. Punch me if you see one first. Lights, nuts. There'll be none while we're on the peak. Five bucks says so. Well, I'm not a rich man, but I love a sporting chance. Here's my five. It's a bet. Where will we put him? Well, uh, here, here. I'll empty this out. I got a tobacco tin. Stick it in here. Okay. Here's my five. All right, we'll, uh, we'll put it under the stone here. Nobody will find it under there. It's off the trail. All right now. If there are lights, it's yours. No lights, it's mine. Right? Right. Going into the world above the trees is one of the good things of a peak climb. Quarry marmots whistled from their rocks. Coney scurried. Graybard ptarmigan crouched almost invisibly among the gaudy alpine fields of mountain sunflowers and tiny forget-me-nots. At dusk, we laid out our bedrolls on a level bit of tundra in the lee of a massive outcrop near Bighorn Glacier. We cooked a kettle of stew and heated the water for tea. Thin Chuck walked away a few paces from the fire to empty the kettle. Ow! What's the matter? Stone turned under me. My ankle. Give me a hand. I got you. Oh, set me down again. <laughs> okay. Now let's take off that boot and the sock. Oh. 
Well, I have a feeling, my friend, that I will not climb that peak in the morning. Get the sock off and let's see how bad it is. Oh. Well, we'll, uh, we'll pack ice on it and tape it in an hour. Maybe it's a simple twist. Well, you know it isn't. <laughs> sure, I know. I thought you wanted to be cheerful, that's all. It's like when I broke three ribs climbing to look into a bird's nest the day before we were tackling the east face of Long Peak. Then you would chin up. Well, that was different. I wasn't hurting. When the stars were out and the quarter moon rose from the plains, I got up from my bedroll seat by the fire. Chuck's ankle was taped and he was easing it before him as best he could. Oh, that's not so bad for a foot. It only hurts when I try to walk on it. Well, I'm going to have a look before we turn in. My five spot says there won't be any lights. But the technical crew may be monkeying around somewhere. Well, take it easy. I'll just skirt along the edge of the glacier. Back in half an hour. You take it easy. I know Bighorn Glacier. Its crevices are so consistent they're shown on maps. I carried an ice axe, but I didn't figure to use it. And I'd worked my way for a number of minutes along the edge of the moonlit ice sheet. I suddenly got the idea that I should cross it. The glacier had a good snow covering. The going was easy... The view was something few men see. I automatically avoided the big ice cracks. I knew where they were. And then I slipped through a snow roof and fell. I wasn't hurt. The moonlight from the crack above showed my ice axe beside me. It was a lucky fall, except for the fact that I couldn't get out again. Time after time, I tried to dig hand and footholds into the splintering ice wall. But I was freezing my fingers, making no headway. Cold was beginning to bite into me. So I settled myself on my heels quietly and tried to decide what to do. That was Chuck beginning to call. I knew if I answered, he'd probably try the ice himself, so I kept quiet. And after a while, he stopped calling. And then, suddenly a dark silhouette showed in the narrow crack of sky above. Are you injured? Well, I'm okay. Just drop me a rope and I can walk up the wall. Mind the snow ledge. I didn't, and look at me. A joke? Here's the rope. <coughs> hey. Hey, what kind of a rope is this? I never saw anything like it. It's warm. Have you got it now? Yep. Yep, here I come. <coughs> Hang on. Hang on. Okay. Over the ledge. Well. Hey. Did you hold that rope in one hand while I was climbing up? Yes. Well, well, thanks. Lucky for me, somebody has sense enough to walk around ice cracks. Shake. Shake? Oh, shake hands. You must not mind the glove. It is for your protection. The hand is not yet cooled. Cooled? What in the world? Your friend with the swollen foot is concerned for you. Come, I have made an easy way. I've climbed mountains up and down the Rockies, but I confess, following this fellow, I felt like a tenderfoot. The man's odd voice and stilted phrases tantalized me, yet I knew they were not entirely strange. There was the question of his hot hand. I dropped back a couple of paces. The man was setting his, his booted feet into a line of holes that had not been on the glacier earlier. I could swear to that. And as we approached the edge of the glacier, I could see him clearly for he was surrounded by a dim red glow which grew brighter with each step. In a few moments, it was as if he were outlined in flame, and I could feel a warmth radiating from him. I wondered why the snow didn't melt under his tread. It's the boots! They insulate! Oh! Oh, oh, I see. Thank you. Hey, you not only light up, but you pick brains. Both good tricks. A joke? I guess so. Only here on Earth are there jokes. We can never be sure about them. We, huh? I thought a gag like this would take cooperation. How many of you boys are in on it? We are 
for? We had left the ice. We were threading along the little ledge that gave onto the boulder field. I noticed that the ruddy glow had faded completely, that the man up ahead was now simply a dark silhouette. We reached the tundra and spotted Chuck's tiny fire. He sat next to it, the tape-wooded ankle eased on a pack sack before him. Well, hello. You took your time. I fell in a crevasse. And I owe you five bucks. Oh? Oh! You should put the more important statement first. But we can take that up later. I see we have company. Oh, yeah, yeah, this... Uh, this is Chuck Evers. Uh, I'm afraid I didn't catch your name. I am called Zell. Zell? Yes. Well, it's different anyway. That is because I am different. He can read your head like a crystal ball. And he lights up like a neon sign. Easy, boy. You slipped on the ice before. Sit down. Let's quit being funny. Let us all sit and I will tell you why I am Zell. I will do it because I know when you repeat my words that you will not be believed. Now, listen. You listen. You came up to climb the peak, but also you came to see what caused the lights. If you had not had misfortune, you would have climbed the peak, but there would have been no lights. We would not have come. Hey, there's a light back up there where we were. You see? That red light on the glacier? Well, yeah. Yeah, moving across. That is Zor. We grew in the same membrane. He is erasing our trail across the ice. Yeah, very smart. We can tell tales down there, but there won't be any proof, huh? That is correct. Chuck Evers, you are wondering about the statement that we grew in the same membrane? Well, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking that... I should have said that we are twins. Holy... You're right, John. It is telepathy. You weren't out of your head. The truth is simple. We have told it before, but no one ever believes. And it has not seemed wise to support our facts. We, Zor and I, with our companions Zim and Zet, are explorers. But we do not explore mountains. Here we rest and allow ourselves to behave normally. We explore in towns and cities where people gather. It is strenuous. We cannot tolerate it for long. Then we must go into seclusion and renew ourselves. Yeah, I know what you mean. Ten days in Denver and I feel like I've been staked with a short rope. i got to get away. Your problems are simply a matter of preference. Ours are physiological. We cannot long maintain metabolic balance in the company of people. Thus, Zim and Zet are now back in the world you inhabit. When they must rest... Then our turn comes. I will show you. This is a rock. You may call it granite. To me, it is food. So. Eat it in good health. Thank you. Among people, this would be conspicuous. You are not adapted to get oxygen from rock. We are. Well, I'll admit that's a tougher cereal than I'd want to try. But the point of the joke still escapes me. There is the matter of my body glow. I can control my body temperature, raising it and lowering it as I choose. The greatest difficulty when I am among you people is to keep myself down to human body heat. Normally, it is much higher than yours. And when, due to exercise and metabolic speed-up, excess energy is accumulated... It is satisfying to us to radiate it. Much as you get released by deep sighs, by long breaths, by stretching your limbs. Unfortunately, when we radiate rapidly in air, we glow. It has made us conspicuous. Yet your unawareness of us is a marvel. For creatures so well supplied with adaptation for sensation... You are indeed blind. You sound like an old professor I had once. I didn't understand him either. Zor is waiting by the glacier. We have plans for this time. When you return to the settlement below, it would perhaps be wisest not to explain the lights. <laughs> We 
We both sat silently beside the dying fire. When we looked up toward the upper reaches of the glacier, two gleaming spots, dull cherry red, moved steadily across the ice. They were visible for brief minutes and slowly faded. To descend Precipice Peak, even if only from Bighorn Glacier, is no fit task for a cripple. Still, we knew it had to be done. So in the early morning, we set about it. Where the going allowed it, I simply backpacked Chuck. We made use of every ledge because Chuck could repel himself down spots he could not climb or be carried. We were both mountain men and tough, but by mid-afternoon, we knew we'd had enough. We were lucky, though. We ran into Heine Cobb, the ranger, heading down trail with two pack horses. We stopped only once, the big switchback. I got down from my horse, pried up a stone, took the tobacco can from under it, and gave it to Chuck without a word. Back at our camp on the lake shore, Chuck and I weren't disturbed by questions. When men fail on the peaks, they tell their own stories in their own time. Chuck's ankles showed quick improvement, and in a couple of days he was hobbling about. Only young Royston came to visit us. You have not been back to the lodge. Perhaps you are afraid to show your faces. People talk your arm off up there. Not many of them have the gall to come snooping around here. You cannot offend me. I was concerned for you. I, I was interested, so I came. Did you see the lights? Nope. Nary a light. I told you they wouldn't show up when anybody was up there. You collected five bucks from me, betting on the other side of the fence. You were the man who was so sure there'd be some sign. I do not understand. You are both confusing everything, and you are both lying. There were lights on the peak when you were there, and I have a feeling you saw them. They were quite a show from here. Well, this is the place to see them from. Closer up, you lose perspective. Well, I must go. Friendship means nothing to you, so I will take my small hike back to the lodge again. Actually, I came to say that tomorrow I leave this miserable place and go home. I've endured all the health I can stand. Now, that's a different story. We're sorry to see you go, fella. My regards to the swamps. Ten to one, when you get there, you'll wish you were back. This I very much doubt. Goodbye, John. Goodbye. Oh, there's a funny fella. Hey, what are you doing? Just feeling the stone step where he sat. I thought so. He really liked us. But this time he was careful not to shake hands. Did you notice? Yeah. In spite of himself, he had reached his limit of control. His temperature is going up. Yeah, I guess it is. He never could see a joke. And remember how he'd say something and then wait as if he didn't understand it? And then all of a sudden it would come to him? He'd wait to pick our brains for every new word. You mean Royston? Royston is a name out of a hat. When that lad really goes home, he'll go with his buddies up there on that peak. I wonder which he is. Zim... Set. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Man in the Jar, the story of Vane who did not bottle live people indiscriminately. He had to have a sound business reason. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you The Lights on Precipice Peak, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Stephen Tall and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Jim Bowles as John Brinkhart, Joseph Helgeson as his fellow climber Chuck Evers, Ted Osborne as Zell, and Court Benson as the man who called himself Royston. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Kenneth McGregor and is an NBC Radio Network production. Countdown for blastoff. X-5, 4, 3... X minus one, fire.
from the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, Protection by Robert Sheckley. <laughs> There will be an airplane crash in Burma next week, but it shouldn't affect me here in New York. And the Feig certainly can't harm me, not with all my closet doors closed. No, the big problem is lessnerizing. I must not lessnerize, absolutely not. As you can imagine, that hampers me. And to top it all, I think I'm catching a very nasty cold. The whole thing, including the cold, started on the evening of November 7th. I was walking down Broadway on my way to Baker's Cafeteria with Charlie Lester. He's in one of my physics classes, and we were both feeling pretty lightheaded. Boy, I've had tough exams in my day, but that was... Uh... <laughs> you got a cold? Uh, no, no, I haven't got a cold. My eyes just water, my nose runs, and I sneeze because I'm essentially a masochist. Actually, it is psychosomatic. I hate my mother and my father. Of course I've got a cold. What do you think? I... <laughs> Well, look, look, don't give it to me. I've got a heavy date with a Barnard Jr. this weekend. My boy, there is no such thing as a heavy date with a Barnard Jr. <laughs> Never mind. Just don't blow any germs my way. Oh, well, as a matter of fact, I'll leave you completely. I have to go over to South Hall to pick up some books. So long. <laughs> At the moment Charlie left me, I had in my pocket five coins, three keys, and a book of matches. Uh, just to complete the picture, let me add that the wind was coming from the northwest at five miles per hour. Venus was in the ascendancy, and the moon decidedly gibbous. <laughs> you can draw your own conclusions from this. I reached the corner of 114th Street and began to cross. The truck! Watch out for the truck! Watch out! Huh? What truck? Who? What? Well, there's no truck on the street. What? Oh! Who? Oh, oh! Well, thanks, friend. If you hadn't warned me, I'd. Uh... Hey, hey! Where are you? Who said that to me? Where are you? Can you still hear me? Well, sure I can. Where are you? There isn't anybody here. Where are you? Gronish. Is that the referent? Refraction index. Creature of insubstantiality. The shadow knows. Did I pick the right one? What you? You're invisible. That's it. That's it. That's it. I knew the concept was somewhere in you. Well, I will. Well, well, what are you? A Valadusian derg. A valid... A, a what? I am... Uh, uh, would you mind opening your larynx a little wider, please? You see, I am using your sub-vocalizations to communicate. Now, breathe deeply. That's it. That's it. Ah, oh, that's better. Well, let's see now. I am the spirit of Christmas past, a creature from the Black Lagoon, the bride of Frankenstein. Now, wait, oh, hold the, uh, on. What are you trying to tell me, that you're a ghost or a creature from another planet? Same thing, obviously. Oh, well, that makes it all perfectly clear. Any fool can see that a disembodied voice must belong to someone from another planet. Exactly. I'm invisible on Earth, but my superior senses spotted approaching danger and warned you of it. Well, thanks. <laughs> thanks anyway about that. Well, what are you, one of those strange voices that warns Aunt Minnie to stay out of the elevator? Which then crashes to the basement? Something like that. <laughs> well, goodbye. What's the matter? Well, not a thing, except that I seem to be standing in the middle of 114th Street talking to an invisible alien from the farthest reaches of outer space. I suppose only I can hear you. Well, naturally. Oh, great. Well, you know where this sort of thing will land me. The concept you are sub-vocalizing is not entirely clear. Now, look, please, go back to one of my childhood traumas where you came from and let me alone. Uh, thanks for the warning about the truck. Good night. Where are you going? I am going to a saloon down the street, much frequented by Columbia students. Won't you talk with me? Look, please, will you cut it out? There are two girls watching me now. But you must talk to me. The real subvocal contact is very rare and astonishingly difficult. Sometimes I can get across a warning just before a dangerous moment. 
But then the connection fades. You mean that is the explanation of premonitions of danger? That's right. Conditions might not be right for this kind of contact for another hundred years. Uh, Look, this is very interesting stuff for Professor Ryan at North Carolina, not for the physics department at Columbia. I have heard statistics about the overcrowding of mental hospitals, and uh, I am not interested in contributing to that condition. Besides, there's a cop looking at me. I appreciate your social situation, but this contact with me is in your own best interest. I want to protect you from the myriad dangers of human existence. Get lost. Well, I can't force you. I'll just have to offer my services elsewhere. Goodbye, friend. Uh, Goodbye. Oh, just one last thing. Stay off subways tomorrow between noon and 1.15 p.m. Mm -hmm. Why? Someone will be killed at Columbus Circle, pushed in front of a train by shopping crowds. You, if you're there. Goodbye. No, what, what, someone will be killed there tomorrow? Are you sure? Of course. It'll be in the newspapers? I should imagine so. And you know all sorts of stuff like that? I can perceive all the dangers that radiate toward you and extend into time. My one desire was to protect you from them. Oh. Well, uh... Look, will you wait till tomorrow evening? Those two girls are giggling now. You will let me be your protector? I'll tell you tomorrow after I read the late papers. The item was there, all right. I read it in my furnished room at 113th Street. Man pushed by the crowd, lost his balance, fell in front of an oncoming train. Well, this gave me a lot to think about while I waited for my invisible protector to show up. By the time he contacted me, I didn't know that I liked the whole idea. Don't you trust me? I just want to lead a normal life. If you lead any life at all. That truck last night? That was a freak. A -a once-in-a-lifetime hazard. It only takes once-in-a-lifetime to die. There was the subway, too. No, well, that doesn't count. I hadn't planned on riding it today. But you had no reason not to ride it. That's the important thing. Just as you have no reason not to take a shower in the next hour. Why shouldn't I? A Miss Flynn who lives down the hall is now taking her shower and will leave a melting bar of pink soap on the pink tile of the bathroom floor. You would have slipped on it and suffered a sprained wrist. Uh, Not fatal, huh? No. Hardly in the same class with, uh, let us say... A heavy flower pot pushed from a rooftop by a certain unstable old gentleman. Well, um, when is that going to happen? I thought you weren't interested. I am very interested. When? Where? Will you let me continue to protect you? Well, now, just tell me one thing. What's in this for you? Satisfaction. For a Valadusian derg, the greatest thrill possible is to help another creature evade danger. But isn't there something else you want out of this? Some trifle like my soul or rulership of the earth? Nothing. To accept payment for protection would ruin the emotional experience. All I want out of life, all any derg wants, is to protect someone from the dangers he cannot see, but which we can see all too well. We don't even expect gratitude. Hmm... What about the flower pot? It'll be dropped at the corner of 10th Street and McAdams Boulevard at 10.30 tomorrow morning. Uh, 10th and McAdams. Where's that? In Jersey City. Well, I've never been to Jersey City in my life. Why warn me about that? I don't know where you will or won't go. I merely perceive dangers to you wherever they may occur. What should I do now? Anything you wish. Just lead your normal life. started out well enough. I attended classes at Columbia, did homework, saw movies, went on dates, played table tennis and chess all as before. At no time did I let on that I was under the protection of a Valadusian derg. (laughs) Even Charlie didn't notice it, though he had a pretty good excuse. Boy, are you lucky. I got stuck in that elevator for four hours. Say, how come you walked? I never saw you volunteer to walk five flights before. Uh Oh, well... A little bird told me. Oh, boy, I wish I... I wish I had a little bird like that. Why don't you do something for that cold? Why should I? What's it ever done for me? Not even the derg had warned me about Charlie's bad jokes in time. But he did his best. And once or twice a day, he'd come around and report. 
Loose grating on West End Avenue between 66 and 67th Streets. Don't walk on it. Of course, I wouldn't. Once I got used to it, it gave me quite a feeling of security. But the Derg soon became overzealous on my behalf. He began finding more and more dangers. Look out for an overhanging sign on the Hotel National. Where? 48th Street? Mexico City. Don't go to the hockey game tonight. Where? At Toronto. Look out for the Elm Street bus. Philadelphia? Omaha. Don't go surf riding today. What? Uh, surf riding? Where? Papiti. Now, just wait a minute. Do you plan on reporting every potential danger on Earth? Oh, these are only a few, only a very few that you may be affected by. In Mexico City, in Papiti, why not confine yourself to the local picture? Greater New York, let's say. Locale means nothing to me. I must protect you from everything. Well, it was rather touching in a way. And there was nothing I could do about it. I simply had to discard from his reports the various dangers in places like Hoboken, Thailand, Kansas City, Angervat, Sarasota, and Paris. I concentrated pretty much on Manhattan. He did save me from a pretty nasty holdup on Cathedral Parkway and a four-alarm fire. But he kept stepping up the pace. Tainted food in Baker's Cafeteria. Don't eat there tonight. Amsterdam Bus 312 has bad brakes. Don't ride it. Mellon's Tailor Shop has a leaking gas line. Explosion due. Have your clothes dry cleaned elsewhere. Rabbit mongrel on prowl between Riverside Drive and Central Park West. Take a taxi. Soon, I was spending most of my time not doing things and avoiding places. Danger seemed to be lurking behind every lamppost waiting for me. I rather suspected the derg of padding his report. All my reports are perfectly genuine. If you don't believe me, try turning on your lights in the psychology class tomorrow. Why? Defective wiring. Look, I don't doubt your warnings. I just don't think life was this dangerous before you came along. Well, of course it wasn't. Surely you know that if you accept protection, you must accept the drawbacks of protection as well. Drawbacks like what? <laughs> protection begets the need of further protection. That is a universal constant. Before you met me, you were like everyone else, and you ran into such risks as the situation offered. But with my coming... Your immediate environment has changed, and your position in it has changed, too. Why? Because it has me in it. It is well known that the avoidance of one danger opens the path to others. Are you trying to tell me that my risks have increased because of your help? It was unavoidable. Why, you miserable extraterrestrial con man. Now, look... All right, all right. Thanks for everything. <laughs> I'll see you on Mars or wherever you hang out. You... Don't want any further protection? You guessed it. Don't slam the door on your way out. But what's wrong? Your risks have increased, but my capacity for detection is more than ample to cope with it. I'm happy to cope with it. So it still represents a net gain in protection for you. Yeah, I know what happens next. My risks just keep on increasing, don't they? Not at all. As far as accidents are concerned, you have reached the quantitative limit. The... What does that mean? It means that there will be no further increase in the number of accidents you must avoid. Look, if you leave me alone, my original environment will return, won't it? And with it, my original risks? Eventually. If you survive. Fine, I'll take that chance. You cannot afford to send me away tomorrow. No, 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 no. don't tell me. I'll avoid the accidents on my own. I wasn't thinking of accidents. What then? I... I hardly know how to tell you. A gamper is after you. Oh, a gamp... A what? Now, what kind of a gag is this? A gamper is a creature from my environment. Hmm. I suppose he was attracted by your increased potentiality for avoiding risk due to my protection. Now, look, you can take your gamper... If he you... comes, try driving him off with mistletoe. Uh, iron is often effective if bonded to copper Will you also. get out of here? Are you sure? Beat it. Blow. Scram. Get out. Go on. All right. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye. Are you gone? Are you really gone? <sighs> Good riddance. What, what's that? Derg, is that you? Hey, your motor's running. Derg? What is it? What is that? What is that? Oh, it's the gamper. Derg, get me out of this. Derg! Derg, get me out! Derg, come back! Derg! Did you call? Oh, the 
the gamper. Uh, mistletoe, mistletoe, wave it at the gamper. Where in blazes am I going to get mistletoe? Iron copper, then. Copper, copper. But, oh, I've got a paperweight on my desk. The chair leg is iron. Touch it with the copper. Quick! <laughs> You see? You need my protection. The gamper almost got you. Yes. Yes, it sure did. Yeah, you'll need some things. Uh, wolfbane, amaranth, garlic, graveyard mold. But, but, but the gamper is gone. Yes, yes. However, the grailers remain, and you'll need safeguard against the leaps, the figs, and the melgarizer. I'll give you a list. <laughs> gave me a list and I went shopping. I uh, ran into Charlie at the supermarket. Hey, Bob, where you been? Wolfbane, amaranth, garlic, garlic. They must have garlic. Well, sure, they got garlic over here. Uh, 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 uh. Well, I guess you know what I came in for. Uh, tissues. What else? <laughs> yeah, well, now let me see. Uh. Uh, graveyard mold, graveyard mold. You think they'd have it here? Hey, boy, what's the matter with you? You look white as a ghost. I'm white as a gamper, or a grailer, or a leap, or a fig. Well, what is that, jive talk? Please, please, Charlie, don't bother me. I'm busy. All right. <laughs> Who has the nearest graveyard that would be moldy this time of year? It was a game between these extraterrestrials, and I was in it. Some of them wanted to kill me, some to protect me. None of them cared for me, not even the Dirk. And the situation was all my fault. At the beginning, I had had the accumulated wisdom of the human race at my disposal. That tremendous and distinctive hatred of witches and ghosts, the irrational fear of alien life. For my adventure has been played out a thousand times. And the story is told again and again. How a man dabbles in strange arts and summons up a spirit. By so doing, he attracts attention to himself. The worst thing of all. So I was welded inseparably to the Derg, and the Derg to me. Until yesterday, that is. Charlie came to my room to visit. Hey, boy, how you been? I haven't seen you in class for a while. I... <laughs> oh, you mind if I hang up my coat? No, 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 don't. No, don't open the closet door. Well, what's the matter? What's in there? Nothing, nothing. Only that's the only way to hold off the thieves by keeping closet doors closed. The, the leaps are more menacing, but the eye of a toad seems to stop them. And uh, the melgarizer is dangerous only in the full of the moon. Only in the... Uh-huh. Well, Bob, it's been grand. Bye. <laughs> You are in danger. What? Who? What again? What is it this time? It is the Thrang who pursues us. Us? Yes. Yes, myself as well as you. For even the Derg must run from risk and danger. Well, is this Thrang particularly dangerous? Oh, very. Well, what do I do? Snakeskin over the door? A pentagon? Burn incense? Anything? None of these. The Thrang must be dealt with negatively by the avoidance of certain actions. All right, all right. What shouldn't I do? You must not lessnerize. I must... Lesnerize? What's that? Well, surely you know it's a simple, everyday human action. Well, I probably know it under a different name. Explain. Very well. To lesnerize is to... What? It is here. The Thrang. The Thrang is here. Dirk. Dirk, where are you? What should I do? This has me. What should I do? Has me. I'm going. The Thrang. Don't lesnerize. So I'm sitting tight now. There'll be an airplane crash in Burma next week, but it shouldn't affect me here in New York. And the Feig certainly can't harm me. No, not with all my closet doors closed. No, the problem is lessnerizing. I must not lessnerize, absolutely not. If I can keep from lessnerizing, everything will pass and the chase will move elsewhere. It must. All I have to do is wait them out. Trouble is, I don't have any idea what lessnerizing might be. A common human action, the Derg said. Well, at the moment, I'm avoiding as many actions as possible. I've caught up on some back sleep, and nothing's happened. So that's not lesnerizing. I went out and bought food, cooked it, and ate it. That wasn't lesnerizing. I'm telling you the story. And that isn't lesnerizing. <laughs> I'll get out of this yet. I will get out of it. I'm going to catch a nap now. I think I've caught Charlie's cold. 
I think I'm going to have to... You have been listening to Protection by Robert Checkley on X-1. X-1 is presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Survival Kit by Frederick Pohl. The story of Mooney, a smart but luckless man who had to scrounge while his friend Harse always made out well, just because he owned a survival kit. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you Protection, a story from the pages of Galaxy, written by Robert Sheckley and adapted for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in our cast were William Redfield as Bob of the final and fatal sneeze, Elliot Reed as his breezy pal Charlie, and William Keene as the foreseeing Dirk. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Kenneth McGregor and is an NBC Radio Network production. Blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could-be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents... X minus one... Tonight, At the Post by H.L. Gold. When I come into the Blue Ribbon on 49th Street west of Broadway, I could tell right away nobody told Doc Hawkins about my misfortune. Doc, uh, who ain't one really, writes a daily medical column for the racing form and we're celebrating his being sprung from the alcoholic war. He got one look at me, and he choked on a piece of gefilte fish. <laughs> what happened? What happened? Look at that. Clockers become a character. Now, lay off, Doc. Look at that. A gray flannel suit, a black tie. Clocker, where is your purple and green check sports jacket? Where are your two-tone suede shoes? Why, you've become a character. That was Zelda's idea. She wanted to make a gentleman out of him. Wanted to? Why, you two kids got married just before they took... Uh, my snakes away. Don't tell me you've, uh, flipped already. You don't know, Doc? No. What happened? Well, it was right after you tried to take the warts off the fire hydrant that Zelda started hearing voices. It got real bad. How bad? Well, she's at Glendale Center upstate. I just came back from visiting her. Well, did the, uh, psychiatrist give you a diagnosis? Yeah, I got it memorized. Catatonia dementia precox. Oh, rough. Very rough. The outlook is never good in such cases. Maybe they can't help her, but I will. Now, Clocker, you're a race handicapper. You run the best tip sheet on Broadway. But people are not horses. You've got to think of your public. Uh, For instance, what's good at Hialeah, huh? My bar bill is about to be foreclosed, and I can use a long shot. Those couch artists don't know what's wrong with Zelda. I do. You do? Well, almost. I'm so close I can hear the finish line camera clicking. Now, that's very interesting. Uh, Perhaps we can collaborate on an article for the uh, psychiatric journal. All right, look. Look at these charts. Look, here, here. 
Huh? I use the same system I used to dope the races. Look, Zelda's got catatonia. She used to be a hoofer before we got married, and now she does time steps all day. Stereotype movements are typical of catatonia. You don't get it. She does time steps. The first thing you learn in hoofing, over and over. Ten or fifteen hours a day. And she keeps talking like she's giving lessons to some jerk kid who can't get it straight. And I hear when these catatonics pull out, they don't remember much or maybe nothing. Protective amnesia. They work harder and longer at what they're doing than they ever did when they were regular citizens. And they don't get a red cent for it. I beg your pardon? I said they were getting stiff. Anybody who works that hard ought to get paid. I uh, don't understand what you're getting at. What are they knocking themselves out for if it's for free? Doc, I tell you, I missed that mouse. I gotta save her. She can't see or hear us, but she can sure see or hear something. And I'm gonna dope her. Parker, it's too much for you. Too much for me, huh? Who was it said Warlock had turned into a dog in his third year? Who was it had seven winners the opening day at Belmont? You take my word for it, Doc. I'll beat the schizophrenia handicap. <laughs> I hadn't been paying much attention to my tip sheet while I was doping a catatonia dodge. I tell you, I missed Zelda. I missed the bobby pins on the floor and the nylon stuck on a shower rack, the toothpaste tube squeezed from the top. I had to get her back somehow. Next day, I took a cab and went out to that place. I sat in the room and watched her dance. Oh, it was something. Because Zelda was worth watching, even with her eyes blank and her feet shuffling through that simple time step. Mr. Locke, visiting time is almost up. All right, all right. Zelda, listen, Zelda. How long can they take to learn a time step? She can't hear you. Look, kid, I don't know who these squares are that you're working for, but tell them if they take you, they got to take me too, you hear? I had an idea now. I had a dope that Zelda was showing them how to dance, whoever they are. And the only way I could spring her was to find out who was controlling her and what they were after. The first step was to get him interested in me and what I know about racing, doping horses. So I stood there next to Zelda and I started to talk. Now, the first thing you got to figure is bloodlines. You take a horse, you got to know back maybe four or five generations on both sides. Then you got to know where the coat was full, what time of year, because all horses are one year old on the first of January. And there's confirmation, training. You take a horse with good bloodlines, break him in in the spring on a hard training surface track, and the first thing you know, you got a horse with a shin splint. Oh, they may cover it up, but if you know what's there. Lock, I once knew a horse ran in Hialeah who was hey, scared of flamingos. What are you doing? Had a fine record at Gulfstream and Bowie. But when he got down to Hialeah and got one look at the flamingos, he wouldn't run for beans. Mr. Locke, are you all right? Shut up, I'm Mr. busy. Locke. You bet on a horse that's scared of flamingos at Hialeah and you're going to come in with your tail between your legs. coming back every day. I'd just sit there next to Zelda while she did a time step, and I'd talk about horses over and over. And then finally, finally, I started to hear voices. Flocker! Flocker! This way, Clocker, come this way. This way, Clocker. Come on now. Come with me. Like it was a fog, I could see the attendant in his white coat asking me questions, and I couldn't hear him. I knew I just kept on talking about the horses. And then suddenly I wasn't there. I was somewhere else. I was in a big square, and the buildings looked like the new Roosevelt Raceway, all modern. Or maybe like the World's Fair. There were trees and statues, and there were hundreds of people standing around, and they all looked scared. There was a little man with bifocals and a vest with pins and needles in it standing next to me. He looked scared. But I knew it had worked. I was on my way to Zelda. How did I get here? Excuse me, mister. How did I get here? I don't know. I can't take time for pleasure trips. I've got a customer coming in tomorrow for a fitting. She'll positively murder me if her dress isn't ready. She can't murder you. Not anymore. You mean we're dead? Don't ask me, but uh, I don't think you're dead. That much I can tell you. Some of the people in the crowd were complaining they had families to take care of, while others were worried about leaving their businesses. And they all grew quiet when a man climbed up on a big platform in front. He was a very tall and dignified guy, and he had formal clothes 
and a white beard like the chief mourner at a politician's funeral. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, please feel at ease. You are not in any danger. No harm will come to you. If you will listen carefully to this orientation lecture, you will know where you are and why. What is it? I don't, I don't understand. It's a pitch. Friends, I know you are puzzled at all this. Now, let me explain. You've been chosen, yes, carefully screened and selected, to help us in what is undoubtedly the greatest cause of all history. You will learn more about it as we work together in this vast and noble experiment. What experiment? What is it? I got it picked. This is a pitch. These guys are out for something. Smells like a con. Let me state this in its simplest terms. Now, you know that there are billions of stars in the universe and that the stars have planets. A good many of these planets are inhabited. In almost all instances, the dominant form of life is quite different from yours. I am not of your planet or solar system. I am not formed as you see me. My true appearance would seem to be rather confusing to human eyes. Nuts, get to the point. The truth is, we are not here. And neither are you. Here is a projection of thought. A hypothetical point in space. A place that exists only by mental force. Actually, our bodies are on our own respective planets. What's he saying? What does he mean? Wait, he'll give us the convincer after the build-up. Our civilization is considerably older than yours. For many of your centuries, we have explored the universe both physically and telepathically. And during this exploration, we discovered your planet. We tried to establish communication, but there were grave difficulties. And it was the time of your dark ages. And I'm sorry to report that those people we did make contact with were generally burned at the stake. Here it comes. He's getting ready to slip us the sting. Oh, I don't think you ought to say a thing like that about a fine, decent gentleman. He's obviously very sincere. The problem we face is that the human race is doomed. The history of your race is a record of incessant wars, each more devastating than the last. And now, finally, man has chained the power of worldwide destruction. The next war, or the one after that, will unquestionably be the end, not only of civilization, but of humanity, perhaps even of your entire planet. Then, why have we brought you here? Because man, in spite of his suicidal blunders, is a magnificent race. He must not vanish without leaving a complete record of his achievements. Now, this is the task we must work together on. Each of you has a skill, a talent, a special knowledge we need for the immense record we're compiling. Every area of human society must be covered. And so we need you urgently. Your data will become part of an imperishable social document that shall exist untold eons after mankind has vanished. Oh, he had a slick con. He had that crowd in the palm of his hand like a small-time grifter selling pearl necklaces on 6th Avenue. They all cheered. They were all flattered to think that they were joining in this vast project to make a record of the human race. After a while, they broke us up into divisions, and I got herded into a building marked Sports and Rackets. They took my name and my occupation like I was applying for unemployment insurance. Now, here's our problem, Mr. Locke. We're making two kinds of perpetual records. One is written, more precisely, microscribed. The other is a wonderfully exact duplicate of your cerebral pattern. In more durable material than brain matter, of course. Of course. The uh, substance we use in place of brain cells absorbs memory quite slowly. But you'll be happy to know that the impression once made can never be lost or erased. Delighted. Tickled to pieces. I knew you would be. Well, let's proceed, shall we? First, a basic description of horse racing. <laughs> I started telling them about horse racing, but they held me down to one sentence. They said I had to repeat it over and over so that that recording thing could get it. 
They had a picture of my body back on Earth lying in a bed in a hospital just saying that one sentence over and over again. Well, that's enough for today. Isn't it amazing? We have a more detailed record of human society than man himself ever had. Your life, my life, the life of this uh, uh, Zelda whom you came here to rescue, all are trivial. For we must all die eventually. But the project, the project will last eternally. You're telling me you know what I'm here for? To secure the return of your wife. I would naturally be aware that you'd submitted yourself to our control voluntarily. It was in your file that was sent to me by admissions. Then why did you let me in? Because, my dear friend, we also... Well, Lick, leave out the friend pitch. I'm here on business. As you wish. We let you in, as you express it, because you have knowledge that we should include in our archives. We hoped you'd recognize the merit and scope of our undertaking. Most people do, once they're told. Zelda, too? Oh, yes. Yes, Zelda's extremely cooperative, quite convinced. Would you like to see her? Yeah, sure I would. Well, that can be arranged. I'll call the arts and entertainment section and uh, arrange a meeting. Zelda, Zelda, baby. Clocker. Let's get out of here. Oh, hello, Clocker. Aren't you glad to see me? I spent months and shot every dime I've got just to find you. For sure I'm glad to see you, hon, but I can't waste any time. This work is so important. I want to talk to you. That con artist with a white beard Oh, said... isn't he wonderful, Clocker? Aren't they all wonderful? Regular scientists devoting their whole lives to this terrific cause. What's so wonderful about that? They could let the earth go boom. It wouldn't mean a thing to them. Everybody wiped out, just like there never were any people. Not even as much record of us as the dinosaurs. Gee, wouldn't that make you feel simply awful? I wouldn't feel a thing. All I'm worried about is us, baby. Who cares about the rest of the world doing a disappearing act? I do, and so do they. They aren't selfish like some people I could mention. Selfish? You're darn right I am. Zelda, listen. I'm selfish because I got a wife and I'm nuts about her and I want her back. I have to help out on this project. It's the least I can do for history. History? What did history ever do for us? Go turn in your time card, baby. Tell them you got a date with me back on Earth. No, this is my job as much as theirs. More even. They don't keep anybody here against their will. I'm staying because I want to, Clocker. But, honey... Excuse me, I've got to get back. I'm teaching them the soft shoe now. Are you satisfied now, Mr. Locke? Listen, take away the doom push and this racket falls. Listen, suppose you're all square. Suppose you're leveling. You're knocking yourself out because your guess is we're going to commit suicide. But is there any doubt of it? Do you honestly believe the Holocaust can be averted? I think it can be stopped, yeah. Listen, between these catatonics and me, we could tell them what it's all about. I notice you've got people from all over the world here. They get along fine because they have a job to do and don't have time to hate each other. Well, it could be like that back on Earth. Mr. Locke, we have experimented in the manner you suggest... But a human psychological mechanism defeated us. Yeah? What was that? Protective amnesia. They completely and absolutely forgot everything they'd learned here. Well, what are the odds on me remember? Well, you are our first volunteer. Look, I'll give you a deal. You let me out, and maybe I'll be the first case that didn't get amnesia. And I can tell the world all about this. I'll come back if I lay out. You can pick me up any time you want. If I make headway, you got to let Zelda go, too. That's a very reasonable proposition. We'll lift our control, Mr. Locke, for a suitable time. If you can arouse a measurable opposition to racial suicide, measurable, mind you, then we agree to release your wife and revise our policy completely. <laughs> took me about two weeks to convince them that I was all right again. But I had to convince the world that they were throwing a race and that they needed a saliva test. So I started to write it all out in my tip sheet, in and around the horses. Around that time, I ran in the dark. Clocker, my boy, you've no idea how anxious we were about you. But you're looking fit, I'm glad to say. Thanks. I wish I could say the same about you and the rest of the world. No need to worry about us. We'll muddle along somehow. You think so, huh? I'm glad to see you've got your tip sheet going again. As long as the bobtails run, who cares what happens to anything else? (laughs) 
course, nobody'd listen to me. I had posters printed telling everybody. I hired sandwich men to walk through the city. I made speeches in Columbus Circle. I told everybody doomsday was near. I sent letters to Congress, to the UN editors of newspapers. Nobody paid any attention. I sneaked into the balcony of the General Assembly and tried to shout a speech, and they threw me out, very politely. I wrote the whole thing up for a magazine, and they printed it and sent me a check and told me if I had any more fiction, they'd be glad to run it. They kept trying to tell everybody the truth about the catatonics. We ought to go to the hospitals and get ourselves let in and have the aliens take over and show us where we're going. But nobody would listen. And then finally, I went back out to Glendale. Oh, Mr. Locke, we were wondering when you'd come visit your wife. You've been away? I want my old room back. But you're perfectly normal. Give me half hour alone and uh, you'll be glad to give me my room. Well, here I am back again. Oh, Mr. Locke. Okay, I'll give you all the rest of the dope on racing. You won't have any trouble with me. Then you're convinced you failed. I'm no dummy. I know when I'm licked. So do we, Mr. Locke. Naturally, you have no way of detecting the effect you've had. We do. The result is that because of your experiment, we're gladly revising our policy. Huh? Is this a rib? Nobody listened to me. Oh, but they did. Visits to catatonics have increased considerably. When the visitors are alone with our human associates, they tentatively follow the directions you gave them in your article. Not all do, to be sure. Only those who feel as strongly about being with their loved ones as you do about your wife. We've uh, accepted four voluntary applicants. You mean I made it? That's right. Before long, we shall have to increase our staff as the numbers of voluntary applicants increases geometrically, and then we'll be able to release the first group to go back and carry the message. Whenever you care to, Mr. Locke, you and your wife are free to leave. Okay, okay, but I'll tell you what. I owe you plenty. I'll help make that record before I go. I'll teach you how to dope the horses. Is that what you want? Why, yes. All right, then let's go. The quicker we get started, the quicker we can get back. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features... A Touch of E-Flat by Joe Gibson. A story with a warning. Never let anyone point any weapon at you. Even something as harmless looking as a water pistol. It may be a cooling gun. Galaxy Magazine on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you At the Post. A story from the pages of Galaxy written by H.L. Gold and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in our cast were Frank Maxwell as the clocker, Ann Thomas as his time-stepping and wife, Zelda, Arnold Moss as the otherworldly one, John Griggs as the doc who wasn't one, really, and Sam Raskin as the confused little tailor with his mouth full of pins. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Kenneth McGregor and is an NBC Radio Network production. Down for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one.
Tonight, an original story by Ernest Canoy. The time, early in the 21st century. The story, Martian Sam. The whole thing started the first day of spring training. I'd gotten into camp two or three days before and started to loosen up a little. Because at my age, even batting fungos to an outfielder can tie your muscles up into knots. Although, as a matter of fact, I'd bet that I was in better condition than half the Humpty Dumpties on the club. We hadn't won a pennant since, uh, let's see, 1997 or was it 98? And it looked like we had a permanent lease on 12th place. The Los Angeles Dodgers were in pretty sad shape, and that's the honest truth. I was standing behind the batting cage watching a couple of kids from our Tokyo farm team when Tommy Watson from the New York Times Tribune News caught me by the elbow. Hi, Joe. Well, how does it look this spring? Well, Tommy, the club has been considerably improved. Mm -hmm. Several of the youngsters are ready to deliver this year, and, of course, we expect sterling performances from our veterans. Is that what you want? Oh, come on now, Joe. Come off it. Has old man Castle loosened up enough to buy a catcher? Not that I know of. How about a left-handed pitcher? Well, they're those two boys from Tokyo. Oh, come on. They couldn't throw a cream puff across the dining room table. Well, how does it feel to be first base coach for a team that'll clinch last place by July 4th? You're very kind, Tommy. Very kind. I just hate to see that old tightwad castle run this club into the ground. I remember my father used to tell me about the times way back, when they were still in Brooklyn. <laughs> and I can remember going down to Robinson Stadium when I was a kid to watch doubleheaders with the Denver Giants. Now look at them. A bunch of overage bums and a few kids who could hardly make the high school team. And all Castle's money goes to buy sports rockets for that screwball son of his. Oh, Joe, baseball isn't what it used to be. The sad truth of the matter was that Tommy was putting it mild. Old man Castle, the owner, begrudged every nickel that was spent on the ball club. I don't think anybody had gotten a raise in the last five years. The manager was old Rabbit Cinadella. And Castle used to issue statements every year about how he had great faith in him. The truth of the matter was that Rabbit would work for less than any other manager this side of the Sally League. You'll see what I mean when I tell you that the club traveled in an old Ford Jet Strato rocket, like some barnstorming semi-pro team. I was in the locker room looking down at my feet to avoid looking around at what passed for ball players on this Los Angeles Dodgers when Rabbit came up to me. Joe. Yeah. Get your pants on to come into the office. Oh, what's the matter? Never mind. Come on. Okay. Listen, Rabbit. What are we going to do about a left-handed pitcher? Later, later. Joe, I had an idea. I thought we could take one of the right-handers and sew the letter backwards across his shirt, and maybe that would fool the other club. Yeah. Come on inside. Or maybe we had a disguise Iron Mike, the batting practice robot. All right. Huh? That's enough. Joe, the old man's dead. What? I said he's dead. Old man Castle. Heart attack. I figured we had him scared so he'd loosen up a little dough for players, and then he goes and does this to us. Can't trust nobody. Well, who gets the club? His son. What, you mean Whistling Willie Castle, the jet stream playboy? That's who. But he doesn't know anything about a ball he club. He doesn't have to. Old man Castle owns 72% of the stock. And it all goes to Willie. Well, what's going to happen? Beats me. Probably sell us all out and buy a new rocket. Is he here? It was in the Earth Moon small boat race when it happened. Mm. They got a message to him when he hit the direct beam off Lunar Port. He could have landed and taken the shuttle back and made it in one day. But he was leading in the race, so he just kept going. He's due in a couple hours. You think you can get him to go for a left handed pitcher? I don't know. But we'll have to try. <laughs> Of course, you've heard of Willie Castle. About once a year, he cracks up some expensive sports rocket or gets himself picked up in a survival suit by the IP floating somewhere in an orbit around the moon. He almost got put away a couple of years ago when he took a debutante up in a Harrison Kilgore cruiser and kept her in orbit for two months. The old man was able to kill the abduction charges by claiming that they'd been married at the time. And one time when the old man had a couple of us up at the lodge he lives in during spring training, I saw the kid's room. It was filled with marak heads that he'd shot on safaris on Mars. He came down to the training camp a week later. He buzzed over in a Harley Donaldson atmospheric and set the ship down in the hole between second and third, burning out half the infield. 
I saw a rabbit get him to one side and start talking fast, so uh, I sneaked over and listened. Well, Mr. Cassidy, of course you know we're all very sorry about your father's death. And he you... had it coming, the old tightwad. Oh, well, uh, I see. I couldn't convince him that a credit isn't any good to you, stuffed in a mattress. You got a spend, isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, it is. As a matter of fact, that's what I wanted to see you about. Now, there's a boy in one of the Milwaukee farm clubs, a left-handed pitcher. I can get him for about 30000 and a couple of players. And what do we... you mean? Well, I mean, you're absolutely right, Mr. Castle. You've got to spend money. And if we could get a little help in pitching and maybe an outfielder or two... You mean spend money for baseball players? Well, yeah. That was what I had in mind. Now, wait a minute. This baseball team was my father's hobby, like some old men collect stamps or play checkers. Now, in the terms of the will, I can't sell it. But I'm sure not going to throw any good money away on something foolish like baseball players. Oh, oh I see. As a matter of fact, I'm going to need all the cash I can lay my hands on. Yeah? Yeah. I've got a chance to buy a three-pile nuclear eraser that'll cut two weeks off the round trip to Mars. Oh, I see. You wouldn't want to spend money on anything as foolish as ball players. That's it. You've got the idea now. Oh, by the way, Mr. Cinadilla. Yeah? I find it's quite embarrassing to me to have my friends continually make fun of me because the Dodgers are in last place. Well, as a matter of fact, that gets to be a touchy point with me, too. Well, I'd like to see it change. So, if you don't mind, would you please have them somewhere in a more respectable position? Say, third or second, within a month or two? Now, look here, Mr. Castle. I can't make bricks without straw. You won't spend the credit for a ball player, and I can't... You do your best. Hmm? Hmm? Well, after that interview with the new owner, Rabbit went out and tied one on. And I had to run the ball club for two days till we got him straightened out. But I can't say as I blamed him. We won one game in the Grapefruit League. We played the Jacksonville High School team and squeaked out a 13-12 to victory. Or what the Yankees and Braves did to us, I'd rather not say. We opened the season at home and a mediocre pitcher for Pittsburgh threw a no-hitter at us. Actually, that's not quite accurate. The truth is he just pitched and we didn't hit anything. We lost 10 straight from opening day and we didn't lose on the 11th day because it rained. Rabbit and me piled into his 97 copter and flew out to the castle estate up near Arrowhead. I was in pretty bad shape. For one thing, Rabbit's copter has a wobble and I was feeling green around the gills by the time we dropped down on the port. Willie Castle was very excited by the time we finally got to see him. He was puttering around a whole mess of stuff piled up in the middle of the floor. Say, how do you like this? Isn't it exciting? Yeah. What is it? It's a Durgo stick. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, sure. And I use it in Mars in a game played between two villages. You see all the men on one side line up, and then all the men on the other side try to knock them over with these sticks. <laughs> Isn't it a beauty? Yeah. Uh, look, Mr. Castle, I got to speak to you. We got to have a left-handed pitcher. Oh, you mean for the baseball team? Yeah, that's right, the baseball team. That's what we got to have a left-handed pitcher for. Yeah. Well, now, I can't really be bothered with details of that sort. I'm leaving for Mars in the morning. Oh, by the way, I haven't had a chance to look at the standings recently. How are we doing? Mr. Castle, we may well set them out on record for consecutive games lost. Now, look here. You told me you can't sell a club. And you said you get tired of your friends kidding you about being last. Well, take it from me, Mr. Castle, and I know... Unless we get some ball players on that club, it's going to be last for the next 22 years. Now, look here, Cinderella. I can... I know you can fire me, but I don't care who you hire as manager. Unless you get him a left-handed pitcher and a couple of other players, that club is going to stay last. Oh. Oh, well, then I'll, I'll see what I can do. Don't worry about it. What do you mean, don't worry about it? I got to go out there every day and try to make those bums go through the motion. Now, look, I really have to pack. And besides, I'm expecting a new shipment of equipment from Aberfitch and Comby. Now, just don't worry about it. I'll think of something. Goodbye. Next day, we lost a doubleheader to Cincinnati by a score faintly reminiscent of basketball. And that's the way it went. Oh, we won a couple here and there. Like they say, you know, you can't lose them all. About the middle of the season, we were so far behind that the local papers just dropped us off the standings, didn't even bother to report it. It was about this time that Willie Castle returned from Mars. He came out to see us at the ballpark just before the massacre. Well, I noticed, Mr. Cinadilla, that we're still in last place. 
Yeah, Mr. Castle, we are. We are lucky we are still in the league. With the ball players that you've given me. Well, I just wanted to tell you that I made a small bet with one of the boys at the country club. Yeah? Yes. I bet a million credits that we'd win the pennant this year. That's nice. You don't seem to understand. I expect to win that bet. Yeah, sure. And I expect to put on a Monroe suit and win the Miss Universe title. I told you to leave everything to me. Now, I'd like you to come into my office, if you please. I have a few things I'd like to talk over with you. For one thing, I've signed a ball player. You, you what? Oh, look here, Mr. Castle. This I got a complaint about. My contract is clear. No ball player gets signed without my okay. Uh, just come into my office, please. I'll explain everything. That night, when Rabbit went up to the plate to hand in the starting lineups, I could tell something was happening. For one thing, old Baldy Snuff, the umpire, was looking at the card like it was written in Arabic. All right, who's the pitcher? It's written right there in the card. Saramo Castro Perbaco... What's the matter, can't you read? Oh, come on now, you kidding? Is he Armenian? Nope. Martian. Martian? That's right. Martian. Of course, the riot didn't really start until our pitcher got out on the mound. Fred Kurtz, the Milwaukee manager, came running out like he'd been shot from a jet. Baldy Snuff was hollering. The whole Milwaukee bench was looking for a fight, but Rabbit just stood there quiet and calm. He can't do that. He can't do that. Look at that thing. What is that? That's my pitcher. We call him Sam. But you can't play with that. That ain't a ball player. That isn't even a human being. What are you trying to pull, Rabbit? Listen, I got my rights. I sign them legal. Here's the contract. But, but, now look but, here, but, Rabbit. You can't get away with that. That thing's only about two feet high. Eighteen inches, as a matter of fact. But how's he gonna pitch? He hasn't even got any arms. Sure he has. He's got it curled up. Hey, Sam! Wind up! <laughs> but that arm... It's, it's, it's 32 feet long. That ain't legal. You gonna let him get away with that? Oh, there's one other thing. On the end of that arm, look, you see? That's his eye. Rabbit, I'm going to punch you right in the nose. Now, take it easy, Kurtz. Take it easy. Look, I got the papers all here. I've got the United Nations concord up with the Marshall Colonial Government, a Supreme Court decision in the case of Schultz versus Carroll, Calpable, Calfitz, et al. It's legal. Any Martian citizen is entitled to the same legal rights and privileges as a citizen of Earth. And among those is the right to play ball in a national league. I protest again. I forfeit the game. I, I, I... Rabbit, I'm going to punch you right in the nose. As a matter of fact, the game that night was postponed because of riot. The next morning, everybody met in the commissioner's office, and sure enough, it was legal. Martian Sam, we come to call him, was a legally signed player for the Los Angeles Dodgers. I told you not to worry. I found Sam in a village just north of Marsport. He's a Klugel hunter. A what? A Klugel hunter. Klugels are fast little animals that run about 80 miles an hour, and the hunters go out and throw rocks at them and kill them. Sam's a Klugel hunter. He ought to be a pretty good pitcher. How about the other clubs? What happens if they get Klugel hunters? Oh, they won't. You see, it's basically contrary to Martian psychology. They won't ever leave their own villages. And how come Sam left? Well, it was an unfortunate accident, really. You see, when I first met him, I, uh, I gave him a stick of chewing gum. Yeah? Well, he got hooked. What do you mean, hooked? Well, for Martians, the chickle seems to be habit-forming. Sam is a gum addict. Well, naturally, as soon as this was discovered, the traffic was prohibited. There's a death penalty for importing of chewing gum to Mars. But it was too late for Sam, so he came out with me. You mean all we gotta do is keep him supplied with chewing gum? That's right. I told you I'd take care of it, didn't I? Now you've got your left-handed pitcher. <laughs> Sam pitched that night. He struck out 27 batters, and we won three to nothing. Horse Kelly, the catcher, had a little trouble at first, but he soon figured out how to get around it. He'd just hold his mitt up and close his eyes, and when he heard a thunk, he'd reach in and pull the ball out and throw it back to Sam. You can imagine what it was like being a batter up there against Sam. Pitcher's mound is only 60 feet away from the plate as it is, and with Sam's 32-foot arm, well, we didn't lose the game the rest of the season. 
Of course, we started out so far behind that by the last game of the season, we were tied with the Milwaukee's, and we were playing them at Milwaukee. The winner of this game won the pennant. Of course, it was a lead pipe cinch for us. Marsh and Sam had pitched every day since he joined the club. He looked real cute out on a mound standing 18 inches high in his little Dodgers uniform and in that long 32-foot arm. We had taken a finished batting practice at Milwaukee County Stadium, and I was standing next to Willie Castle's box talking to him. Well, it looks like I won't have to be embarrassed about owning the Los Angeles Dodgers anymore, eh? That's right. With Sam pitching, that means we win the pennant and the series. Well, I think that's very nice. As a matter of fact, uh, I'm thinking of taking the whole team on a barnstorming tour through Mars after the series is over. Hey, Joe! Joe! Oh, Mr. Castle. What's the matter? It's Sam. Sam! What's the matter? Is anything wrong with him? Did he get his chewing gum? Yeah, yeah, he got his chewing gum, but he's just lying on the floor in the locker room moaning. He is? we better get a doctor. Yeah, and all those scales keep falling off him. Oh, no, no. What's the matter? I know what it is. What? It's the molting season. All the scales will fall off. It'll take him a week to grow new scales. But he can pitch, can't he? No, no, he can't. Any violent movement would bring on great pain. Well, there goes the ball game. Marsh and Sam can't pitch. We're dead. Rabbit put it mild. We were good and dead. We pitched Harry Kuznowski, our best human pitcher, but our best human pitcher was none too good. He rose to the occasion, however, and the score was tied going into the last half of the ninth. That's the way, Harry, old boy! That's the way, party! Come on, Harry! You can do it, baby! Unfortunately, he couldn't. He hit a streak of wildness and walked three straight men. Things were very quiet in the Dodgers' dugout. One more walk would force him to run. The ball game would be over. Then as we all sat there staring out at the mound where Harry was sweating, we heard a little shuffling noise. Oh, what's that? Sam! Sam, what are you doing out here? And then with the little squeaks that he used for talking, Sam told us what he wanted to do. <laughs> he wanted a pitch. But, Sam, you can't. You're molten. Your scales. <laughs> all right, Sam, all right. If that's the way you want it, you get out there. You pitch that one batter. It's two out. You strike him out, it'll go to extra innings, and we'll win the ball game. <laughs> and so Marsh and Sam trudged out to the pitcher's mound, his tiny legs lagging with great pain. You could just tell the little guy was hurting bad. Now pitching for Los Angeles, Marsh and Sam... We knew that Sam could do it now. We only had to face one batter and we'd get our chance again. Horse threw the ball out to him and Sam stood there, his eye on the end of his 32-foot arm, blinking with pain. All right, batter up. Let's get a batter in there. The umpire called for the batter and nobody came out of the Milwaukee dugout. Hey, come on, let's go. Hey, Kurtz, get a man up in there. What's the matter, Baldy? Let's get a batter in there. You're delaying the game. What do you mean I'm delaying the game? You get a batter up there. But I got a batter up there. What do you mean? There's nobody in the batter's box. Baldy, I got a contract here for you to read. What are you talking about? Yeah. Read it. Well, of course, everybody knows what happened. The Milwaukee Braves had signed an intelligent virus from the moons of Jupiter. He was up there in the batter's box, but of course you couldn't see him without an electron microscope. He walked on four straight pitches, forcing in a run, and the Milwaukee's won the pennant. But like I say, that's baseball. You can't win them all. You have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Time in the Round by Fritz Leiber, the story of a dictator who suffered more than any dictator in history. He was so puny, and his victims were so impregnable. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you Martian Sam, an original story written for radio by Ernest Kenoy. Featured in the cast were Mandel Kramer as Joe, Santos Ortega as Rabbit, Ivor Francis as Willie, Jack Orison as Baldy, Bob Hastings as Tommy, and Bill Zuckert as Kurtz. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production.
countdown for blastoff. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, Something for Nothing by Robert Sheckley. I woke up when I thought I heard a voice. But I must have been mistaken because there was no one in my room. There was the same network of cracks and the muddy yellow ceiling and the same water dripping slowly and mournfully through from the roof. I'd seen it a hundred times before. The worst room in a cheap hotel. But then, when I swung my feet onto the floor, I saw it. It was a machine on the floor. It hadn't been there when I went to sleep the night before. It was about three feet square, and it was humming softly. The crackled gray surface was featureless, except for a red button in one corner and a brass plate in the center. I leaned in closer and read the marking. Class A Utilizer, Series AA125643. Warning, this machine should be used only by Class A ratings. Hey, where did you come from? A utilizer, huh? What do you utilize? No switches, no knobs, just one red button. Okay, we'll give it a try. Here goes the button. All right, what happens now? A little green men drop from the ceiling... Okay, we'll push it again. Well, come on, do something. Guess I'll have to pawn it. Unless Charlie will give me a dollar for the metal for junk. Oh, boy, it's heavy. Can't even get the corner off the floor. They should have sent me somebody to help. Where do you want it, Mac? Hey, where did you come from? Come on, come on, we haven't got all day. Where do you want it? Lucky it's one of the small ones. The big models up roots to get a grip on. Who are you? Moving man. What do I look like? Queen of the May? But, but, but where did you come from? You just appeared in the room. What are you doing here? I'm from the Power Vinyl Movers Incorporated, and I came because you wanted movers. That's why. Now, where do you want it? Oh, well, uh, I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I, uh, uh, look, you go away. I'll call for you later. Okay, Mac. It's your problem. Utilizer, huh? Utilizer. Well, I don't know where you came from, but I know what you are. You're a wishing machine. I suppose most people would be shocked if a wishing machine suddenly showed up in their room. But not me. Most of my life has been spent wishing, hoping, praying that something marvelous would happen to me. In high school, I dreamed of waking up some morning with an ability to know my homework without having to do it. In the army, I used to wish for some witch to change my orders, put me in charge of the day room instead of forcing me to do close order drill like everyone else. Out of the army, I avoided work. You see, I'm kind of psychologically unsuited for it. I just drifted around hoping some fabulously wealthy person would for some reason change their will and leave me everything. I never really expected anything to happen, but now it did. All right, machine, let's go. I'd like a thousand dollars in small unmarked bills. There it is. How about that? Fives, tens, they're all dirty, just perfect. Okay, here's what I'll do. I'll get the machine out of New York. Maybe upstate someplace where I won't be bothered by nosy neighbors. 
Got a lot of problems on the income tax with this sort of thing. Well, maybe I get organized and I'll go to Central America. Hey, what's happening? There's a hole opening up in the wall. What? Somebody's trying to get through to me. The owner of the machine, he's trying to get it back. That hole's getting bigger. Hey, 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 utilizer. Protect me. Sanisar Leak, Temporal Wall Protection Service. What can I do for you? That man coming through the wall, get rid of him. Get rid of him. He's almost through. Oh, take it easy now. There's plenty of time. Let me see, where did I put that unit? Oh. There's his head! Wait a minute, wait a minute! You don't understand! Oh, wait! Ah! Well, that takes care of him. Anything else? Did you kill him? Of course not. I just veered him back through his glomach. He won't try that way again. Oh, you mean he'll try some other way? It's possible. He could attempt a microtransfer or even animation. Say, um, this is your utilizer, isn't it? Uh, of course... <laughs> Well, sure it is, of course. Then you're an A rating? Naturally. Uh, I wasn't. What did I be doing with the utilizer? Oh, no offense. Just being friendly. <laughs> well, well, how you A's get around. I suppose you've come back here to do a history book. Well, uh, um, I'm really not permitted to say. Uh, you understand, don't you? Oh, of course. I'll be on my way. One call after another, night and day, night and day. I'd be better off in a quarry. Bye. There I was alone with the machine with a thousand dollars in small bills scattered around the floor. Those A ratings, whoever they were, had it pretty good. Want something, just ask for it. Press the button. Well, the next few days marked a great change in my fortunes. With the aid of the power vinyl movers, I took the utilizer to upstate New York. There I bought a medium-sized mountain in a neglected corner of the Adirondacks. And once the papers were in my hands, I walked to the center of my properties, several miles from the highway, with the men from the moving company sweating behind me, carrying the utilizer. On all sides, as far as I could see, were closely spaced forests of birch and pine. The air was sweet and damp. Birds were chirping merrily in the treetops, an occasional squirrel darted by. I always loved nature. This would be the perfect spot to build a large, impressive house with swimming pool, tennis courts, and possibly a small airport. So I pushed the button. Yes, sir? Can I be of service? I want a house. Well, yes, sir, but you really must be more specific. Do you want something classic, like a bungalow, ranch, split-level, mansion, castle, or palace? Or primitive, like an igloo or hut? Uh, since you're an A, you could have something up to the minute, like a semi-face, an extended new, or a sunken miniature. Oh, uh, I don't know. What do you suggest? A uh, small mansion. They usually start with that. They do? Oh, yes. Later, they move to a warm climate and build a palace. Shall we start immediately? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, sure. Fine. Start immediately. <laughs> I wanted to ask a couple more questions, but I decided against it. Everything was going too smoothly. These people thought I was an A and the true owner of the utilizer. There wasn't any sense in disenchanting them. For the rest of the day, I reclined on a couch and drank iced beverages while the Maxim Ulf Construction Company materialized the equipment and put up my house. Well, now, there you are, sir. Modest, low-slung affair with 20 rooms. Built only of the best materials from the design of Meg of Degma. Interior by Toeg. Mueller Swimming Pool, and Formal Gardens Vivarium. It's really the latest thing. With your permission, we'll include a complete layout on it in Galactic House and Gardens. By evening, it was completed, and the small army of workmen packed up their equipment and then vanished. I allowed my chef to prepare a light supper for me. And afterwards, I sat in my cool living room to think the whole thing over. In front of me, humming gently, sat the utilizer. I ordered cigars. <laughs> ah, Havana. I wonder what's behind it all. Of course, it can't be supernatural. There are no demons or devils in this. My house was built by regular, ordinary human beings. They swore and laughed and cursed like human beings. The utilizer was simply a scientific gadget, which worked on principles that I didn't understand or care to understand. 
Could it have come from another planet? Not likely. They wouldn't have learned English just for me. And so I decided that the utilizer must have come from the Earth's future. But how? Well, accidents will happen. Why couldn't the utilizer have just slipped back into the past and ended up in my room? What a wonderful future it must be. Wishing machines. How marvelously civilized. All a person has to do is think of something, presto, and there it is. Of course, I had to watch my step. There was still the owner and the rest of the A's. They'd probably try to take the machine away from me. A sudden movement caught my eye. I looked up. The utilizer was quivering. As I walked towards it, a faint mist of steam came out of it. it must be overheating. Maybe a bucket of water. And then I noticed it was becoming smaller. It was no more than two feet square and shrinking before my eyes. The owner, perhaps the A's, are causing a micro-transfer that Leek had talked about. I had to do something quickly. I pushed the button. Leak Protection Service! Well, now look here. I was on my way to the golf course. Must I be disturbed every do time? Do something. Look at it. It's shrinking. It's getting smaller. It's getting hot. Do something. Well, there's nothing I can do. Temporal wall is all I'm licensed for. You want the micro-control people. Bye. Uh, wait a minute. Come back. It's getting hot. It's getting smaller. I'll press the button again. Micro-control! With whom do you wish to make an appointment? Get me help, fast. Look, the utilizer is growing smaller. They're micro-transferring it. Well, Mr. Vergnan is out to lunch. He's disowned himself. I can't reach him. Well, who can you reach? Well, Mr. Veers is in the deed continuum, and Mr. Elgis is doing field work in Paleontic Europe. If you're really in a rush, maybe transfer point control. They're a smaller unit. <coughs> all right, all right, all right. Transfer point control. Ow! Oh, that button's hot! Mm. I gotta push it. Gotta push that button... Transfer point control! Well, what can I do for you? Uh-huh, just a minute. I'll take care of that. Uh, there you are. Got just in time, didn't I? <laughs> Ain't fancy, but we're all reliable. My hand, my finger, it's burned. Can you do something? Who, me? Nope, not my department. Do one thing, do it well, I always say. Bye. My, my finger, it's burned. Push the button again. Now fix me up. Fix my finger. Ah, that's better. Much better. The owner of the utilizer didn't try anything for at least a week. But I found that my mansion in the woods had been the wrong thing to do. I had to hire a platoon of guards to keep away sightseers, and hunters insisted on camping in my formal gardens. Also, the Bureau of Internal Revenue began to take a lively interest in my affairs. And so, with the aid of the Power Vinyl Movers and the Maxima Ulf Construction Company and the Jankston Instantaneous Travel Bureau and a good deal of money placed in the proper hands, I moved to a small Central American republic. And there, since the climate was warmer and the income tax non-existent, I built a large, airy, ostentatious palace. It came equipped with the usual accessories. Horses, dogs, peacocks, servants, musicians, bevies of dancing girls, and everything a palace should have. I spent two weeks just exploring the place. One morning, I went up to the utilizer with the vague intention of asking for a sports car, or perhaps a small herd of pedigreed cattle. But as I bent over the gray machine and reached for the red button... Hey, where are you going? Hey, you can't move. You weigh a ton. Hold still so I can push the button... Hey, come back here! It's animation, that's what it is. Hey, come back here! I gotta push the button and get some kind of help. Hey, hey, machine, stop! Back into the corner. There we go. There we are. Careful, can't let it get through the door. One side, a little dot. And now, animation control! Wow, that was close. I can't take any more chances. I better do some big wishing now while I still have the chance. All right, pay attention here, machine. I'll have five million dollars, three functioning oil wells, a motion picture studio, perfect health, 25 more dancing girls, uh, immortality, a sports car, and a herd of pedigreed cattle. What is it? What happened? The utilizer. 
It's gone. Where is it? Wait a minute. What happened to me? I'm gone, too. Where am I? Oh, it's perfectly all right, sir. You can open your eyes now. Where am I? What happened? I was in my room. Where am I now? Where's the utilizer? Oh, it's been returned to stock. Wait a minute. You're the one that tried to come through the wall. You're the owner. Won't you have a chair? Well, I guess it's all over, isn't it? The A's finally caught me. Well, it was glorious while it lasted. A cigarette? No. Well, you got your machine back now. What else do you want? My machine? Well, it's not my machine, sir. Not at all. Oh, don't try to kid me, mister. UA ratings want to protect your monopoly, don't you? My name is Flynn. I'm an agent for the Citizens Protective Union, a non-profit organization whose aim is to protect individuals such as yourself from errors of judgment. You mean you're not one of the A's? Well, you're laboring under a misapprehension, sir. The A rating does not represent a social group as you, you seem to believe. You mean it's not an aristocracy, a hereditary... Oh, goodness, no. An A rating is merely a credit rating. A what? A credit rating. Well, now, you haven't got much time, so I'll make this as brief as possible here. You're uh, quite correct, sir, that this is the future, as you put it. Ours is a decentralized age, sir. Our businesses, industries, and services are, are scattered throughout an appreciable portion of space and time. Now, the utilization corporation that produces the utilizer is an essential link. It provides for the transfer of goods and services from point to point. You understand? Well, yeah, yeah. I get it, I get it. Well, credit, of course, is an automatic privilege. But eventually, well, everything must be paid for. Paid for? Hey, nobody said anything about paying. What are you talking about? Well, now, of course, you certainly couldn't have expected to be provided with all these services uh, without pay. Well, then why didn't somebody stop me? They must have known I didn't have a proper rating. Oh, credit ratings are suggestions, not laws. In a civilized world, an individual has the right to his own decision. I'm very sorry, sir. Now, would you care to look at this bill and uh, tell me uh, whether it's an order? Bill? What bill? For all the services that you ordered from the utilizer. Uh, there they are. There's, uh, let's see, there's one palace with accessories, credit 450 million. Services Maxima Alt Movers, 111,000 credits. Uh, 122 dancing girls, 1,222,000. Perfect Health, 8,882,422. Well, there's a whole list of them here. The total comes to slightly less than 18 million credits. Hey, wait a minute. I can't be held to this. The utilizer just dropped into my room by accident. Well, that's the very fact I'm going to bring to their attention. Well, what's going to happen to me? Oh, it's already happened. You've been a judge through bankruptcy court. Good luck. Goodbye. What? Where am I? What happened? Where is this place? All right, buddy, on your feet. Who, who are you? On your feet, Mac. Here, take this. What is it? It's a pick. And over there is a quarry where you and I and a couple of others are going to cut marble. Marble? Sure. There's always some idiot who wants a palace. You better get working now, boy. I'll hand you a touch of that electronic whip. What do you mean? You'll find out. You can call me Jang. We'll be together for some time. How long? You work it out. The rate is 50 credits a month until your debt is paid off. They can't do this to me. It's all a mistake. It was their fault they left the machine. They let it slip into the past. It's all a mistake. It's no mistake. They're short of labor. They don't want to go recruiting all over for it. Come on. After the first thousand years, you won't mind it. The first thousand years? I won't live that long. Sure you will. You got immortality, didn't you? Oh. That's right. That's right, I wished for it just before they took back the machine. Sure you did. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. That bill that Flynn showed me, I didn't see immortality on that bill. How much did they charge me for immortality? Oh, don't be naive, pal. You should have figured it out by now. Naturally, they give that away for nothing. Now grab your pick, let's go. <laughs> You 
have just heard X-1 presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Founding Father by Clifford D. Simak, the story of a man whose job was to be first in the hearts of his countrymen, if he ever managed to find them. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you Something for Nothing, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Robert Sheckley and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in our cast were Joseph Julian as Joe, with Danny Ocko, Jock McGregor, John Gibson, Wendell Holmes, Ralph Bell, and Karen Ford. Fred Collins speaking. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Scanning the globe ever watchful, the NBC Radio News Department maintains a 24-hour vigil on the world. From the U.N., from Washington, from the Middle East, NBC Radio newsmen are on the beam, reporting the news from where it happens, as it happens. Every minute of the day, news streams into the NBC newsroom, is sifted and evaluated. Every 60 minutes, the most important stories are broadcast to you by top commentators like Chet Huntley, David Brinkley, and Alex Dreyer on News on the Hour. And when the hot stories break, you get them in a flash on Hotline. It's like having a seat in the NBC radio newsroom. Listen for news on the hour and the exclusive hotline service all day, every day on most of these stations. Countdown for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, the discovery of Morniel Mathaway by William Tent. Everyone is astonished at the change in Morniel Mathaway since he was discovered. Everyone, that is, but me. They remember him as an unbathed and untalented Greenwich Village painter who began almost every second sentence with I and ended every third one with me. You see, I understand the change in him, because I was there the day he was discovered. We were talking about his discovery that day. I was sitting carefully balanced on the one wooden chair in his cold little Bleecker Street studio, because I was too sophisticated to sit in the easy chair. Come on, Dave, take a comfortable seat. Oh, no, Morning. oh, no, I know about that chair. Now, what do you mean? It's the only comfortable chair in the room. Yeah, I know, I know, look at it. Broken down springs, very high in the front and low in the back. Sure, it conforms with the position of the spine. Yeah, sure, sure. And when you sit in it, things begin sliding out of your pockets. Loose change, keys, wallets, anything. What do you do, Moyo? Pay the rent on your studio with that easy chair? <laughs> well, as a matter of fact, it is rather profitable. Mm. And that's why I'll sit on the wooden chair, if you don't mind. Oh, now, don't be bourgeois. Well, I notice you always sit on the bed. That's because I'm a good host. I see. Well, how's the painting going? Oh, great, great, fabulous. Do you sell any paintings? No. You know, Dave, I can't wait for the day when some dealer, some critic with an ounce of brain sees my work. I can't miss, Dave. I know I can't miss. I'm just too good. Sometimes I get frightened at how good I am. Why, it's almost too much talent for one man. Uh, well, there's always... Not that it's too much talent for me. I'm big enough to carry it, fortunately. I'm large enough of soul. Oh, good. I'm glad to hear it. Now, if you don't mind... Do you know I... what I was thinking about this morning? No, but to tell you the truth, I don't... I was thinking about Picasso, Dave. Picasso and Ruor. 
I'd just gone for a walk through the pushcart area to have my breakfast. Uh, <laughs> you know, the old hand's quicker than the eye. Yes, I know. I've seen you do it. You're the only man I know who can ask directions to Houston Street and fill his pockets full of bananas at the same time. Oh, well, society owes the artist something. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I started to think about the art of modern painting. I think about that a lot, Dave. It troubles me. You do, huh? Well, I... I was thinking, who is really doing important work in painting today? Who is really an unquestionable great? I could think of only three names. Picasso, Ruol, and me. Well, naturally. Just three names, no more. Oh, it made me feel very lonely, Dave. Yeah, well, I can see that. But and then, then you... I asked myself, why is this so? Has absolute genius always been so rare? Why has my impending discovery been delayed so long? Oh, I thought about it for a long time, Dave. I thought about it humbly, carefully, because it's an important question. And this is the answer I came up with. <laughs> Don't bother waiting for the answer that Morneau came up with. It turned out to be a theory of aesthetics I'd heard at least a dozen times before from a dozen other painters in the village. Morneau was a bad painter, there was no question about it. I say that not only from my opinion. I've roomed with two modern painters and I've been married for a year to another, but... Well, for example, a friend of mine, a fine critic of modern art, took a look at one of Morneau's paintings, which he hung over my fireplace in spite of my protests, and just kind of stared slack-jawed. What, uh, what, what does he call that technique? Well, he says it's smudge on smudge. Well, I can believe it. Smudge on smudge, white on white, non-objectivism, neo-abstractionism, call it what you like. There's nothing there, nothing. Well, it doesn't even have the interest of those paintings that chimpanzee did a couple of years ago. He's just another of those loudmouth, frowsy, frustrated dilettantes that infest the village. Why do you waste your time with him? Well, for one thing, he lives right around the corner, and he's kind of colorful in his own sick way. And he does have one great talent. It's not in painting. No, no. Now, you see, I just get by as far as living expenses are concerned. Things like good paper to write on, good books for my library. Well, I can't touch them. And sometimes the yearning gets too great. You know, a newly published collection by Wallace Stevens. Well, if I find one I want, I just go over to Morneau's and tell him about it. He doesn't lend you money. Oh, no, no, no. Now, you see, we go out to the bookstore, and we come in separately. And then I start a conversation with the proprietor about some very expensive out-of-print item I'm thinking of ordering, and Morneau just says, don't mind me, I'm browsing. Well, that's the high sign. I'm browsing. Well, what happens? Well, while I'm keeping the proprietor talking, Morneau snaffles the Stevens. Isn't that just a little bit, uh... Oh, well, I, I intend to pay for them, of course, just as soon as I'm a little ahead. Well, why does he do this for you? Oh, well, I pay off. I go through the same routine at an art supply store so Morneau can get canvas and paint and brushes. Of course, I really have to pay for Morneau's browsing. I have to suffer through listening to him, and then my conscience bothers me. Oh, it does. Yes, you see, I intend to pay for my things, but I know he doesn't. And that's why my conscience bothers me. Well, here he was the day he was discovered sitting in his room, and Morneau was running on about his own genius. No, I can't be as unique as I feel. Other people must be born with a potential of such great talent, but it's destroyed in them before they can reach artistic maturity. Why? How? Well, let's examine the role that society plays in all of this. What's that? You got a hi-fi set? Nonsense. That's a crass materialistic concept that I should... Something is happening. Hey, when did you put the purple lights in? Purple? Oh, what's that? Look, look, it's, it's shimmering. It's coming right through the wall. It looks like a box. We can't both be having an artistic vision. You're not the type. No, I'm not. I'm not drunk either. Look out. Something's going to happen. Morneul Mathaway? Well, who, who are you? Where, where, where'd you come from? You are Morneul Mathaway? Yes, 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 yes. My name is Glescu. I bring you greetings from 2487 A.D. Oh, 2487 A.D.? I realize this is a difficult phenomenon for you to grasp entirely, but here I am. We will now indulge in the 20th century custom of shaking hands. Mr. Morneul Mathaway? Oh, well, sure, 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 shake, yes. And you, sir? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure, I don't mind, shake. What a moment. What a supreme moment. Oh, well, what do you mean, what a moment? What's so special about it? Are you the inventor of time travel? Me, an inventor? No, 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 no. Time travel was invented by Antoinette Ingeborg, and, well, that was after your time. 
It's hardly worth going into at the moment, especially since I only have half an hour. Well, why half an hour? The skin drum can only be maintained at lock. The skin drum is, well, call it the transmitting device that enables me to appear in your period. There is such an enormous expenditure of power required that a trip into the past is made only every 50 years. The privilege is awarded as a sort of gobel. I believe I have the word right. It is gobel, isn't it? The award made in your time? Well, you wouldn't mean Nobel by any chance, a Nobel Prize? That's it, the Nobel Prize. A trip is awarded to outstanding scholars as a kind of Nobel Prize. Once every 50 years, the man selected by the Gardamax is the most preeminent, that uh, sort of thing, you know. Up to now, of course, it's always gone to historians, or they frittered it away on the siege of Troy and the, the first atom bomb explosion at uh, Los Alamos, uh, or the, uh, well, the discovery of America, things like that. But this year... Yes? Well, what, uh... What kind of scholar are you? I am an art scholar. My specialty is art history, and my special field in art history is... What? 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 You, Mr. Mathaway. In my own period, I may say without much contradiction, I am the greatest living authority on the life and works of Mournuel Mathaway. My special field is you. Dave. Dave, did you hear that? Dave. Dave! I heard. Do you mean... You mean that I... I'm famous? That famous? Famous. You, my dear sir, are beyond fame. You are one of the immortals the human race has produced. That famous? That famous. <sighs> who, who is the man with whom modern painting in its full glory is said to have definitely begun? Who is the man whose designs and color have dominated architecture for the past five centuries? Who is responsible for the arrangement of our cities, the shape of our artifacts, the, the texture of our clothing? Me. You. No other man in the history of art has exerted such a massive influence over design. To whom can I compare you, sir? To what other artist in history can I possibly compare you? Rembrandt? Da Vinci? Rembrandt and Da Vinci in the same breath as you. That's ridiculous. They, they lacked your universality, your taste for the cosmic. Wow. Uh, Mr. Glesker, excuse me. Do you happen to know of a poet named David Danziger? Did much of his work survive? Is that you? Yes, that's me. Dave Danziger? Well, no, no, no. I, I don't think so. The only poet I can remember for this time and this part of the world is uh, uh, Peter Tebb. Tebb? Never heard of him. Then this must have been before he was discovered. But you see, I, I am an art scholar. Well, you see, checking my chronometer, I see my time is getting short. But it is an overwhelming delight for me to be standing in your studio, Mr. Mathaway, and, and looking at you at last in the flesh. I wonder if you would mind obliging me... With a small favor. Oh, sure, sure. You name it. Nothing's too good for you. What do you want? I wonder, I'm sure you don't mind, could, could you possibly let me look at your painting? The one that you're working on at this very moment? Well, sure, sure. I, I have one right over here. Just, uh, now pull the easel around. There you are. I, uh, I intend to call this Figured Figurines Number 29. Hmm? Oh, well, but this, this... What's the matter? Well, surely this... This isn't your work, Mr. Matherway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's my work, all right. Figured figurines number 29. Recognize it? No, I do not recognize it, and that is a fact for which I am extremely grateful. Could I see something else, please? Something a uh, little later. Well, that's the latest. Everything else is earlier. Here, here, you might like this. Now, I call this figured figurines number 22. I think it's the best of my early period. Oh, oh, dear. You know, well, this, this looks like a, a smears of paint on top of other smears of paint. Right. Only I call it smudge on smudge. But you probably know all about that, being such an authority on me. And now, here we have figured figurines number two. Do you, do you mind leaving these figurines, Mr. Mathaway? I, I'd like to see something of yours with, with color, uh, with color and form. Well, I haven't done any real color work for a long time. Oh, wait a minute. Wait. I, I have one over here somewhere, uh, an old canvas. I, I was going to paint over it. Uh, ah, here we are. This is one of the few examples of my mauve and mottled period that I've kept. Oh, right. I can't imagine why. It's positively, it's... Uh... Oh, oh, dear. Oh, now, wait a minute. Let me show you some of my intestinal period. Ah, here. Here's a particularly good one. It's called large intestine rampant. Ah, you like it? Oh, oh please, please, I... You know, I, I, I think I'd like to sit down. Well, take the comfortable chair. And here's another one called Small Intestine Incisive. Oh, it's rather good, don't you think? I managed to avoid completely any definite line. You notice that? I, I don't suppose you ever drink of Glyfax. 
Oh, no, no, of course you don't. It hasn't been invented yet. I... Oh, now here's one that's bound to be great. It's one of my earlier smudge on smudges. It's called fly ash. Mm. I painted it by coating the canvas with slow-setting glue mm. and leaving it out on the window for about two and a half hours. Notice the delicate deposit of soot. No, oh, please. Please, Miss Mathaway, please, please. Oh, I've got lots more. You, you know, I, I don't understand this. All of these canvases, this, this is obviously before you discover yourself in your, your true technique. But I'm looking for a sign, a, a hint to the genius that is to come, and I find... Well, how about I this find... one? Here, here. Oh, please, 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 please. Oh, take that away. Oh, oh dear. Oh, dear, no, no. Oh, look, I'll have to leave soon. I, I don't understand this at all. Let me show you something here, gentlemen. Here. <clears throat> a pocket edition of the source... Complete paintings of Moniel Mathaway, 1928-1996. Were you born in 1928? Yep. May 23rd, 1928. Here. Look at the first painting. Well, that's... That's beautiful. I mean, the color, it, that's incredible. Oh. Oh, well, that stuff. <laughs> well, why didn't you tell me you wanted that kind of stuff? You mean, you mean you have paintings like this, too? No, 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 not paintings. One painting... Oh, I did it last week as a sort of an experiment, but I wasn't satisfied with the way it turned out, so I, I gave it to the girl downstairs. Would you like to look at it? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Very much. Very much. Well, here, I'll just toss your book on the bed. Come on, it won't take a minute or two. Oh, she isn't at home. I thought she'd be home now. Oh, I did so want you to see that painting. I want to see it. I, I want to see anything that looks like your mature work. But time is getting short. The chronometer... I'll tell you me. what. Anita here has a couple of cats that she asked me to feed when she's away for a while. So she's given me the key to her apartment. Suppose I, uh, browse upstairs and get it. Yeah, but she... Suppose just... I browse through my room and get it. Get it? Oh, yeah, 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 you go ahead and browse, sure. Fine, fine, but please hurry. Oh, sure, sure, I'll hurry. I won't take long browsing. Well, that was it, the high sign. I'd seen Morneal Mathaway in action too many times as a shoplifter not to understand it. He was going upstairs to lift that book that he'd dropped on the bed. I knew he hadn't ever painted a picture like the one in the book, but he would now. Only he wouldn't paint them. He copied them. Well, I started talking automatically. You uh, paint yourself, Mr. Glasgow? No, 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 no. I, of course, I wanted to be an artist when I was a boy. I imagine every critic starts out that way, but I found it far easier to write about paintings than to do them. Once I began reading the life of Morneal Mathaway, I knew I had found my field. Not only do I empathize closely with his paintings, but he seems so much like a person I, I could have known and, and liked. That's one of the things that puzzles me. He's quite different from what I had imagined. Yes, I'll bet he is. Of course, history has a way of adding romance to an important figure. Mm -hmm. Oh, dear, I'm running out of time here. Do you, do you think you'll be back with the key soon? I've I practically no time left. I've just got to get upstairs to the time translator. I, I just can't wait. I'll, I'll have to hurry now. Oh, dear, I did want to see an original Mathaway. I did want to. Mr. Mathaway, I... Oh! What's the matter? The time translator, it isn't here. It's gone. Uh, the book is gone, too. And Mathaway, he stranded me here. He must have figured out that getting inside and closing the door made it return. Yeah, he's a great figure, and he'll probably figure out a very plausible story to tell the people in your time to explain how the whole thing happened. Why should he work his head off in the 20th century when he can be an outstanding hero worship celebrity in the 25th? So what will happen if they ask him to paint merely one picture? Oh, he'll probably tell them he's already done his work and feels he can no longer add anything of importance to it. He'll no doubt end up giving lectures on himself. Don't worry, he'll make out. It's you I'm worried about. You're stuck here, aren't you? Are they likely to send a rescue party after you? No. Every scholar who wins the award has to sign a waiver of responsibility in case he doesn't return. Uh. No, I'm... I'm stuck here. Tell me, is it... Is it very bad living in this period? Well, not so bad. Uh, of course, you'll need a social security card. And I don't know how you go about getting one at your age and... Well, the immigration authorities may want to question you since you're sort of an illegal alien. Oh, dear, dear. That's, uh, that's awful. Mm. Wait a minute. It needn't be. I'll tell you what. Morneal has a social security card. He had a job a couple of years ago. 
He keeps his birth certificate in that drawer along with his other papers. Now, why don't you just assume his identity? He'll never show you up as an imposter. Yes, but do you think I could? Won't I be... Uh, well, won't his friends, his, his relatives... No, he hasn't got any family, and I'm about the only friend he's got. You could get away with it. Maybe grow a beard and dye it blonde. Naturally, the big problem would be earning a living. Being a specialist on Mathaway in the art movements derived from him wouldn't get you set an awful lot right now. But I could paint. I've always dreamed of being an artist. I don't have much talent, but there are all kinds of artistic novelties I know about, all kinds of graphic innovations that don't exist in your time. Surely that would be enough, even without talent, to make a living for me on some third or fourth-rate level? Yes, certainly was. But not on a third or fourth-rate level. Mr. Glesko, that is Moniel Mathaway, is the finest painter alive today and the unhappiest. After his last wildly successful exhibition, I remember he said to me, What's the matter with all these people praising me like that? I don't have an ounce of real talent in me. All my work is completely derivative. I've tried. I've tried to do something, anything that was completely my own. But I'm so steeped in Mathaway that I can't seem to make my own personality come through. And those idiotic critics go on raving about me when the work isn't even my own. Well, then whose is it? Mathaway's, of course. We thought there couldn't be a time paradox. I wish you could read all the scientific papers on the subject. They fill whole libraries because it isn't possible that time specialists argue for a painting to be copied from a future reproduction and so have no original artist. But that's what I'm doing. I'm copying from that book by memory. Now, look, Blesku, yeah, that is Mathaway. Don't knock yourself out. But it's dishonest. No, it isn't. You're deliberately trying not to copy those paintings. You're working so hard at it that you refuse to think about that book or even discuss it. As a matter of fact... When I tried to get you to talk about it a little while ago, you couldn't actually remember it. That's true. That's true. You're the real Moniel Mathaway, and there's no paradox. You're actually painting those pictures. You're not copying them from memory. I know in my heart that they're not mine. All right, I'll forget it. Anyway, you're a much nicer guy than Mathaway ever was. And besides, a buck is a buck. <laughs> You have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, which this month features Lulu by Clifford D. Simak, a story which demonstrates that a spaceship should be a darb, a smasher, a pip, a butte, but man all battle stations if it ever becomes a sweetheart of a ship. Galaxy Magazine, on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you... The Discovery of Morniel Mathaway, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by William Tenn and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in our cast were Leon Janney as Mathaway, Guy Rep as the critic, Wendell Holmes as Glasgow, and Les Damon as Dave. Your announcer, Fred Collins. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. Down for blast off. X minus five, four, three, two, X minus one, fire. From the far horizons of the unknown come tales of new dimensions in time and space. These are stories of the future, adventures in which you'll live in a million could be years on a thousand maybe worlds. The National Broadcasting Company, in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine, presents X minus one. Tonight, we take you some 800 years into the future to meet man's best friend. 
All right, I'm coming. I'm coming. Well, stand in front of the screen. I can't see you. I am in front of the screen, Mr. Schnee. You haven't turned up the viewing control. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, there you are. Do I know you? May I be the first to congratulate you, Mr. Schnee? You may indeed. What for? Oh, you haven't heard the news. Good, then I shall be the first. I imagine I got a head start on the others because of my superior facilities for locating you. Your address wasn't given. These pronouncements do tend to be a bit vague. It's a matter of tradition, I suppose. I haven't heard any news for days. I've been listening to my sound tapes and, uh, <laughs> and meditating. Now, wait a minute. I'll let you in. Oh. Oh, the auto bursar must have forgotten to pay the doorbell. Have to open it manually. Uh, just a minute. All right, you uh, can come in now. Well, I suppose you don't know who I am. Well, you're wearing the uniform of an upper echelon salesman. I just wanted to warn you, nobody can force me to buy anything. I'm a free citizen. Oh, now, come, Mr. Snape. I suppose the big news is I'm the lucky householder to whom the little gem room expander will first be offered. Oh, 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 nothing of the sort. I'm not a common salesman. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't notice your merchant prince badge. <laughs> Come in, have a chair. No, 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 not that one. It's my meditator. It's still running. Oh, thank you. Well? Mr. Schnee, our prognosticator has just given its fortnightly prognostication. You are going to be our new ruler. Congratulations. I'm sure you'll be a splendid one, too. But wait, uh, what's to become of the old ruler? You're scheduled to dispose of him sometime this month. Now, Mr. Schnee, allow me to introduce myself. I am Vedric Floria... Vice President of the Munitions and Container Corporation. Here I have our latest model in this case right here. There we are. Beautiful, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Now, if you will only agree to shoot Overlord Kip with a Floria Semper Fidelis gun, my corporation will be happy to place a substantial amount of credit at your disposal in any bank you choose. Six billion, to be exact. Now, if you'll just sign here on the dotted line... Nonsense. Oh, come now, Mr. Schnee. Even a ruler can use money. <laughs> Bribery for government officials, bread and circuses for the people. Oh, money's a very useful commodity, Mr. Schnee. Shall we say, uh, seven billion? I don't doubt that money is useful. But when I said nonsense, I meant the prognosticator. Mr. Schnee? The whole thing is a lot of, well, nonsense. A whole planet of supposedly intelligent people listening to what's really more uh, an oracle. A machine can't read the future. It's impossible. Oh, dear, 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 Mr. Schnee, that, that sacrilege. You, you can't talk, confound it, sir. You can't talk that way about the machine. Listen, after all, let's, let's look at this reasonably. Machines can and do answer all the problems of our daily life. So why shouldn't a superior machine be able to tell the future. If you ask me behind the wires and gimmicks and whatnots of the machine, there's a secret room in which a half-mad, half-intoxicated old priestess sits delivering her Delphic pronouncements. Might as well have an above-board oracle and be done with it. Now, now, Mr. Schnee, even our ruler shouldn't flout the authority of machinery. Of course, it's all right when you're alone with friends like me, but, but in public you shouldn't. Mr. Schnee, I'm from the Daily Disseminator. How does it feel to be ruler prognosticate? Perhaps you'd tell us in your own words. Oh, that's what I get for leaving the annunciator on. There's your community. All right, all right. I'll answer it. Hello. Mr. Schnee? Yeah. I'm Overlord Kip. I uh, understand you are the young man who was destined to dispose of me and take my place. Well, honestly, Your Honorship, I haven't the slightest uh, You'll intention. make it swift and painless, won't you? Uh, suppose you come around to the palace around one o'clock or so. We can have a bite of lunch and discuss the matter together. After all, I think you'd agree that I have been a reasonably good ruler, and so I have the right to die with dignity. Oh, absolutely. No question of that. I, I think it's a very good idea having a chat about it first. It, it is awkward to dispose of someone you haven't met previously. Thank you, Mr. Schnee. I hope you'll find your successor as cooperative as yourself. Hmm. I wonder whether he wants me to make an appointment so he'll have a band of counter-assassins ready to kill me. You know, that would save him the expense of a standby guard. He's pretty tight, you know. 
he wouldn't dream of doing anything of the sort. Overlord Kit knows what's due his position. He has a sense of duty and responsibility, which unfortunately seems to be lacking in his successor, if you'll excuse me speaking frankly. I am, of course, considerably older than you, and so I feel... It's quite all right. You may speak freely. Furthermore, if he had you killed, the people would probably give him a painful and lingering death for attempting to interfere with the course of destiny. Oh, by the way, uh, speaking of the people, the polo will probably be around uh, to hail their new leader soon. You really should work up a few well-chosen words. Well, I'm not going to do it. They can't make me kill him and take over, and that is flat. I am not the administrative type. I never have been. Well, in that case, the people will probably kill you for attempting to interfere with fate. Have a cigar? But I wouldn't have done anything. There are sins of omission as well as commission. Come now, it's true. A ruler's life expectancy isn't very long. At least it hasn't been the last few reigns. But it's longer than yours will be if you refuse to fulfill your destiny. I wouldn't make a fit ruler. Consider my origins. I wouldn't tell this to anyone but you. I'm illegitimate. I don't even know who my father is. It's a wise child who knows his own father. And some of the most celebrated leaders in history have been illegitimate. Look at William the Conqueror, Alexander Hamilton. I don't the... think that's too much of a recommendation. You see, almost anyone can be a leader. The important thing is that he be destined for leadership. But I'm no good at it. Everybody says so. I've never done a thing in my life. My aged mother has had to work to support me. Well, it's time enough that you stood on your own two feet, my boy. Remember, destiny must take its course. Oh, excuse me. I'm, I'm due on radio monitor in a few seconds. If you don't mind, I'll broadcast from here. I'll just check my equipment here. Fine, fine. Now, here we go. <clears throat> my friends, allow me to introduce to you your new ruler, Gervais Schnee. He is planning to assassinate Overlord Kip with a Floria Semper Fidelis gun. Floria Semper Fidelis guns retail from credit 2.98 for the peasant's pistol, all up to credit 1089.98 for the super deluxe conspirator's model. But each is the best attainable for the price. Mr. Schnee will, of course, use the super deluxe model. And now I give you Mr. Schnee. Uh, right into here? Hmm? Oh, anywhere. It's uh, non-directional. Oh. <clears throat> Uh, thank you for your, uh, for your confidence and support. I only hope I prove worthy of it. That's all. Thank you, ruler prognosticate Gervais Schnee. Will you have some more wine, Mr. Schnee? Oh, no, thank you, Overlord Kip. I've had too much already. It's a delightful vintage, isn't it? I think it was bought by Overlord Jasper about seven rains ago. You'll find the cellars in perfect order. I'll give you the inventory and uh, the key a little later. Uh, do we... Do we have to talk about it? Oh, well, one has to take these things as they come, you know. Here today, gone tomorrow. Uh, uh, that reminds me. Uh, will tomorrow suit you? Well, of course, it really doesn't make any difference to me. All right, then. We'll set it for tomorrow, if that's convenient for both of us. I uh, have the afternoon clear... We'll make a public announcement uh, a little later. Well, all right, if you say so. Uh, of course. And uh, now we can go into my study and discuss the details at our leisure. I, uh, I've got half a box of some wonderful cigars left over. I think you'll enjoy them. Oh, Mr. Schnee... Mr. Schnee, you aren't ready yet. Well, I... I can't button the top button of this uniform. Oh, isn't it handsome? Black and silver, the traditional assassin's uniform. Uh, it was made for me without charge by Hanson and Cruster, uh, the tailors. Yes, of course, of course. It's, it's the curse these days, you know, the over-commercialization of important public functions. Oh, wait a minute, I have your pistol ready here. <laughs> I bet you're excited. Couldn't sleep last night, eh? No, well, yes, I did toss a bit. <laughs> well, I, I see you're getting telegrams. Isn't that nice? Had your breakfast? Oh, well, I, I don't think I'm exactly in the mood for eating. Oh, you should, you know. A good breakfast makes good aim. Well, I really couldn't eat a thing. Well, you will have a fine lunch after it's all over. Uh, I saw your black and silver limousine at the door. What? I don't have a black and silver limousine. You do now. 
<laughs> oh, yes. You know, there's going to be a brass band along. There'll be crowds cheering. Oh, it's such a lovely morning. You, uh, you've hired two removers, I trust. Removers. Yes, yes, I think so. Good. I... Oh, what pageantry. The black and silver limousine. Yourself in your lovely uniform. The black cloak and hood of the body removers sitting beside the chauffeurs. Silent. The band playing the funeral march as you move down the boulevard. Crowds cheering, little children that out of school presenting you with flowers and, and television cameras. Oh, what a sight, what a sight. Well, now it's about 10.30. Shall we be off? Well, come on, come on. Get out of the car, Mr. Schnee. I don't feel so good. Well, come on now. The television cameras are ready. There we are. Just a moment. <coughs> now, ruler prognosticate Schnee... <laughs> Allow me to load your super deluxe conspirators Floria Semper Fidelis gun for you. It's already loaded. I'm supposed to do it now for the cameras. It's already loaded. Permit me to check it, then? It's perfectly all right, I tell you. No, 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 don't touch it. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, nobody would have any difficulty loading a Semper Fidelis gun. Yeah, wait, yeah, that's right, yes, of course. Uh, whether you buy the peasants or the conspirators model... Both have the same freeloading mechanism. Here we are, candy, popcorn, hashish, yogurt, buy your refreshments here. Program, sometimes you can't tell the assassins from the cops without a program. Get your program for the program. All right, Sinead, it's time. Let's go. Well, here we are again, eh? Uh, Overlord Kip. I am officially here. Uh, well, now, uh, just a minute, though, man. I have my speech, you know. Your speech? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, really. Well, that's all right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, before the conclusion of this ceremony, I wish to remind you of a few important facts concerning my reign, which comes to an end in just a few minutes. I call your attention to the budget of 2786. 83 billion credits against an outgo of 72 billion. Not to mention the dam across the Balga River, which was constructed three months short of the proposed five-year date at a cost of 73 billion. I thank you. Well, that's it, old man, huh? Are you all done? Why, uh, yes, I think I've covered everything. Well, uh, goodbye and good luck, Overlord Schnee. Anytime you're ready. You mean now? Well, come along, old man. The networks have only cleared an hour. There's a commercial program starting in three minutes. Get on with it. Well, all right. Here goes. Everyone will now please leave while the removers take over. But the television, the cameras, it's part of the ceremony. Why can't they televise the removal? Everybody leave immediately! They're all gone now, Overlord Schnee. Uh, perhaps... You too. But after all... Out! I want to meditate. Well... Very well. All right. Oh, alone at last. Kip. Kip. Overlord Phew. Kip. Phew. I don't think I'd have been able to stay still much longer. You all right? Stay, you're a good shot. That blank really stung on a very tender spot, I might add. No, no, no time for chatting. We've got to get this over in a hurry. Now comes the part where your friends will have to look like real removers. I hope they can give it the professional touch. Don't worry about us. We are real removers. At least both of us have participated in removals. I'll uh, take off my hood. But wait. Why, you're Overlord Morehouse. I've seen you in pictures. Mm -hmm. And the other one. You're Shinnick. You died before I was born. That is, you were supposed to have died. Both of you were. Uh, Morehouse was supposed to have killed you. Well, we're not precisely dead. Only retired, you might say. The prognosticator didn't say he had to be killed, you know, just disposed of. 
as Kip undoubtedly pointed out to you in your little interview together? Sorry, I couldn't tell you the truth, old man, but you might have changed your mind and given us away. We've formed a little club of dead overlords. We're looking forward to the day when you join us, Overlord Schnee. Well, you better hurry. If the four of us are discovered, the mob will tear us to pieces. Oh, you're right. Uh, get on the stretcher, Kip. Bad enough, we're going to have to carry you out. At least don't expect us to lift you up. Gloria? Yes, Your Honorship? The prognosticator is right here in the palace, isn't it? Yes, Your Honorship. Lead me to it immediately. Certainly, Your Honorship. It's this way. Here you are, Your Honorship. This is the prognosticator. Twenty stories high, a hundred meters wide the center of our entire civilization. Leave me. I would be alone with the prognosticator. But, 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 Your Honor, should Leave I... me and take all the technicians with you. Yes. Yes, Your Honor, sir. You're all alone now, Your Honor, sir. You too. Leave me. Well, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor, sir. Your wishes are my command. Well. Oh, go butter your earlobes. Can't you read your dumb clock? That door says private. Open up. It's me, Gervais. Open up. Oh, all right, all right. Don't rush me. Don't rush me. Oh, it's you, is it? Let me in. Well, hurry up. Don't want any of these nosy scientists around. <laughs> well, what do you want? Hmm. Still the same old place, huh? Teapot. Your crystal ball has dust on it. And why don't you get yourself a new pack of gypsy cards? And please get rid of that old overstuffed horror... That old overstuffed horror is a rare old psychoanalyst couch. You see that hole? That's the original stuffing. What, what is that smell? That's not tea you're drinking. It's gin. Why, of course it is. Nice to see you, Sonny. It's about time you came to pay your old mother a visit. <laughs> I kind of thought something like this would stir you up. <laughs> mother, you know you shouldn't have done it. What'd I do? You fixed the prognostications, that's what you did. Although, why you had to pick on me, I'll... Oh, I got tired of supporting you. You're a big boy, and it's about time you earned your own living. Besides, I thought it'd be a good idea to elect a sympathetic administration. Sympathetic to me, that is. Palace needs a new ventilating system. The air in here is terrible. Well, why didn't you use the prognosticator to get new ventilation put in? Oh, well, they'd have gotten around it the same way you got around killing Kip. But you pay attention to the prognosticator, boy. Don't you try to weasel out of what it says by looking for double meanings. It's time you overlords learned that when the prognosticator says something, it means it. Yes, Mother. I'd hate to have to give orders to have my own boy disposed of. The last three disposals weren't so bad. But sometimes those disposals can turn out real messy. Yes, Mother. Oh, maybe blood is thicker than water, but not much. Yes, Mother. And why shouldn't you listen to my prognostications, huh? Just because they're dolled up a little doesn't mean they're not true. Don't I have a crystal ball? Don't I have a gypsy card pack? Don't I have tea leaves? <laughs> Best tea leaves money can buy. Yes, Mother. Uh, so, what are you going to do? I'm going to have the ventilating system attended to right away. Now that's my boy. Now, I'll look at these here tea leaves in the bottom of my cup of gin. Yes, Mother. I can see that everything's going to work out fine. Just fine. <laughs> you have just heard X-1, presented by the National Broadcasting Company in cooperation with Galaxy Science Fiction Magazine. 
which this month features The Hardest Bargain by Evelyn Smith. Galaxy Magazine on your newsstand today. Tonight, X-1 has brought you Man's Best Friend, a story from the pages of Galaxy written by Evelyn Smith and adapted for radio by Ernest Canoy. Featured in the cast were William Redfield as Schnee, Wendell Holmes as Floria, Santos Ortega as Kip, and Leona Powers as Mother, with Raymond Edward Johnson and Bob Hastings. Your announcer, Radcliffe Hall. With this broadcast, X-1 concludes its present series. The show will return to the air on Thursday, June 20th. Check your local radio listings for the new date and time. That's Thursday, June 20th. X-1 was directed by Daniel Sutter and is an NBC Radio Network production. (laughs) 